This is a, a, a doormat that uh, Don sent us. You know, normally people just send the new hearts, but of course he had to have his name on it. Best friends with the Rickles. Even toward the end, the last, the last week or 10 days, it was, uh, keep my name alive. And that's what we're doing to, today. We're, keeping his name alive. Somebody called me up and they said, look, Don Rickles is looking for a best friend. <laughs> and, and none of us want to do it with you. And I said, how long? They said, a year at the most. <laughs> That, that's you guys at Disneyland? Disneyland. We went to, that's uh, I think the Matterhorn behind us. Yeah. And we were with Mickey, Mickey Mouse, with, with our kids. Yeah. And uh, I remember <laughs> Mickey came up to Don and I and said, you know how, how goddamn hot it is in this, in this suit? We got to walk around in a goddamn suit all day long. We're going, Mickey, Mickey the kinder. Shh, Mickey. Oh, you can't believe it. Your kids grab you. You can't believe where these kids grab you. Mickey, Mickey. Yes, yes. And I find this a little incongruous. Your best friend is Bob Newhart. I, I, I think uh, another genius and one of the great comedians of all time. And I only say it's a little incongruous because your, your styles, you're both extremely nice, decent people in real life. Thank you. But your styles are so different. Yeah, well, yeah, Bob's a, a brainy kind of comedian and I'm a kind of guy that gets laughs. And <laughs> Sam, there's not much I can say. You're an all-around, built-in, dynamite little talent. You've told me this time and time again. <laughs> the way you can improve your show is to get a little taller, get rid of the funny eye, and get yourself a good job. Hey, that's what I do, my friends. I laugh at people. I laugh at blacks, whites, purples. I laugh at all... My whole humor. I came this far in America. Why? Because I laugh at what the heck we are. That's what we have to laugh at. You're a black man, right? I took a guess. I'll tell you this. <laughs> I found Don just fascinating, as opposed to what I did. The first album went to number one, then the second album went to number one, and the first album went to number two for like, I'm gonna say 30 weeks. And you won like the Grammys for the record, right? I won three. I won <laughs> Best New Artist, uh, Album of the Year, and Spoken Word. They didn't even have a comedy category at yeah. that time. Well, this one, people wonder why I keep this. While the sound of your music has enthralled millions. <laughs> <laughs> so they obviously followed my career. Yeah. It, I had a weird kind of career. I had like a, a singer's career because I, I made that comedy album and then God forbid I didn't do the routines from the comedy album because that's what they, I had, they were like hit songs that I was, that I was doing. And I'm sure Frank, when I beat on Frank for album of the year, I'm sure, well, who beat me out? Well, this young kid, nobody knows who he is, has a comedy record, he talks on the phone. Frank, I need a shot. Do me a favor. Give me a break. I got relatives living in Jersey. Not really. for long. <laughs> Everyone knows that I kid about all peoples. I'd like everybody to know there's no discrimination in Las Vegas. They take everybody's money. We were in Vegas. I forget where you were playing, but Don, of course, was playing the Sahara in those days. My wife is a very warm person, very retiring. But she met Ginny Newhart, who's a doll, and kind of outgoing. And they met and just hit it off like crazy. So I get this call one day, and it's Barbara. And she said, we're here in Vegas, and can we get together? And we were in Vegas together. I was in the main room, and Don... <laughs> <laughs> True. And Don was in the lounge, so Ginny called Barbara and she said, why don't we get together? Uh, 
with, with Donna Barr. You were married, both of you, at the time. Yeah. yeah. No, we were Not single, th- working the air. All right, I guess that. <laughs> and Don, uh, at that time, was still one of the big spenders, uh, invited us to have dinner at the cafeteria at the uh, Sahara. We went and we met them at the coffee shop at the Sahara. And Don was a pussycat. And as we were leaving, we were going to see Don's third show in the lounge, and Jenny said, Jenny said to me, she said, he's such a sweet man, he's such a lovely man. I said, well, honey, it may be a little different once we get into the lounge. So <laughs> we got in the lounge, sat down, and he said, I want to introduce very good friends of mine, the stamming idiot from Chicago, Bob Newhart, and his hooker wife from Bayonne. <laughs> <laughs> and her jaw dropped. <laughs> I said, I tried to tell you. <laughs> and it was love uh, ever that since. Ever since. I mean, they're, they're stand-ups, but they're completely different styles. So it wasn't threatening, is my guess. My dad was, you know, he's a monologist. Uncle Don was just sort of stream of consciousness. My dad was never going to do his shtick, and, and Rickles was never going to do my dad's shtick. Considering your brand of humor, have you ever had any lawsuits? <laughs> no, are you planning to make trouble? <laughs> you're a Jew, you gotta be. With that nose, if you're not, you're an eagle. I'll tell you this. Would you rise? Japanese? Chinese. Chinese? Sure, since the war, they're all Chinese. If you were meeting Don for the first time, he would get something on you right away. Your beard, whatever. Which prevented you from saying, hey, Baldy, hey, you're a little overweight. So now you're on the defensive. Yeah. Is this too fast, Ronnie? Anyway, uh, he's sitting there looking at the program going, where does he say he makes fun of me? Where does it say that? It's only a joke, Mrs. Reagan. <laughs> it was a badge of honor to be attacked by Don. Yeah. yeah. You know, do you, you hear what he called me? He called me a hockey puck. <laughs> Isn't that great? I don't know about you in school. You went to Nebraska University, right? <laughs> yes, I did go to What school did you go to, Ed? Boston College. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> he had that skill, that, that ability to just turn it yeah. back on... I think it was defensive. I being a frightened guy, and to this day I'm frightened, too. When they Are say, you done? I swear. Yeah. You know, it's a fool that walks out on the stage and says, I'm there. You know, every night, you know, I Don't say, believe Gee, anybody. will they let me? I think to be on, that's got to be terrifying. And I think they got through it together. But it, see, it's apples and oranges. What Bob does, I certainly couldn't do. And he certainly can't do what I do, although he attempts it quietly. But he can't do that. It was a wonderful treat to see Milton Berle backstage come up to me and go, Hello, son, I'm Milton Berle. <laughs> I love Milton. You were my idol when I was a kid. Now I'm getting shock treatments. <laughs> is, he, is he laughing? Take a look. Did you like roasting? Uh, no, it's not my nature. But uh, yeah, I, I did quite a few... Of, of Dean's uh, Dean shows, and then I did um, some of the roasts. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the funniest psychiatrist I know, Mr. Bob Newhart. But you roasted Don. Oh, yeah. What was it like to get a chance to do what he does? Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Don is, uh, is my, best, my best friend which just gives you some idea of the difficulty I have in making friends. <laughs> but Don has not done that well in television. Uh, he's had four series now. Uh, the last one, a couple of Dons, received a minus four Nielsen rating. <laughs> this means not there's no one watching, but several people without TV sets had heard about the show and said if they got one, they wouldn't watch it. <laughs> The basic thing in friendship, with all the comedy, uh, I adore him and, and I know he adores me. And uh, the, the great thing about it is that we, our values are the same. We believe in the same things and we laugh at the same things. Well, I think, you know, they were both family men um, 
in a way that comics really weren't. You know, they were so in love with their wives. My parents were married 50 years. And, you know, the idea of cheating, you know, Bob or my dad, never in a million years. And they were actually like prude, you know, like my parents or Ginny told me a story where they were at a, a party. It was like a key party. It was swingers. They were smoking, you know, weed. And my parents, and as soon as they saw that and Bob, they were like, we're out of here. You know, I remember once they had like a dinner that where it was just going to be the four of them and Sinatra was going to join. And my dad said to whoever, did you ever think in your wildest dreams you would get to the point in your life where you would try to figure out how to not have dinner with Frank Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. They wanted it just it needed to be the core. You know, yeah. that's what they loved. Well, we both have children and I'm proud of them. And. Bob has the same, well, I don't want to speak for Bob, but I can say knowing his kids, because I'm Uncle Don and vice versa, and he's Uncle Bob, and our kids are very well-adjusted. But that's it. our kids grew up together. We always traveled with my dad when he went on the road, with my mother, my brother, and the same with the new hearts. I mean, they really tried to make it as normal as they could, and so, that's why Larry Rickles was my best friend. It was the Rickles kids and the Newhart kids. We were just always together. Tell me about your summer plans this summer. You and Newhart going away? Yeah, we're going to go down to the beach and attack a lifeguard. <laughs> On the sea of trials, we will swing along Broadway. Dance. My parents and the Newharts, they always had to be together. I was like, when I grow up, I want to have another couple, when I'm married, that are our best friends, and we travel with them and have so much fun. Here we are. Hey. Once again, downtown LA. All right, Bob, you get in there and let me do this. The area has to be fixed up a little bit, but we're working on it. No matter where we went, we'd go to Hong Kong. They'd say, oh, we have the oh, sushi, mojo, oil, and we have the wonton, oko, oko. And I said, yeah, whatever Barbara says. What are you going to have, Bob? Do you have spaghetti bolognese? The man has no idea where the hell he is. I like bolognese. <laughs> He tends to exaggerate. We go to Germany, do you have spaghetti bouillonnaise? That was his favorite dish. Oh, this, this is Don with the, the kids in Thailand. These are my children. They go to war. I stopped walking for about 10 minutes. This is long, this is junk. And I'm Eddie. Eddie. Yes, later, later. Later, later. Bob and my mother were very meticulous and very like OCD and they handled everything and Ginny and my dad were just like, whatever, you know. Yeah. I just mm -hmm. want to have fun. So it's sort of balanced. Oh. Barbara would, she, she'd do all the, you know, planning. You know, we have to visit this, we have to do this, we have to do that. Don and I were just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> I said to Barbara one time, I went to change some money at the airport and they were sitting in the terminal. I said, Barbara, if we got on a plane and flew home right now, they would still be here two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> now I got a lovely wife. We just came back from Paris and she shopped. She has a black belt in shopping. Uh, she went bananas. The woman never looked up. The bags were like this. She never looked up once. <laughs> Nothing. Just, uh, Valentino thinks she's part of the family. Don had to marry somebody like Barbara. Yeah. Because she was the organizer. You know, we had the same life, you know? not only just wives, show business wives, we were wives of uh, comedians. And one of the reasons he married Barbara was because she never laughed at his jokes. <laughs> it was, you know, mm. oh, that's nice. That's, that's, oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is when, when we were in Israel, he would keep making statements and that's why it drove Barbara nuts because right. he was always wrong. Oh, I'm sure. <clears throat> uh -huh. And, uh, he said, uh, oh, there, oh, there, that building. He said, I know that's the Israeli jail for the Palestinians. And then the driver, David, would say, no, that's the National Jewish Library. <laughs> so now we get, now he's asked a couple of the dumb questions. Right. And I said, I know I'm right about this. You, you say I keep asking dumb questions. Those polls were put up by the Israeli Defense Forces to prevent the, the tanks from Syria advancing any further. And the driver said, 
No, no, those poles were put up by the Israeli telephone company. <laughs> <laughs> and so you moved here, Don was here already? Yeah, Don and Barbara, uh, they, have, uh, they have a house um, not quite as big as this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, about a block and a half away. Yeah. That's a commitment after many years you decided you could handle that. Knowing him as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning and start the day off with being insulted, <laughs> if that's your idea of a great time. Barbara's gone a year, right? Yeah. And yeah. Don's gone three years? Don is three years, yeah. Well, you know, he got sick almost immediately. We yeah, moved that's here. What in, I remember now. Um, we moved here in 2016, and he died the year later. Yeah. So, I mean, he was so excited, and no one can walk down to your house. And he was like a kid when we, you know, said we're going to move here. And um, he got sick. Don had the same condition I, I wound up with, which was a spinal stenosis. And he couldn't do, you know, what he used to do, running across the stage, running back and forth. Um, I think that hurt a little bit because it took a lot of the energy. Yeah. He was pretty much doing it right up until the end, except he he wasn't standing up. He was yeah. in, and you you missed that, you yeah. know, that energy that was was gone. You know, at first it's always a shock, and now I think of something, and I oh, I have to call Barbara because we talked for sixty years almost. You know, that's a long time. I miss her. I miss her. I miss him. I miss our trips. Yeah. I miss. I'm just miss them, and I'm gonna start to cry. I'll trade you laughter for love. I'll trade you one for the other. I wish everybody had the friendship that Jenny and I and Barbara and Don had. He he made me laugh. I made him laugh, and we miss them. You know, in Israel, there's our, we're on our way to the Bedouin caves, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Bob, look what you're stepping in, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> a dear man, a yeah. dear man. <laughs> That's Don again. Yeah, That's I see him, him against the wall, yeah. I see him. This is my life. I swear that it's true. I love to do what I do, to share this laughter I give for just a little love from There was one time Don was on stage and he's about halfway, he's maybe half hour into his act and there was some smoke backstage. And so Tony Gold went and notified Don, you know, cut, cut, to, cut to the end. So he salutes Etta. He says, your, your mother's here uh, up in heaven. Never forget your mother because your mother never forgets you. Huh? Now the smoke clears. And Tony says, you know, Don, you should go back and do another half hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, okay. So now he does a half hour, 45 minutes. And he does this very moving salute to his dead sister. He doesn't have a dead sister. <laughs> but in his, <laughs> in his mind, You've got to end your act with a dead person of some kind. (laughs) 
I am pleased to welcome you from a whole bunch of places. This is a, a lot of suburbs in search of a city, including good old Burbank, California, Van Nuys, Beverly Hills, Newport Beach, Laguna. You pick your town. This is Southern California. You know how to make a guy feel good. Hey. And you're not kooky, and you're just like all of us. You look just like the folks in New York. And we're counting on, well, I hope you're complimented by that. <laughs> I am pleased to present two of the most successful entertainers in our business. They've hit the long ball for a long time. And what do you know, they've been buddies for almost 25 years. Here are Don Rickles and Bob Newhart. for almost 25 years. You've been around the world together. Your wives are pals. You guys have been in trailers. You've been to Israel. You, uh, did, no. Incidentally, Don, have you met the Pope? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I met a few rabbis, but never the Pope. I, bet I would you... be honored if I had met the Pope. No, uh, but Bob had, well, we did meet the Pope in a way. I don't know if this is the time to tell you. But uh, it was at the, the Vatican, we were on a trip to Rome, yeah. and Bob and a, a, a fellow a friend of ours, Carol O'Connor, said, listen, I have influence that you guys can see the Pope. I said, the Pope? Wow, this is terrific. The Pope, the holiest man in the world, this is wonderful. And Bob's a devout Catholic, and I'm a Jew, and I remind him of that every single day. <laughs> and we both were in Rome, and Bob, and Bob said, okay, Carol O'Connor called and said, so-and-so father so-and-so is going to uh, take us to the Vatican to see the Pope. I've pictured seven of us sitting around with a cigar and a cigarette saying, Holy Father, what's new? You know. And we got up that morning and I said, Bob, it's time. We're, we're ready. We have... And he said, well, well uh, let's, get some, uh, let, 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 let's get some sleep. Bob talks like that because he fears an earthquake that didn't hit him yet. <laughs> And to make a long story short, I had to wake them up. We went to the Vatican, and there was 1,500 people in a packed auditorium. There was a little man on a litter, 70 miles from us. And we went, Holy Father! That's how we met That's the Pope. <laughs> Bob, just try and tighten up the answers just a little bit. Okay. It's only an hour show. <laughs> you didn't really need me for no, this show, did you? <laughs> uh, well, there's something going on here. I mean, obviously, you guys uh, uh, must uh, be good for each other uh, to be traveling like this. How'd this happen? I mean, you remember? Did you work together or what? Uh... Uh, no, actually, what happened was uh, that my wife, Jenny, knew uh, Barbara. Uh, she was a, a secretary for an agent, and she was going with the agent, so she knew Barbara. So Don... Don was in the, um, we were in Vegas together. I was in the main room, and Don. <laughs> True. <laughs> and Don was in the lounge, so Jenny called Barbara, and she said, why don't we get together uh, with, with Don now and Barbara? you were married, both of you, at the time. Yeah. yeah. No, we were Not single, working the air. All right, I guess that. Yeah. So, uh, Jenny called Barbara, and, and Don, uh, at that time, was still one of the big spenders, uh, invited us to have dinner at the cafeteria at the uh, <laughs> Sahara. So we did, and, and Don was saying, oh, and at that time, there was just Mindy, and I think we had Rob and Tim. And Tom, Don was saying, oh, there's Mindy, and I, gee, I hate to be away, but you've got to be on the road. And as we were leaving, we were going to see Don's third show in the lounge, and 
Jenny said, Jenny said to me, she said, he's such a sweet man. He's such a lovely man. I said, well, honey, it may be a little different once we get into the lounge. So <laughs> we got in the lounge, sat down, and he said, I want to introduce very good friends of mine, the standing idiot from Chicago, Bob Newhart, and his hooker wife from Bayonne. <laughs> And it was love uh, ever that since. Ever since. Yes, whose hand did I see over here? Somebody. Uh, yes, ma'am. This question is for Don. Why do you hide your feelings for... You're, you're so patriotic. Sometimes it comes out in your nightclub acts, and sometimes it doesn't. Why, why do you hide that? Why does he hide his patriotism? Yes, you took yes. the words right out of his mouth. <laughs> this he is does. what I've been waiting to ask him a lot. He can be so funny and then yet bring tears when he... The well, end of your show, you can end. The end of your show, you you say things about our country, and I saw you. Yes, he does. You liked him, didn't you? He's good I at did. Yeah. Yes. yes, well, I was in, unfortunately, World War II uh, as a sailor, and <laughs> I say these patriotic things, and in case they want a man over 60 again, I don't want to go. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I was wondering, Don, how you got interested in your particular brand of humor. <laughs> Well, I'll say one thing. Compared to the young people that are coming up today, I'm a priest. <laughs> oh. This is a question uh, for Bob Newhart. What's it like working with Daryl and his other brother, Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> well, they become like they become almost almost cult figures. They're, they're like. Uh, they, they, they become generic because I'll, I'll go to a place and, and, and somebody will say, you know, we got, uh, we got Larry and Daryl and Daryl in the back, what, have them fix it, you know, whatever. But uh, they're great. They're very unusual. They're fun to work with. And uh, the interesting thing is that Daryl and Daryl come to the script reading, which is on Monday, <laughs> even though they know they aren't going to have any work. <laughs> this is for both of you. Excluding each other, who are your role models? Excluding each other, who are your role models? Well, I can only speak for myself. My role model was, uh, is, is, thank God, is Frank Sinatra and Milton Berle. Uh, Ferdinand Marcos, I guess. I... No, no, I, w I would say, I would say, uh, uh, Jack, ben Jack Benny would be, uh, yeah, would sure. be mine. I'd like to ask Don how he developed the phrase, you hockey puck. I really don't know how that came about. I think in my days in Miami in a little tiny club, I called a guy a hockey puck. He passed it to three other guys in Brooklyn, and it skyrocketed. Okay. Yes. Um, is our Larry and Larry, or Larry and Daryl and Daryl, is Daryl and Daryl ever going to talk at all before the show's over? <laughs> if, if this year is our last year, that might, that's a possibility that they might, uh -huh. they might say something. I don't know. <laughs> Hi, you both have very unique comic styles. Did you start with those styles when you first started your career, or did they evolve from something else? Go for it. Well, I don't know. I think it's, to me, it's just being around at the right time. I mean, I, this is, I mean, I, I talk like this. I, this is not well, a put-on. No. <laughs> well, yeah. Didn't you have a buddy, didn't you have a double act, a guy by the name of Gallagher you worked with in Chicago? Ed Gallagher, yeah. You must have been 14 years old at the time, right? We did a kind of a poor man Bob and Ray kind of show, and um, uh, actually on the real live radio or on radio. We, we were in um, uh, Northampton, Mass, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and um, Idaho Falls, Idaho. It's true. In nineteen like fifty eight, something like that, and we charged seven dollars and fifty cents a week for five five minute comedy routines. And at the end of thirteen weeks, one of the stations stiffed us, never paid us. <laughs> and two wanted to renew us, and uh, we wrote them back and said, thank you very much, but we can't afford to do this show anymore. I mean, it was, it was costing us more in tape to send it out uh -huh. than we were getting it. And he became a big shot advertising guy, went into straight real work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, obviously, uh, this was the origin of your uh, one, one-sided conversations, etc. Well, it is, yeah. There's always, there always seems to be somebody there. Now, your pal is a... Uh, <laughs> your pal, Long Island. Right. Can't be all bad. <laughs> uh, your father was an insurance man and a dry goods guy? What? No, he was an insurance man for Metropolitan Life. Uh-huh. And uh, he, was, he was a great, he was a great salesman. Yes. Yeah. 
He must have made him laugh, too. I mean, you must remember him. Huh? He was the kind of a guy, uh, the best way I can explain my dad was, rest his soul, was he the kind of guy, Phil, he'd put his arm around a lady and never be dirty about it. I, I, I think I know that kind of person. We could use more of those folks. Thank you. You had how many in the family? I was the only child, and my mother knew that every morning because she put on her patent hat and woke me up. <laughs> And, uh, but you didn't, you had a good childhood. I mean, there's no, you know. I did. I was backed against the radiator a lot, and she went, Why? <laughs> uh, you were a good student. No, no. No. I, uh, 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 all right. I was the president. I'm not proud of that. I was the yeah. president of my high school and had trouble spelling cat. Uh -huh. Now, here's everything I know about you. This kind of humor, as to which uh, the person in the audience referred a moment ago, didn't you have to work to a, a bunch of guys off the ship? Yeah, where's the broads, you know? Didn't you? And you Why went out... Weren't you one of the guys? Uh, <laughs> and you went out and took him on and started coming back, and you right. killed him. Well, that was because, out of, as Bob knows, in our business, in our, in our time, uh, when we stood out on the stage, we, you know, uh, television and improv, there was no such thing. I worked, and Bob came out of radio and television, and I came out of what they call strip joints, for the lack of another word. Uh, where they had 17 girls with a fan, and I used to stand in the back being single and go... <laughs> 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 and uh, we had these shows, and uh, the, the, out of frustration, I did impersonations badly, and I had an act that wasn't too funny. And I started to talk to the audience, and the sailors would yell up and say, when are you going to get funny? You know, the old cliches, and I would tell them, you know, how would you like it if I suck your neck? You know, and all of a sudden that became very funny. As you can see now, it had trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It took a while. Now, uh, just a couple other things. Um, you'll pardon this, uh, once again, this preoccupation with comedy. Uh, I'm impressed with the fact that you guys have hit the long ball for so long. And in your private lives, I mean, your storybook guys. I mean, married once, loyal, faithful. I, I mean, this is going to be a long show for me. We have no scandal at all here. Uh, the first person that's going that you've heard you are you guys are probably never going to get on current affair now you should know that. <laughs> you also seem to have whatever neurosis there might be there and i hope there's some that's what makes us human but it's very very manageable neither of you drink certainly to excess what is this how this happened it Bob the gentile and the jew uh, along uh, the way well somebody called me up and said you have a sister and none a that's real right. live nun yes I mean, this is wonderful. as opposed to what? I well, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it's just a great Irish Catholic Chicago family. All right, uh, go ahead, interrupt. Go ahead. Um, somebody called me up and they said, "Look, Don Rickles is looking for a best friend." <laughs> and and none of us want to do it, would you? And I said, "How long?" They said, "A year at the most." <laughs> And, but we, uh, we're so opposite, you know, that, yeah. that but he I mean, makes me laugh and I make him laugh. That's why we're friends. I don't... Also, part of the question you asked is that humor has an awful lot to the duration of a marriage. Some of the longest marriage, show business marriages are comedians. Yeah. Ruth, uh, may she rest. Nope. Uh, mm -hmm. And Milton. Jack Benny. Yeah. And George Burns. Yeah. And I also think, which uh, Bob uh, Danny and Thomas? I... Danny Thomas, let's get it in. And yeah. Rosie. Yeah. <laughs> the secret of his success, oh, by all means. Great couple, and you're going to come into a lot of money someday. I'm telling you. <laughs> we get more of it, and I'll have to take it you out know, of the Phil, table. No, Phil, what I was saying, though, the basic thing is, between Bob and I, being, as I say, I say this in my performance every night I appear wherever. I always mention Bob, which is unusual for a fellow comedian to mention another comedian every night in his performance, because I mean this from my heart. The basic thing is, for all of us, the great thing is, as Bob always says, it's key. When the wives get along, that is a great secret to becoming great friends. Yes. And Bob's wife and my wife are like sisters. Jen and Barbara are like sisters, really. They love each other dearly. Uh -huh. Bob and I were raised, two American guys, two different worlds, and yet we became great friends. But the basic thing is that we both have the same values. I really believe that, and I know it for a fact. 
We both believe in the same basic things, yet we can make each other laugh, we can be annoyed with each other. Yeah. Most times I'm annoyed with him. Yeah. But, uh, not really, but, I, but uh, that's, that's the whole thing. A, a yeah. ship doesn't run every day. We don't get up in the morning and say, is Bob up, is Don up? <laughs> I'm off to see the wizard. It's not like that, no. you know. No. Now, uh, now do, you, do you split the bill right down the middle on vacation, or does, you know, I had the Alamode and you had the pie with No, the... that's his beg. He will tell you the honest <laughs> truth about our trips when, when it comes to handling everything. He's a CPA. Oh, no, you kidding? Not a, no, I'm not a CPA. CPA. I'm the luggage watcher. CPA, you had to take a, you had to pass a test. I just had a straight, I had a degree in accounting. That was all. Well, you're close. So I'm in charge, I'm in charge of the money and I reconcile it at the end of the, at the end of the trip. Um, and it's good because Barbara is very efficient. I'm, we, we flew one time, we were going to Venice and we landed in, um, in Heathrow in London and Ginny and Don were just sitting with the luggage and I was going converting American dollars into lira and, and Barbara was checking on plane flights, the, the connections and all that. And we both came back and they were both sitting there on the luggage. And I said, you realize if we got on a plane and flew back to L.A., they would still be sitting on that luggage? Yes. Hi, I was wondering if you're ever going to do a show together. Well, they have. We did. Yeah. We did. We did. Well, did. You've done several things well, together. Well, Bob is always, Bob is the kind of a guy, he's an investigator and he's a, a kind of a guy that really is devoted. He's a fine writer. I'm, I'm pretty much a gypsy. I say, what time do I show up? If the right property came along, I'm sure we both would be delighted to do something together before the light goes out. Yeah. <laughs> this, like this is for each of you. If you weren't comedians, and thank God you are, what, what would each of you have gotten into? Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> I would have been a bag man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I never thought other than being a comedian all my life. I think I could have been uh, some sort of a social guy in a hotel, greeting people, whatever that kind of job is. But I was never good at business. I was always good at meeting people. So I, I can't say that I would other than being a comedian. Uh, Bob could have been running the country, but that's a whole story. <laughs> you thought about it? I, I probably would have been a, a teacher, I, I would think. Yes. I don't know. Good for you. I'd like to know if either of you have children, and if so, I bet their life was um, pretty exciting. Well, we both have children, as we said at the beginning of the show. I have a, a daughter, 23, and a son, 19, and uh, they live their own lives, and they live it well, and I'm proud of them. And Bob has the same, well, I don't want to speak for Bob, but I can say knowing his kids, because I'm Uncle Don, and vice versa, and he's Uncle Bob, and our kids are very well-adjusted. You kept them off the, uh, you kept them out of the old spotlight, didn't you? Well, my, my, my son hides. My daughter wants to be an actress. She gets up in the morning and goes, listen, Dad, showtime. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'll, I'll hear about that. That's a joke, honey. <laughs> Are your wives here now? Pardon me? Are your wives here now? No, no, they're in Europe. <laughs> no, no. Sitting on a luggage. <laughs> Hi, Bob. I've always enjoyed your telephone routines. Can you tell me how they got started? Well, you know, the, I, I didn't originate them. I mean, uh, one of the first records ever made was uh, 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 George Jessel did a, a, a routine called, um, oh, I forget what it was now, uh, talking to his mom on the phone. And then Shelley Berman, of course, before me, did telephone routines. There, there are just some routines that, that lend themselves to because you, when you, th I'm not really saying anything funny. I really am not. What you're laughing at is what is unheard, which the other person is saying. Because I've had to put it down on paper, and when you look at it on a paper, it's not funny at all. But <laughs> thank God. Yes. Bob, I love your show, but I miss Suzanne Plachette. Did she turn the role down? Oh, thank you, Susie. You'll be glad. No, uh, there was I, when I first started thinking about coming back to television after being off for like four years uh, we thought may well maybe we'll pick up the old series where it where it left off but uh, Susie wanted to do a, a play in New York and the more I thought about it uh, that it was kind of too easy to do it that way you know it th there's more a challenge to start with a whole new concept and and see if it works that I don't know. yes how do you get along with the people on the show off screen? Well, that's obviously directed at me since he doesn't. <laughs> I, 
had many shows, but they... <laughs> Uh, we're, uh, we're a family. You have to be a family. You're, you're, uh, you're with them eight hours a day for eight years now. I mean, you've got to be a family. Bob, after seeing the show that was aired last week, are you sure you never wanted to be a nightclub singer? <laughs> I missed that one. Uh, we have, don't I we do. have that? I do. It's not ready. It, it, you wait. All right. Okay. This is, this is, uh, you still bring it home, kid. I mean, uh, I'll talk about uh, Mr. Television every week. Uh, you are, you may be the longest running person in that particular vehicle. That is to say, comedy such a, no. on, huh? No. Who? Who? Uh, Lucy. Lu not even oh, close. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, that's, that's stratosphere. Let's talk about mortals. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don, I've seen you do drama before. Have you ever gone for any more dramatic roles or? have ever thought about going up because you're very good at drama well thank you I have a picture coming out now with uh, Lee Majors and Abe Fagoda uh, a picture <laughs> that's what I said when I got the part and it's called Keaton's Cop and, uh, and it, it, we shot it in Galveston Texas I don't know if you've ever been down there but it's great I have an uncle there but it, 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 he's wonderful he just sits around going why am I here anyway uh, but we had a good time doing it, and it's a little different for me. And uh, I'm delighted to, uh, when I get an opportunity to act, I, I enjoy it. Here is Brother Newhart on his program. The script, apparently, uh, every, it's an amateur night, an amateur, and you won't go. And everybody's saying, come on, come on. And everybody gets up and tap dance, does something, plays the bones. You are not moving. Finally, you just say you're not doing it. You're much to the disappointment of everybody. You feel a little guilty about it, but you can't get up in front of a... That is not the other... Th yeah. Yeah. Isn't it this the one where he gets up and yeah. he's... Everybody has gone. That everybody has staff. gone. Great stand. <laughs> oh, my heart. Listen. They're having an argument, and this is coast to coast. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Peter, uh, Peter, in order to pick up $50 a night, sings at this club, and we're forced to go there. And it doesn't go well for him at all. Uh, and they leave, and I'm sort of tagging behind. because The place is empty. Bob has not, apparently, you know, wonders if... Here is a man who's delivering. This is as fine as it gets. Sir, uh, here is a wonderful, wonderful moment. Uh, no writer could do this. Bob Newhart delivers. <laughs> But don't pass the plate, folks. Don't pass the cup. I figure whenever I'm down and out, the only way is up. And I will be up like a rosebud. Hi, I'm Matt Bynum. Don't thumb your nose, bud. Just take a little tip from my end. I may be a little bit short, of the elbow room <laughs> but let me get me some <laughs> and look how world I say <laughs> look out world <laughs> here I ching ching chong ching 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 chong ching ching chong
transportation furnished by TWA. We're called Trans World Airlines. But don't take the world part too literally, because even though we do fly most of the world, this is the part of the world we fly most. Today's TWA. Brian, let's see some of this stuff. I want to see this album business. I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna get you on here. You better. Huh? I what? You better. I know. I, listen, I don't want you mad at me, but I do want a show. Show them here, uh, uh, Brian, from the uh, Newhart uh, Rickles. Uh, here we go. Here's the cast picture. Of the okay, we'll go through quickly. You know these people. Here's Newhart. Look at this. Prince Charles, Farrah Fawcett, and Johnny Mathis. Here's Newhart with Rowan and Martin. Oh, yeah. Here's Brother Bob with Ed Sullivan. Uh, and with Buddy Hackett, Buddy Hackett, Gene Wilder, and then the, that's the cast the now, cast. Now we move to uh, Don. Here's Don with Tommy Lasorda. What's not to love there? Rickles. Next, there you are with Cary Grant and Fred Astaire. Boy, I'll tell you, we should all have this kind of life. Here's Rickles and Reagan. Uh, you, you know them. Uh, Rickles and Cosby. Rickles and Hope. Rickles and Johnny Carson, Rickles and Frank Sinatra, Rickles and the Duke, John Wayne. And there you are with Clark Gable. Come on, boy, you've been around the world here. Yes, yes. Hi, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was wondering, Don Rickles, how you felt about Jackie Mason and his new role on Chicken Soup. Um, does it make you feel... Well, how do you feel in general, I guess, about racial jokes? Does it make it any better or more acceptable if the person telling the joke is of the same ethnicity that the joke is in about? The whole idea is it's what the public enjoys. Uh, Jackie Mason has attained, it took him a long time, he's attained great success. I can only say I wish him the best, and uh, I must say it's according to what your taste is. If you enjoy that, wonderful, then he's a winner. If you don't, nobody begs you to turn it on, so. Yes. Don Rickles. Uh, you're like two different people. Today you're so cute and like a teddy bear and I want to <laughs> I want to hug you. But I was in a show in in Las Vegas and I wanted my money back because you were so rude. God love you. <laughs> I was wondering, where did you get the inspiration for the, the carpet commercials? <laughs> now, I did not, I did not plant these people in the audience, huh? <laughs> A great deal of money. <laughs> yes. Now, I know, Don, you, you've caused a lot of embarrassing moments for a lot of people. What was your most embarrassing moment? Well, I think the most embarrassing moment for me off the top of my head is uh, I went out on the stage with Donald O'Connor, and I have a, a thing that I do with Bob. I did it on his show when I was his guest. At the end of the show, I kissed him on the lips. And Donald O'Connor was out on the stage with me in, in Las Vegas uh, many years ago, and I said, Donald, I love you, and I kissed him on the lips, and he bit me. <laughs> <laughs> Will the two of you be performing in Vegas together? Well, you answer that, Bob. I, I, I don't see any uh, plans. Bob's schedule is so uh, difficult with his television show, which is going better than ever. I would like uh, someday to have some sort of performance live between the two of us. Maybe that'll come about, but right now, his schedule and mine is as such that uh, I don't see it in the immediate future. Yes. Bob, you are such a darling, but if you were my husband, I would be so angry because I'm, I want to see some temper. You just seem, I mean, if, uh -huh. if I yelled at you, I mean, I want to see a fight, okay? How are you with your wife regarding that? Show us a fight. <laughs> no, I have a temper. I, I just... Tell I, the truth. Tell the truth. <laughs> I, ten, I tend to, to stifle it, but then it's like a volcano. When it happens, it's, it's not a pretty sight. This is for Bob. Um, Don Rickles has such a sarcastic sense of humor. Being a good friend of his, can you tell us a, a sensitive part of him? Oh, well, Don, uh, no, he's very sensitive. He's, he's very active in, in charity work. And uh, if, he, if he ever thought that any of the people in the audience was offended by anything he said, I mean, no, he, he really, I, I saw Don one time. <laughs> He would feel, he would call that person up the next day and say, oh, gee, I'm sorry, I hope you understand, that's what I do. And I saw him one time, there was a guy sitting in the front row at the Sahara. Guy had on the worst hairpiece, the worst rug I have ever 
seen in my life. And he's sitting right in the front row, and I'm going, oh, my God, how could they put this man? And Don keeps walking past him, not saying anything. I think. Finally, he just looks down, and he said, no one would guess, sir. And he walks on. <laughs> The show under the table. He wouldn't come up. Bob, I love your show, and I hope it goes on for a long time. Yeah. But when it is, and when it does end, what do you what do you have planned for the future? Well, uh, I would take like a year or two off and probably do personal appearances, and then and then probably come back in another uh, vehicle. I can't imagine retiring. I can't imagine playing golf every day. It just you got to do something, you know. Hi, Don. Um, when you were a kid, did you get beat up a lot with your sarcastic? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I had Blue Cross. You weren't a... Uh, this stuff, this aggressive thing didn't happen to you till early adulthood. Do I understand that? I was in my 30s before I started doing this kind of thing, whatever I do. Uh, yeah. Picking on people and uh -huh. making fun of everybody. It, it happened as the camera gets in my way. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, it's all right. I want your name. You're going to look for work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's all right. Find his name. There he is. There he is. But uh, I, it, it really happened later in life out of frustration of not having an act, so to speak. And it, for many years of standing up there and talking to the people, it, it became a performance. You did not marry until you were 38 years old. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> I was lonely. Uh, you were... <laughs> no, I, I must say that I, I married the, the best lady in the world for me, and our marriage uh, in March will be 25 years. So, uh, the... Uh, now, do you still both, of you still get the buzz before the solo performance in the big room where the guy has just spent $100 on a bottle of champagne, and you guys better be funny if you know what I mean. That can be a tough out. Well, Bob, I think you agree, right? It's always a challenge to us, right? Yeah, there's, there, I, I, I remember reading uh, one of the young comics wrote uh, that he said, you know, there's the first show, but no matter how good that is, there's still the second show. And I thought to myself, wow, <laughs> what insight. <You> know? <laughs> That's the way it is, no matter, you know, but people have been doing that for years, long before us. I mean, it's just, if, if you're not nervous, there's something wrong. Yeah. Um, Bob, you being Catholic and um, Don being uh, Jewish, have you tried to convert him? And if not, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a letter from the Pope <laughs> saying... One I, time, one time. Because, tell them when we went to Israel. When uh, we but, went to Israel, I said to the Israelis, take him to the birthplace of Jesus. Did I or did I that's not? That's right. And the Israelis kept saying... <laughs> anyway, uh... One time, we called, we called Donna Barbara and we said, what did you do today? Because this is a Jewish tradition which Catholics don't have. Uh, he, Don said, we went out and we picked out our plots. Oh, yeah. And I said, what, what do you mean you picked out your plots? He said, well, we picked out for Mindy and Larry and Barbara and I and Eleanor. And, and I said, well, I said, well, you know, Catholics don't do wherever you drop that you find <laughs> the nearest thing, whatever, and that's where you go, you know. He said, no, in the Jewish religion, you buy your plots ahead of time. And I said, how many plots did you buy? And he said, eight. I said, eight? Why'd you buy eight? There's only seven of you. And Barbara said, he didn't want anybody next to him. <laughs> for Don. Don, uh, what is of the new comedian? Here I am, over here. Look over your shoulder. <laughs> how could you miss this? <laughs> of, of the new comedians uh, today, who do, who do you have a uh, favorite? What is your... Well, I wouldn't like to mention a favorite. I think there's a lot of talented young people out there today, and it's so competitive, it would be unfair for me to say one particular person. I think there are a few, in my personal opinion, that are outstanding, but there are a lot of youngsters coming up real fast yeah I have no come Roseanne is a star already she doesn't need my support yeah as she told me <laughs> she 
Yes. Uh, this is for both of you. What words of wisdom uh, would you give to any uh, new upcoming comic or comedian? <laughs> Be funny. <laughs> uh, gee, I don't know. Just uh... I'd say get a day job. <laughs> it's very, very tough to say to become a comedian. I think you have to start out in acting, as Bob uh, did in radio. He did all those radio years, and I did in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, learning a little bit about what this is all about. And then you go out there and you throw your best shot and hope and pray with a lot of luck and talent. And if you're really lucky, you make it. It's a very tough, competitive business. Yes, sir. Bob, a question for you. When you've been on a series for a few years, do you find the character gets a little more sarcastic, a little more complacent towards the end? No, I think that you, you have to keep it alive and you have to find uh, uh, nuances and, and open new avenues. And, and, that, and that's really the, the, the work of the producers and the writers. And they, they've done a wonderful job. They've done an incredible job. Right. I am about to present, I don't know whether this is the first time, Coast to Coast. The worst home movies I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> now, you would think two guys, you know, on television. Wait till you see this. This is us on the bus. I think you're in uh, Jerusalem. You're in Israel here, I think. This is Israel. Yeah. All right, let's this audience see the now, Brad. Is... Let's kill the lights here so we can see. Uh, see, the problem with shooting is you're never in the film. So you're... no one believes you actually went along on the trip. So, <laughs> uh, And this is where? This is in Israel. And, uh, this is Israel. You're about to see the caves. I assumed that was Mount these Carmel. Are, uh, these are, Mount Bedouin, Carmel. These are Bedouin caves. Now watch the bus. Look at this. Watch out. Bedouin caves, and the Bedouins would actually keep their camels and their animals. The other problem with shooting the film is you never can see where you're stepping. Now, now there's your guy. They would explain. live, David, yeah. They would uh -huh. live in these caves. And, and they would enlarge the case. They needed more room. Uh huh. Now, watch this. Everything is safe and square. Unbelievable. Yeah. Bob, look what you're stepping in, Bob. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Whole> movie! <laughs> Hi, bo you're both so cute. Um, Bob, how long have you been married, and are any of your children, either of you, following in your footsteps at all? Well, I'll be married 27 years in January, and uh, my uh, uh, oldest boy, uh, Rob, turned 26, Just we just celebrated his birthday. It's very close, but we made it, being Catholic, we just... <laughs> <laughs> Timmy is 22, and he's a gopher at MTM. Uh, my daughter, Jennifer, They've been around the business, as, as with Mindy and Larry, you know, they'd be backstage. So they know the glamorous, but they know the unglamorous. They know what it is to walk through a, a kitchen to go on stage and say, be careful, don't step in that, you know. And, uh, so they, they're pretty level-headed about uh, their expectations of the business. And my, my, as I said earlier, my daughter is uh, studying as an actress. She's studying very hard. And she has a part-time job also. And my son is interested behind the scenes in film editing and directing. And he's very, very involved in that. And uh, I wish him the best. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yes. Um, Don, considering your brand of humor, have you ever had any lawsuits against you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Are you planning to make trouble? <laughs> of all the travel trips that you've taken together, which is your most favorite? That's tough. Well, we ha I would say Israel. That was incredible. Yeah. That Paris was, was the toughest because our wives sucked yes. every dime we had out of it. <laughs> but I would say Venice also. Venice was, Venice, oh, was one, of, one of the most beautiful cities we in really the world. We really did. And the gondola, the two wives going, this is exciting. <laughs> yes. Phil, um, Bob, on your show, do you have any children or will you have any children? Well, we're, I, no, I won't. But uh, this year, uh, <laughs> this year, uh, Julia Duffy, uh, uh, was pregnant and and we're going to incorporate that into the show she's going she's had had daniel already but uh i think in january uh she has the baby and yeah and I, I wanted to know since you're best friends and all if you uh, both have the same barber <laughs> as a matter of fact we do that's, that's right. the that's the truth about uh, brian brian, brian he, he's, he's our barber and he, he comes in and in 10 minutes 300 dollars to go t -t -t that's it <laughs> hi mr newhart uh you're Comedy is fairly subtle and straightforward, and in both your shows, both Bill Daly and Tom Poston play more or less dim bulbs, where you can, you know, their characters are 
people that you can play off against and your comedy is brought forth more. Do you prefer working with people or characters like that? You like to be surrounded by stupid people? Or <laughs> well, no, see, uh, I, love, uh, I love playing opposite uh, uh, Stephanie and, and, uh, and Michael because, I mean, they're not stock situation comedy people. You don't see them every time you turn the dial. And they're, they're wonderful to work against. I love working uh, against Larry, Daryl, and Daryl, and Tom, and Mary, and it's, you know, it's, it's, I work against people, I guess that's what I do. Yeah. This question is for both of you. How long ago exactly did you start in Las Vegas, and how has it changed from then to now? <coughs> well, I would say uh, I started before Bob in Las Vegas. I in my day, it was an individual owner. Uh, today, it's corporate uh, operations, and it's hard to reach, except I work for Steve Wynn at the Golden Nugget, and he's one of the few guys that's a one-on-one -on -one guy that I can pick up the phone and say, Steve, you know, my uh, toilet paper didn't come. <laughs> and he would sit in his penthouse and said, who cares, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's a different world. In the, in the beginnings, when Bob and I, when I first started, it was more of one-on-one uh, -on -one guys, and now it's big corporations with a lot of people from Japan wandering around going, you want to play golf? <laughs> That's Vegas and a lot of other places. And we'll be back to good old Burbank, California in a moment. One, two, three, cheese. How are you? The, so many young people in the audience. Thank you. That's the great part. You know, Thank you. Sometimes you get the ladies with the shopping bags. Thank you. As you know, uh, Bob Newhart starring uh, very successfully in Newhart, which, as you know, airs Monday night CP, uh, CBS. That's the 10 o'clock time slot, and you own it, uh, kid. Boy, that's some achievement, really. <laughs> Resorts International is very proud to bring you the mouth that roared, the uh, merchant of venom. What do you want to call uh, Don Rickles? Outside of being a very loving uh, guy with a wonderful family, he's at the Golden Nugget in Las Vegas, December's 1 and 2. Don't forget Keaton's Cop with Lee Majors and Abe Vigoda on the big screen. I hope it's a killer. I hope you make love. <laughs> With both of you being friends in the comedy business, is there, any, is there ever any friendly competition? Well, I can say this very honestly. It is a rare occasion that Bob and I talk about each other in uh, competitive ways. We talk about other performers together when we're on trips or just out socially. But I, I've never found an occasion when he and I went one-on-one -on -one about each other. We have always said, hey, I really enjoyed that particular performance, or, or he would tell me about a certain show I did, but we've never been competitive that way, yeah. and I think that's what's made our friendship even you know, stronger. It's, it's very funny about comedians. Other singers will, will rave about the greatest, the last show they did was incredible, and people were lined up and standing ovations and dancers. And you put two comedians together, and they will say, I died last night. You can't believe how bad the audience was. <laughs> Yes, I don't do. know what it is. I guess yeah. if you say it, you're hoping it won't happen again. Yeah. So. Uh, how do you feel about having uh, Don in the audience when you work? Say, on a, on, in a oh, Vegas... Oh, Don, he's a, he, it's happened. I've been in his audience. He's been in mine. And it's he, okay. He, it doesn't alter it at all for you? No. no. I, I, I become a little nervous when Bob's in the audience, really. Yeah. I, I find that I get a little uptight. Uh, I, I become... I realize he's there to see greatness. And... Uh, <laughs> And we have a lot of fun, but uh, being that I respect him so much, when he's in my audience and vice versa, yeah. I think he feels the same way. You know what would make me crazy, though, if if the material doesn't get, doesn't crack the ceiling like it did last night, there's going to be two people in the room who know you and him. Do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah, Phil. All right, good night. <laughs> Don, you're annoying, Phil. You really are. <laughs> Don, will you be at the roast for Tommy Lasorda? No, dear. I just finished the roast for Tommy. Uh, I don't know when this is aired. Just this past weekend in Atlantic City. But I did a tape for them, and it'll be on tape, what I say, because I'll be in the Orient with my wife looking to buy Chinese food. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I, I'd like to know what the two of you were like in your school days. Were you the nerds or the class clowns? Well, I know that Bob was uh, the student. He taught me how to add four and four. I was the class clown. I have to admit that, yes. Don? I'd like to know, since you're such close friends, do you live next door to each other or in another town? 
No, no, I'm trying to move to another town. <laughs> no, we live, we live pretty close to each other. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this is for Mr. Rickles. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, Kelly's Heroes is one of my favorite movies, and this new movie you're coming out with, I hope, can be as good. Uh, do you ever get together with any of the old Kelly, Kelly Heroes bunch? Well, Tully Savalas and Clint Eastwood I adore. Donald Sutherland I don't see too much. Carol O'Connor's a close friend. So we get together, and I keep telling Clint, you know, that he looks good, but... <laughs> yeah. And who is your favorite talk show host? Phil Donahue. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we'll be back in just a moment. You're getting mellow, kid. For a transcript of today's show, send $3 to Donahue Transcripts, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 1007, or call 212-227-READ. I've seen you on your TV show every week, and then I. But I've seen you in Reno on stage. How come your your humor gets so mild on TV? Yeah, and you're so raucous and such a loudmouth. <laughs> it, uh, it, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's that's my. It, that's it, very very it good advice. Service is provided and promotional Do fees paid by the following. Audience to thank these two. Yeah, we're rolling out the good times with Gatsby. Gatsby players, lovers, and friends. We got to see the good times never end. Gatsby from Milton Bradley. True Value Hardware Stores. Your place for service and selection where you'll find quality tools, hardware, and housewares, along with helpful service. While in Los Angeles, the Donahue staff and guests stay at the legendary Beverly Hills, the only hotel after which a city was named. Limousines for Donahue Show guests furnished by Music Express Limousine Service, New York and Los Angeles. Tonight, on The Big Interview. And that's what I do. I laugh about people, no matter what the hell you are. Irish, Jewish, Italian, Negro, Puerto Rican. Well, Puerto Rican. When you do anything different, you're always open for criticism. And if I didn't do what I did, I wouldn't be sitting here now. You've got to be different than the next guy. I don't... Yeah. No one is safe when Rickles is around. You have insulted people of every race, color, creed, religion, gender. How do you get away with it? Because it's, it's not mean-spirited. And it's obvious unless you live under a rock. It's a joke. Hey, this is what you're going to hear, lady. If you're waiting for Billy Graham to come in and make your kid walk again, forget about it. Legendary comedian Don Rickles. Tonight on The Big Interview. Now, here he is, Mr. Womp himself, Don Rickles. It should come as no surprise that Don Rickles routinely opens his act with a tune that evokes a bullfight. And that's because this comedy legend has made a career out of being confrontational. Stop the goddamn band. <laughs> what the hell's the matter with you, for Christ's sake? It's a Mexican thing. It's important, for crying out loud. They're playing it wrong, and now the whole goddamn kitchen is going to quit. This particular set is from the Stardust Casino in Las Vegas. I don't want the colored guy to butt in. And was prominently displayed in the 2007 Emmy Award winning film, Mr. Warmth, The Don Rickles Project. You Italian? What is, what is your heritage? German. German? Get a rope. I'll tell you this. What's your name? Fritz? Hans? What? Frank, my ass. Frank. Does this relax you, Frank? 
That nickname, Mr. Warmth, is of course meant to be sarcastic. 40 million Jews, I got a Nazi sitting on a goddamn front. <laughs> Get the hell out of the way, for Christ's sake. I'm trying to do a show and I got a big ass sticking right here in the front. But as famed American author Gay Talese once said, Don Rickles is too offensive to be offensive. The breadth of Don Rickles' career is astonishing by any measure. He started out telling jokes in strip clubs in the 1950s. He landed a steady gig at New York's fame Copacabana. And Rickles was a Vegas regular during the golden age of the notorious Rat Pack. This comedy legend has insulted some of the biggest names in Hollywood, even the President of the United States. Good evening, Mr. President. Nice to see you, sir, and your lovely wife, Nancy. It's, it's a big treat for me to fly all the way from California to be here for this kind of money. <laughs> Don Rickles was born in Jackson Heights, New York in 1926, the only child of Max and Etta Rickles. Throughout his life, Rickles maintained a fiercely close relationship with his mother. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy and served in the Philippines during World War II. After the war, Rickles returned to New York and decided on a career in show business. With hopes of making it big on Broadway, he started acting at the prestigious American Academy of Dramatic Arts. It didn't take long before Rickles started earning supporting roles in a number of Hollywood films. Hey, come here, you guys. Listen to this. Dear Commander, Japanese Imperial Fleet, be it hereby known that on July 31st, 1943, the USS Nurka, under the command of Captain P.J. Richardson, sunk a Japanese destroyer. Hooray! One down, 20 fish to go. He became an extremely familiar face on television, guest starring on many of the most popular shows. He was a personal favorite of Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. Could I, could I do it a couple of minutes? No! 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 no. Just no give me a fun. break, I'm so lonely. This is a good jacket. You come in tomorrow night with cotton candy, you work the carnival. <laughs> now, anyway, uh, can I say something since I've seen you? I've gotten so old. <laughs> 19 years, John. That's right. Don't milk it anymore. Walk away. <laughs> Regardless of his abrasive onstage persona, Rickles has a reputation for being a loyal and true friend. Clark Gable, Clint Eastwood, Bob Newhart, and Frank Sinatra, among many other Hollywood A-listers, have called him their pal. And among younger comedians, Rickles is considered both a trailblazer and an inspiration. Many of them will tell you there is only one Don Rickles. Well, Don, thank you so much for coming today to do this. Oh, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure, mainly because uh, people of your era, I, I, when you were on with the news, you know, with the, the Cronkite and all those guys, you, you were always top of the line and still top of the line. But it's, it's my pleasure to, to meet you and to do this. Well, I really appreciate you coming. And you talk about an era. I want to talk to you about, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. But tell me a story. Tell me a story about growing up in Jackson Heights, New York. Well, it's not much of a story because Jackson Heights, I, I was... Uh, the school was right, right opposite where we lived. And I was the only child, and we had, uh, my father was a wonderful kind of guy. He, he passed away very young. But oddly enough, he passed away on the street in New York, and my cousin at that time was an intern at Bellevue. Wow. And he was in an ambulance, and he came, not knowing it was my father, and tried to bring him back to life. Oh, wow. it was really... Anyway, so, and my mother was a woman that did the summer these days. She went to a party and just stood up and, you're going to miss me, honey. You know, she loved to kid around and entertain. Well, I want to talk to you about your father. There is a, a, um, a saying that no man is complete until after his father passes. Mm -hmm. First of all, do you agree with that? Well, I was very close to my father. I don't know if it made me any different. My mother had more of an influence on me than my, my dad. My dad was, 
was a wonderful guy, but my mother ran the ship. She was, a, I call her the Jewish Patton. And she, uh, she had full command. She, uh, she'd walk into a room and she'd be noticed. And the only other person I ever met that did that was Sinatra. I, when he came in, people had the soup and they were like this, you know. Okay. And, and he was a good singer, Frank. I, you know, I, I made him look good. And so uh, I, <laughs> I can say that now because he's dead. <laughs> But uh, my mother was really the influential person <clears throat> to make me come out and do what I do. And I, I really wanted to be an actor because I didn't know too much, as the United States Navy proved, because the Japanese would have won if I continued to fight for us. All right. uh, you, you're too humble about your contributions during the war. But I want to come back to your father for a moment. You, you were about what age when your father died? I was about in my late 30s. Yeah, and I, I was in a place in Washington, a little joint, a little, in those days they called it a striptease place. And my cousin came, and I was backstage ready to go on. And he said, now forget it, he passed on two rest or so. And he came on, and he said, uh, Don, Dad, I said, I'm going on, Jerry, not now. I've got to tell you, Dad just died. And I said, really? He said, yeah. Hmm. And I went out on the stage, and the Almighty must have been watching I did the best show in this joint they ever saw in their life. And then when I came back, I realized what happened, and I, I, I took it very hard. I'm not going to pry too far with this, but I have this picture. You're, you're a young man, no longer a boy, mm -hmm. working these strip clubs. Did you make out a lot? You mean with women? Yes. <laughs> it's a strip well, joint. Well, a couple of waitresses died in my arms. But uh, <laughs> otherwise... <laughs> I was a busy little guy, but a lot of women, the, the ones that were kind of decent and beautiful and nice, were scared to death of me. Scared to death of me. They thought, oh, that's the guy that's going to make fun of you, you know. And I finally met my beautiful wife, Barbara. We're married 49 years. And uh, she, was a, she was a very, uh, she still is, thank God, very smart and bright lady. And uh, she understood my humor, you know. And uh, that's the story there. Now, what was the top of the line? What was the best venue in New York City when you were working the strip clubs? Was it the Copacabana? What was, what was the number one place? Oh, no. Uh, the Copacabana was uh, certainly no strip joint. Uh, it was, uh, there's a little story to that. I, I was working at a place called The Elegant, which my manager for 40 years, he passed away, and, uh, in Brooklyn. And you went from The Elegant to a place called Ben Max's Roadside uh, out out of town in Brooklyn or someplace. Well, I skipped Ben Max because my manager knew, uh, about Charlie Girl. And Charlie Girl, you know, was important. And uh, he said, Charlie, can you get on a break in a Copa? Hey, hey, it's done, done. The first time I went to the Copa, I, I met Jules Podell, who ran the Copa. And I said, Mr. Podell, it's nice to meet you. I give the impersonation, but let's wait to talk. I, I, I don't want any kid in my joint that makes fun of people mm -hmm. and calls them dummies and yo-yos. I don't need that crap. Joe, nothing, no, nothing personal, but this kid can't come near my joint. I don't want to see him. I don't want to bother me and leave me alone and I love him. I'll have a drink on me and goodbye. I said, well, Joe, I'm not going to work the cope. And Joe said, he had a high voice like a bird. Don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. You know, put a dress on him. You thought it was a girl. Anyway, if he was alive, I'd be dead if I saw that. Anyway, so he said, I'll take care of it. Don't worry, Don. Next day, the phone rang, and he said, Mr. Podell would like to see you. And I said, oh, geez, what's going to be now? So I went to the coop, and we sat in the lounge, had a drink. He said, I want you to know you're one of the finest, funniest comedians in the world. I've been all over the country. You are now going to be part of the Copacabana family. Say any goddamn thing you want. Well, the punchline was some guys from Brooklyn, you know, their guns were being oiled. And so they, they called them and said, Jules, we like this kid. Boom. And next thing you know, I was starring in a Copacabana. I made it a little shorter, but that's pretty much what, what happened. And I, every time I went on, he'd make me come in the kitchen. The one of the funniest kids in the world. Boom. <laughs> would have a glass of whiskey. How has New York changed? I mean, you know New York. I, I, I adore New York. Uh, I think New York has, uh, you know, when the wise guys were in that city, uh, except with their own, 
they were great to performers. They really were. I, I, I say that all the time. They, I mean, you know, they're, they're real, real, they, they loved show business, and they were always certainly good to me and to a lot of the guys I knew. But uh, New York is still New York, it, 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 except if you're on Broadway. There's no more nightclub, so to speak. You have to be in a, in a show on Broadway, you know, eight shows a week, you know. You, you do good, but in the wings, they're giving you mouth to mouth, you know, especially at my age. <laughs> I, when the curtain came down, <laughs> the four guys carried me away. But I never, that was my dream, to work on Broadway. And I did an off-Broadway play, uh, two. One was with a fellow called Tom Poston, who was on with Bob Newhart, my good friend, on his television show. And the other one was with a, a guy that uh, was adorable, Big, big guy, Ernie Borgnine. We did The Odd Couple. He was great to me. And he played the guy. Uh, I thought I was going to be the loud guy. And he played the loud guy, and I was the timid guy. And we did very well together. Not exactly typecasting. No, no. <laughs> but Ernie was something special. He really was. Straight ahead, more of my interview with Don Rickles. So stay here with us. During the 1960s, for example, he appeared on The Lucy Show. Hi. What's that? F Troop. Why don't you go out and see? In the dark? Gilligan's Island. You're a mean, nasty, vicious man. I know, and I hate myself for it. But if I had known you were such a nice lady, I never would have snatched you. The Dick Van Dyke Show. Oh, what's, what's the matter, fella? Nothing's the matter. This is just a simple little stick-up, huh? Get smart. Max, pussycat! Sid, it's, it's good to see you again. Uh, uh, you haven't changed a bit. How long has it been now? Fifteen years! The Twilight <laughs> Zone. And furthermore, Callahan, you're nothing but a cheating insult to the American bookie. Listen, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think Barney meant to be so, so tough on And The Andy Griffith Show, just to name a few. What's the difference? I'm a loser, that's all. Everything I touch goes south. A bucket, a furnace, a hole. Even a business I bought. In the 1970s, he starred in two shows of his own. The short-lived Don Rickles Show, followed by a two-year run on NBC's CPO Sharky. <laughs> he played a chief petty officer in the U.S. Navy. That series is often remembered for what became known as the cigarette box incident. This is not your land, you crazy town, you're not trying to have the land. Rickles made an appearance on The Tonight Show while Johnny Carson was out and Bob Newhart was filling in. Oh, Carson's cigarette box. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Bob. Carson's cigarette box. Carson's cigarette box. <laughs> you know how long I've had the cigarette box on his desk? You brought that up from New York, sir? I brought this from New York. What on earth? It happened last night. Who? Don Rickles. I did not see the Don show Don Rickles last did it last night. He's taping across the hall. CPO Shark. Can I get over there? Can I get over there? And to the delight of the studio audience, Johnny Carson decided to confront Rickles during the taping of his sitcom. Rickles! Rickles! Hold! Stop the taping! Stop the taping! Somebody broke my cigarette box. <laughs> I just started the show. I picked my box up off my desk that I've had for nine years. My box is broken. They told me, they told me you broke it on the show last night. Well, I, I, I really... I, 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 I... In recent years, Rickles has won high praise and new fans for his depiction of Mr. Potato Head in the popular Pixar franchise, Toy Story. Hey, Ham, look, I'm Picasso. Hey, I don't get it. You uncultured swine. What are you looking at, you hockey puck? Well, we talk about how New York had changed from the 1950s. We're talking about well over half a century. Is the city at its core, at its base, still the New York you knew as a young man and a young performer? Well, everything changes, Dan, as you know. I... I I, I can only say in my time, you know, 
there was more entertainers hanging around that drugstore, hanging around the downtown and, and schmoozing and going to a deli together. You don't see that kind of friendship anymore because nobody's left. The young kids don't do that. They go down to Soho all night and they dance all night, you know, which is fine. But uh, in my day, we all used to hang around by the drugstore or by the deli, you know. And, and I had many friends that way, you know. And then I went to, uh, which is unbelievable, I graduated from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is still a very distinguished place. Right. And uh, I was the kind of guy that said, Rickles graduated from the Academy <laughs> with my background. I mean, I did, I did very well, and that, I was very proud of that. And a lot of good, Grace Kelly was, was in our class, you know. Yeah, should have married her. Anyway, well, anyway. Well, did you ever date her? No, no, no. She wasn't big enough. But I, you know, that's a lot of people I knew, but she wasn't big enough. But <laughs> she was a lovely lady, though. But uh, there were so many uh, people of importance that went to school with me. You know, I, I lived with Jason and the Robots for 20 minutes, you know, and he was a hell of an actor and a good guy. He was. Yeah, good guy, very good. You know what I hear in your voice as you talk about this? is that for all of your success, is there a little part of you that aches that you didn't crack through as an actor? You crack through as a performer, mm -hmm. one of the world's great and best-known performers, mm -hmm. but not as an actor. Does it still hurt at this age? Well, I wouldn't use the word hurt. I was disappointed. But I did film. You know, I did a picture called Rat Race with Debbie Reynolds right. and Tony Curtis. And was known in that picture. I was a mobster, and I slapped her, and they all talked about it. All talked about it. I slapped her in the movie. Right. <laughs> Not on the street. Did you have dinner? Yeah. Are oh, you going to have another? Nice guy from Dallas. Old business friend. Strictly first class. His hotel. Be there in 30 minutes. No later. And so uh, I did that. I did a picture called Run Silent, Run Deep with Clark Gable, who kept saying, don't worry, kid, Lancaster doesn't know. I, I like to throw in my impressions. Lancaster, he doesn't know what the hell's going on, kid. Don't worry about it. Bum, bum, bum. And Burton, he and I played us one of the sailors, but they, they really, Robert Wise, who also played, he elevated the parts. I want this scope up as we dive. As we dive, sir? I want to be ready to fire as soon as we level off at 50 feet. Now, I know this is all new to you, but you'll just have to get used to it. The whole purpose of this drill is to dive and fire as soon as we level. Let's try it again. Surface? Surface! And this last one that I did with Robert De Niro, who I know is the great mumbler, you know. And I said that I went on the set, it was casino, I don't know if you ever saw it, but I, Monty Scorsese liked me very much, and we're still very good friends. And there was no part for me. And I said, geez, I'd love to be in the casino. I know those kind of guys. And Monty Scorsese said, yeah, Rickles would be the guy. And he wrote in a guy called Billy Sherman. It wasn't even in the script. He said, you're going to be De Niro's bodyguard. You'll be. I said, gee, Monty, thanks. I Except went to his house and talked to him for a few minutes. And I said, roll him. And he's walking down the casino floor. And he goes, you know, I went and I said to the girl, we ought to, we ought to, go, to, we ought to go to the movies maybe later. And I said, hold it, hold it. I said, hold it, Marty, Marty, please. I can't work with this man. I can't, I don't need it. I'm walking, I don't need it. He's a mumbler, I don't need it. I'm making $4, he's making 70 million. <laughs> I don't need that. What, where am I going, Marty? They started laughing. <laughs> and they said, don't get around, the Nero don't like laughing. All of a sudden, the Nero's going, oh, 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 Insult humor. Yeah. And you have insulted people of every race, color, creed, religion, gender. How do you get away with it? Well, I, Dan, I, the word insult stuck with me. I really don't... See, nobody would come into a theater and if I said something terrible about you and it wasn't funny and it wasn't uh, sensible, you, you, you wouldn't be there. The idea is that people know, unless you live under a rock... If I say to you, Dan, I'm going to be a friend, the tie in the shirt, it's weak, take it off. Now, 
I'm not saying that you're a moron. I, I do say to a guy, don't be a moron. You know, it's the way you say things. My father had that gift. But I want to get back. You said, that, yes, it's known as insult comedy, mm-hmm. but that you don't really insult people. I want to pursue that. Sure. See, a lot of people watching and listening to say, what do you mean he doesn't insult people? Dan Rather just showed him at a club in Las Vegas he was insulting everybody in the room and half the people on the street. Yeah. And you're asking him? But you say you don't insult them. No, I don't, because it's, it's not mean-spirited, and it's obvious unless you live under a rock. It's a joke. It's a, you know, if I say to a guy, uh, is that the wife? And I go, ooh, have you thought about a hospital? You know. The guy's laughing like you. He's laughing. Why? Because I'm not mean. I'm not, he knows it's a joke, you know. But I worked in many places. At the beginning, I said, good evening. And I, in Montreal, Canada, going, you, uh, he called my wife an idiot. Uh, get, get him out of here. You know, and I used to be on, on the plane a lot. It didn't catch on one, two, three, you know. <laughs> but, that, but, that, but that's what I did. In other words, I did impressions, and nobody laughed, and I can't to this day really tell a joke. But I would, like I'm talking to you, and things would happen. I'd look at the audience, and every night my show does change. There's a beginning, middle, and ending. But every night it changes. It's according to what's in front of me. You know. What does comedy mean to you? Besides a, a great living, a successful career, what does it mean to you? Well, I never... I was always that way. And even in school, even with my friends, uh, I find life can be funny. Things and sadness make me laugh, you know. Uh, not because I'm heartless, certainly not. Uh, when my mother passed away, my mother... My mother made me laugh when she was dying, rest her soul. She was in the hospital with masks and everything. And she was only in her late 70s in those days, you know. And, uh, and she had emphysema, bad. And I said, Doctor, how is he? You know, no. I said, can I go in and talk to her? I said, yeah. And it's a true story. And I walked by, I said, Mom, dear, it's me. And she lifted up the mask and she said, it's that slow in New Vegas? What a wonderful story. It's and you say that story has the added advantage of being true? Yeah, it is true. What a wonderful memory to have you. Oh, I never forgot that. But you said that it hit you hard when your father died. Yeah. Unexpectedly. Yeah. Drops on the street. Yeah, and that's just, at 55, you know, yeah. those days. But your mother was in her 70s. Yeah. But you had been very close to her. In fact, you lived with her before you got married. Not only did we live with her, I lived in a, in a motel in Miami Beach when I was struggling. And there was a curtain between us. She had her quarters and I had mine. It was like a three-room thing with a curtain. <laughs> and I said, Mama, could you go out late tonight? I think I, I, I got a chance. And she said, why, I can't meet them? I know everybody. <laughs> she wasn't exactly a monk, you know what I mean? <laughs> She's a very strong lady, very strong. But I'm thinking, this is the kind of closeness that most grown sons do not have with their mother. That's true. Now, my questions are, first of all, what did you learn from that? I, I learned a lot of, to try to, in those days, you, you always got jealous of the next guy, you know, as a comedian, always, well, I mean, every actor. Oh, he's not as good as me. And she taught me to uh, respect and try to cherish what you have, not be envious. But it pops up once in a while because you're in a business where you're competitive, you know. Absolutely. And so I, she taught me a lot of that. She taught me that I was, you know, like this all the time. We'd go into a restaurant. She'd say, uh, the Rickles table. I'd say, Ma, I'll take care of it. She said, will you stop it? But I'll, I'll take care of it. And they all liked her. She taught me to be aggressive but not rude, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And she would go. And my wife, of 49 years, is similar, to, my, is similar to, to me when I was a kid. I, I, I'll say, Barbara, we're going to go right over there. I know the manager. Stop it. Don't go over there. Wait like everybody else. She talks like that. I do that in front of her, and then she realizes I, I gave her all that jewelry, so she don't make a fuck. No, but she's a wonderful lady. God bless but you. you got this confidence from your mother that didn't come naturally to you. That she no, 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 no. Oh, God, I was, uh, I was embarrassed with hello. You know, I was. I really was. It's, it's amazing, you know, how she would, uh, when I would be with her, I, I felt great. I really did. She always made me feel good. She yelled at me a lot. In other words, I ran away from home once 
in Jackson Heights, and I forget, she lifted up the window at the end and yelled out, I went to the bus stop, and she said, you forgot your sweater. <laughs> well, this is the time for me to ask you, what is the worst thing that's happened to you in your life? I don't know about the worst thing. You've had a great life. So. Yes. So. I, I, you know, Dan, I, as I sit here, the, I, and it's not the worst thing. The, uh, the scariest thing when I was in the Navy in World War II, but the worst thing, God, is usually when a friend passed away or something, and I, I can't, you know, there's so many guys I knew, you know, and it's hard to, to pin it down. One reason I ask, you were talking about your mother. Yeah. And for many men, I'm one of them. Yeah. When you talk about the worst days of your life, yeah. the day your mother passed, yeah. is always on the list. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I take that as a given. Sure. Sure it was. Sure it was. Because uh, she taught me so much. And uh, when I visited her in the hospital, she always gave me, you, you know, the Newt Rockney, you know, the great footballer. She gave me Newt Rockney talk. So she was lying there, you know, poor thing, and <laughs> with pumps and everything else, and, and telling me, how good I'm going to be, you know. Yeah. And in, in the show now, I shouldn't tell you, you'll pay, I'll make you, you'll come to the show, I'll make you pay. We show a, a film clip at the end of my mother talking to me. And it's unique, Dan, because she says, you know, I'm not with you now, but I'm with you in spirit. She did this on This Is Your Life when I did This Is Your Life. And it fits in, you know, with her God. Oh, she makes a speech to the audience, and they all go, ooh, yeah. including me. Hello, doll boy. Tonight has been a long time coming, but I never doubted that it would come. From the time we would use my knitting needles to conduct the orchestra at Ready City Music Hall, I never doubted that you would be a great entertainer. I'm a nice guy, in spite of what you heard. I'm a nice guy. Guy, you can bet your little bird. Whenever you see me, just don't stop the chat. I'm sorry, lady, I can't help it if you're fat. I'm a nice guy. People all adore me. I'm a nice guy. Well, what's the best thing that's happened to you in your life? Well, there's a lot of good. My wife, of course. I'm very happy. My family, my two grandchildren. You know, when you said the worst thing that happened to me, isn't it funny how my mind just, I try to, and it never goes away. I lost my son. I don't want to get too emotional, but he was only 40 years old, and he was everything to us. And he has a sister, thank God, and she has two children, she's great. But he was your only son. My only son, yeah. And to lose a son at 40, then God forbid you should. It was a horror. It, it, it absolutely broke my heart. He didn't want to go to the hospital. There was a little pimple on his leg. It was that, a, 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 a fugitus, I never could pronounce it. It sounds funny, but, I, but that's what I had in, in this leg. That's why I have the cane, because it's, it's getting better. I could, they said I, I would never walk, so, you know, and I'm on the stage now with the cane, and I sit by the piano with the cane, and I do shtick there, and, and they still laugh. Well, I want to talk about that in a moment, and we are going to move on, but before we move on about your son, that I don't know of a parent who wouldn't say, among my greatest fears is that one of my children will pass before I do. Yeah. Before your son passed, did you have that thought yourself? I, honest to God, from the days of recognizing what life was about, from the day I, in World War II, that I was in the Navy under a little pressure, so to speak, with sorrow, I was always able to handle that. Always. Uh, my son was the only time that I fell apart a little bit, but always able to handle that. And I never think of death now at 88. Crazy, I'm telling you, never said this on television. 88, at 80, I go to sleep at night. And sometimes I say, will I wake up in the morning? Is that crazy, Dan? I, I've never said that on television to anybody. I go to sleep and I go, 88. Will I wake up tomorrow? I never said it to my wife, to anybody. It's strange how your head works. Because in May I'll be 89. And, I, and then you read in the paper, 92, Charlie, Eddie, 
boom, you know, giant all around you, and you say, gee, what's going to be, you know? I know I won't see two worlds, three world series from now, or a football game in four years. That's the way, that's the, that's the only, uh, it's the only thing, and I won't get to see them hope to God, you know, be married, and it's a lot of things I, I with my family, I, because I adore my daughter. I think she's wonderful. She's a, she's a struggling actress and comedian and good, and she's good. But I don't know if I'm going to be around to see that kind of success. I hope to be, and I got great care around me. And when I got this, I said, geez, I, doctor, and I had this doctor, great surgeon, but uh, what they call uh, you know, uh, a, a personality you know, for doctors. You know, he was one of those... Uh, uh, well, Don, if you don't get operated, you're, you're going to lose your leg, you know. He was one of those guys. I went, really? Hmm. We were talking like it's a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> lose my leg. That's it. We got to operate right away. He came. I went to the hospital in two minutes. First operation. Six operations. On the six, to get that poison out that was in my leg. And he did it. He did a great job. God bless him. And so we became, then he gave me little tapes of his kids' music after he found out that I was a human being, and he was too. But that's the only time I, I ever think about death at my age. I'll tell you this. <laughs> Is this too fast, Ronnie? Anyway, uh, he's sitting there looking at the program going, where does he say he makes fun of me? Where does it say that? Have you had to dial back at least a little for fear of not being politically correct? I never get into politics. Never. But on such things as, for example, race, can you say the same things that you said in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s today? Sometimes I use a, a, a remark that I used that I thought was very funny. It comes to me and I say it. Yeah. But, you know, I, like the other night, there was a black gentleman. That's, that's recent. I never said it before. Black gentleman, right in the front, good-looking guy. And he was laughing with his wife. And I said, damn, it's a shame. I said, if, if Obama ran again, you'd be in the first row. He's <laughs> in the second row. Did you laugh? He laughed his ass off, you know. <laughs> I, said, I said, we need your people. This is relaxation. All aboard! <laughs> so you haven't really had to dial back. You know, when you're an actor, and like you're a newsman, you can't please everybody. You're selling yourself. No. Even when you say Tokyo will say it was bombed, you know. Oh, it's sad news. But if they didn't like you, they're going to turn to the other station and hear the other guy say the same thing. So we're always selling ourselves. It's true. So the basic thing is, if they like you, you could say the dog died, you know. But some of these guys go, go far, you know, with the, the screwing your, your monkey, you know. You know. It's a funny line, screwing your monkey. Write that down. Anyway, <laughs> so I, <laughs> this guy's writing it down. I don't do the words, I do the attitude. I'll say, screw me, and say, you are a pain in that, you know what, you know. But I'll say it differently than they say, screw you. But that doesn't matter, that's me. The way they do it, the, as long as they laugh, they have a right to do it. Well, you know, you're making a point that I should have noticed. You don't use really foul language. Never. I mean, you do curse some. Son of a bitch, pardon the expression. <laughs> but the F word, for Never. example. Never in my life. So question, are you tempted to change the act a little, saying, look, the times have changed, there are people making a lot of money using these words and using them to get laughs? Only because at 88, I signed a new contract in Vegas. I'm booked for the whole year now. So why would I change? I mean, there's no need to change. It's like the car is still running and the motor is still going. And by the time I decide to change, I'll be in the hospital and Tony or Paul, one of my management, will be going, Don, the doctor says Thursday, you'll move your arm. <laughs> That's about it. The question, is there any well-known celebrity, famous person who resented what you did and didn't take it? You described Johnny Carson, uh, John Wayne. They all took the attitude well. Anybody who didn't take it well? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I'm sure there's a list. But no one has ever come up to me and, of, of fame right. and said, I don't particularly care for your humor. No, no, I've never had that. But when you do anything different, 
you're always open for criticism. And if I didn't do what I did, I wouldn't be sitting here now. You've got to be different than the next guy. And the guys I know that are funny, that are doing boom, boom, joke, 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 joke. Some of them can't get off third base. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You've got to be, so they say, they make up things about it. You've got to see Rickle's show tonight. You should see what he did to, oh, gee, this is great, what he did to that guy. It was all, and sometimes I didn't do what they said I did, you know. But that's the way it goes. You've been so generous with your time, and I appreciate it greatly. Okay. I know you don't want to think about it, and neither do I, but the time comes for everybody. At your memorial service. <laughs> Did you hear something? And, no. Oh. Uh, we hope no time soon. But at your memorial service, what music do you want played, or do you want music played? Well, if I'm dead, who's going to say? Unless I push a rock aside and go, play that! You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh... I adore him, as everybody knows. It's Frank Sinatra. He's, he's my hero as far as that goes. I, uh, I, I would love to have him singing. And I would love to have uh, maybe a few friends that I adore and love say a few words. That's about it. And what would you like for them to say? Greatness has gone. <laughs> that's a joke. No, I don't know what they're going to say. That is then. not a joke. That is not a joke. It might be well said. At what he did, uh, greatness is gone. <laughs> and I was thinking maybe as you go out, and I'm, you have to tell me, you like the Matador music coming on, bringing your act on. Absolutely. So when your act has to move on to the final place, yeah. why not play the Matador? Okay. Make a note of that. I'll call the funeral parlor tomorrow. <laughs> what color would you like the casket? <laughs> Man is burying me here. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back to my house now and just lay down like this, <laughs> and, and wait, and, and wait, and wait for it's over. Wife's gonna say, "What happened? I was with Dan. That you mocked me. I'm dead." <laughs> he did a memorial service to end the show. <laughs> I have cancer, and you don't want to tell me. I son of a. <laughs> Give me a break, Dan. I never. I, you don't look good, as a matter of fact. I want to tell you that. I haven't in a long time. No, God forbid. You got plenty of time. <laughs> What's Man, it was burying me for no reason. <laughs> Don, thank you very much. Thank you, you Dan. Were great and I'll tell you the truth. The reason I'm here is because of your great reputation and your wonderful style, and, and the best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Godspeed to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is that a print? Don Rickles is here for more than 50 years. He has entertained audiences around the world. He maintained close friendship with everyone from Bob Newhart to Frank Sinatra and Johnny Carson. He has written a new memoir with David Ritz called Rickles' Book. The New York Times said we might have known it all along. Rickles is a softy. He professes his love for Sinatra, his love for his mother, his love for his wife, and his love for the L.A. Dodgers. More affecting than these avowals, however, are the comic's sideways reveries about the business of show. That from the New York Times. We're proud to have him at this table. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Charlie. It's nice very nice introduction. I appreciate now, what will you tell me now that you've reached 80 mm. and you walk around? There 81, is a kind 81, a reverence. They say, Mr. Rickles, are you okay? Are you happy? Do we get you some water? Would this seat okay with you, Mr. Rickles? Yeah, and it's not only the seating, it's, it's an atmosphere of... Well, respect, you know, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a street guy. I know, in other words, born and raised in New York. I walk down the street, and I'm very approachable, and I go, Hey, Rickles, hockey puck, how are you to this day? They all call me hockey puck. I can't figure out how I got that. That's another story. But they always are approachable towards me, and I feel that. But I feel there's a, a greater warmth and a greater feeling that I have and they have towards me. That's just my feeling. Why did you decide to write this? Well, uh... uh Simon & Schuster came to me. David, That's a good publisher because yeah, we'd David, like a David, book. David Rosenthal yeah. came out to California, yeah, really right. made a thing. And, he, and David came out and he sat down with me, said, write a book. And I said exactly what, exactly what a lot of people said. Everybody's writing a book, you know, comedians especially. They're all right, trying to write right. books. I said, I can't write books. My education is not that terrific. Like uh, this uh, other gentleman that, I, that you had, had spoken to. Right. They all, you know... Education is so important, and I never had that. I said, David, I can't write a book. He said, yes, you can. I said, why? He said, because it's you. Yeah. He said, and, and you, will, you will do it in your voice. And how he did it, David Ritz, who wrote the Ray Charles story and many right, other things, right. a fine writer, 
was helping me to put it together. In other words, he would sit at the uh, bubble bum. Right. Uh, the computer. Computer, thanks. <laughs> big word, big word. <laughs> Charlie, you know, when I'm, when I'm with you, big word. Computer, I got to put that in my album. Anyway, computer. Yes. And he would sit at the computer and double, triple space it. Yeah. And I would say something. He'd say, no, I don't say it like that, uh, David. Then we'd re I would rewrite it. Oh. Boom, boom. And when you read the book, people tell me it sounds like my voice, which I wanted to, and, Char and David yeah. wanted to. That's and essential. That's it's essential. Yeah. It wouldn't work. It's not in your voice. Here's the thing that I would think Rosenthal would be, would be lured to buy you to do is to tell stories. I mean, mm -hmm. you, not only the people you've worked with, not only the career you've had, not only an understanding of show business, mm -hmm. Because Thank of longevity, you. Mm -hmm. you know people. Mm -hmm. You have stories. You've mm -hmm. been on stage. You've been mm -hmm. backstage. You've done it all. Movies and I'm music. Proud, and I'm proud to say, uh, the highlight of my career, the highlight, Charlie, yeah. is when you say backstage at showbiz. Believe it or not, is when Frank Sinatra had me at the Ronald Reagan second inaugural. Yeah, that was the biggest treat of my life. And I was in Hawaii with my wife on vacation. And Frank said, "You're coming to Washington. You're going to be on the." Second in order, Ronald Reagan. Right. He did their big rally. Yeah, the yeah. Big, and he went to the cabinet. Dinner the cabinet said, right. Buddy, you. <laughs> <Rickles>. <laughs> and he said, You don't have Rickles, you don't have me. That's what he said. I went to Washington and sat in the dressing room, and they said, What is he going to say? And they said, He says whatever he wants. I was so proud of that moment. And I walked out on that stage at the Kennedy Center, remember, Ronald Reagan yeah. sitting there, gee, and just looked at him said, Mr. President, for the kind of money I'm getting, I don't need this, you know, because I don't tell jokes, I tell attitude, right, you know, right. and Ronald Reagan, who I knew when he was governor and all, it was a wonderful night, so that's what I mean, that's, that gives me such a thrill that with my image that I entertained the president and George Bush also, George Bush Sr., right. you know, so that, that's quite a thing for me. Uh, Sinatra, though, you mentioned Sinatra, yes. where did this friendship start? Well, you know, we all have heroes, and I was a very young man, my career started kind of late, but you know, I was in my late 20s and down in Florida, and I was working in this little place, and Frank Sinatra was headlining at the Fountain Blue. Yeah. And my mother, a very strong woman, which is in the book, right. you know, she, my mother's kind of woman, she said, hello, Charlie, how are you? you know, <laughs> and the table vibrates. Yes, you know. I, and I, I mentioned your love for her. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank you. Oh, the New York but, Times did, I think. Yeah, and I used to hide behind her. Really. <laughs> <laughs> She said, Mom, and she Mom. said, stop being so self-conscious, you know. <laughs> Your foot. Oh, she called up uh, Dolly Sinatra and she got on the phone. Dolly, <laughs> darling. Uh, my this son is Frank's said, mother? Yeah. Right. No, my, this is my mother oh, talking oh, to Dolly's. Oh, yeah, oh, talking to right. uh, Frank's mother. Right. The Fontable. Darling, and she knew her. She said, darling, uh, uh, my son is down at the uh, Murray Franklin's little club. Would you get Frank to... Done, Edda. Done. That's my mother's name, Edda. <laughs> done, done. Frank will be there. I'll see to it. Walks in one night, unbeknown to me, walks into this little club that's had 100 people. Walks in. But all these guys are going, <gasps> they, all, they all have bad throats. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Frank, Frank, uh, where is this going to be good? You know. So they all sit you like down. it better over here, yeah, Frank? Yeah, they you all, have it. That's right. They, they put it. So they all sit down. And I said, Frank, God bless you. Why, stand up, be yourself, and hit somebody. <laughs> well, he laughed his fanny off, and the guys went, away, is that funny, Frank? <laughs> And then he said, ah. had he not laughed, I'd be, Billy Graham would be looking for me. <laughs> he would indeed. So that started what, a friendship? Or? A friendship, yes. And then uh, as time went on, uh, we, we, we saw each other. And then he came to Las Vegas. And, and then he put me on his show with him in Las Vegas. Right. And, he, and he, never, he never had me as his opening act. He always mm -hmm. gave me like co-billing, which was a, a wonderful treat. Radio City Music Hall here in New York. Right. Frank Sinatra and Don Rickles with the Count Basie Orchestra it was fantastic. And then we, we, we did the Desert Inn in Las Vegas, and then we toured the country. The last two years of his working life, we toured the country. And then I had the is pleasure... This a, is this the tour that Dean dropped out of? Uh, no, no. That was, some, that was after I came right, later. Right, right. And then, then I uh, was friends with him in Europe. We went, he went to Monte Carlo together. and you know He treated mm. me like an equal. <laughs> uh, there was a bad side, a downside of Frank, too. Yes. You'd see he, that yes. or not? Oh, sure. He had, he had a... Temper. Yeah, it, it was either I love you or take a cab. <laughs> he, it was very hard for him to be in between. In, between, right. in other words, it, we could sit at a table and a guy would come over and say, hello, Frank, how are you? And Frank would say, tell him to go away. <laughs> say, well, tell him to go away. You know, he'd have his moods. But I must say, in all the years I knew him, he, has he was always, he treated me like a kid brother. He never once turned on me. But I could see around him, people were nervous. But one thing... You know many people. Certainly you know the world. He and, and a few presidents that I've met, when he walked into a room, Charlie, it stopped. Right. Absolutely stopped. 
This glass didn't move. And what was that about? He had a charisma. Either fear. Because he physically was an imposing guy. Yes, but he gave that impression. Yeah. And there was a sense of fear and a right. sense of love. Right. It was a mixed thing. People were afraid to maybe pick up a glass or he'd go, hey. And if he said hello and gave you a hug, some people thought that was their life, their, their night. You know? Yeah, right. I did, you know. Yeah, it was a seal of approval that will take you a long way. Right. Uh, other comedians that you have worked with and admired, mm. for what? Mm. Who are they? Well, Bob Newhart, uh, naturally, oh, is the top of the list. Bob's a charming guy and very... Pardon me? Good friends. Oh, yeah. yeah, very. We've traveled the world together. Yeah. Before 9-11, 20 years, we, Jenny and Bob and my wife and I, and that, my joke is, which is so true, because <laughs> we were so opposite. He was, when he first saw me in the lounge in Las Vegas, I called his wife a hooker and told him he was a bumbling idiot, you know. And <laughs> he had no idea from that stuff at the time. But we became great friends because we both loved the same basic values. And the, and, the jo and the joke was the wives. If the wives get along, and that's true in life. It is true in life. If the yeah. wives get along with the girlfriends, you can become great friends. With a guy you're not crazy about. It yeah. wasn't that case with Bob because right. we found out that we both quietly, when we're together to this very day, Christmas Eve, I spend at his house every Christmas Eve with my family and his family. And yet we laugh personally at the same stuff. On the stage, it's apples and oranges with two different products. Did you know Johnny off stage? Johnny Carson? Yes, yes I did. And he was another interesting man, a complete loner. It was hard to get with Johnny, but I became a friend, my wife and I, and he, uh, and, and Newhart too, but I spent the last, well, I, I, four months before he passed away, we had dinner together, but he was the kind of guy. Four like, months? Yeah, yeah. Was he suffering then? This was he, emphysema or something? Yeah, well, he long. always smoked, and he, he, yeah. was, he had to watch himself. But you know, he, he was the kind of guy, Great, as you know, when the light went on, for me, it was an event. When I was on, Johnny Carson, they said, Rickles is on tonight. It was an event. Why? We never, he never looked at the notes. In other words, if it said, we're going to talk about baseball, he'd look at the notes and say, how's your mother? Say, you don't like my mother. Why are you bringing up my mother? And we would do 20 minutes about why he doesn't like my mother. And that became fun. You know, he, he always made yeah. it fun. And he always made me look yeah. great. People say about him that his first interest was in making you look good. Always. More than any other host Absolutely. around. Absolutely. He was interested and would do anything to make you look good and would even give advice during the break. Absolutely. He always, always said, you know, Don, we're going to talk about this, whatever you want to say, blah, blah, blah. But we never, that's interesting, in between the break, we never talked about anything. Never. He, he never said to me, Don, but not both. Would he speak, though? No, oh, no he, he would say, you know, I will, Thursday we'll have dinner, blah, blah, blah. Never talk about the show itself, what we yeah. were doing. And before the show, he would never come into my dressing room, you know, uh, like Jay Leno does. No, he walks down the hall. Guy, yeah, he walks down the hall. Right. He would hide out in his, up in his office. But, and then when we came out together, it was yeah. magic for me. It really was. He never wanted to come back on stage after he left. No, no. Because, did he ever talk about it? I think, I think he had it. I think he just felt the candle was out and he didn't have that. That's, I and really he had a perfect remember. goodbye. Oh, I mean, with wonderful. Bette Midler, it oh, could not was, have been that better. That was magnificent. You know? Yeah, that was magnificent. And then, then he built this beautiful, he had this beautiful home, which is now in Point Doom, right next, right, right. I'm a block away. Right, right. I is have it a Malibu? Hut. I, yes, he has an estate. I'm, I'm living in a hut. No, I live in a <laughs> you're, little, you're in the hut. garage and that's, he's in the main house. That's right. And the plan was we were going to come over. I said, you come over to my little cottage, Johnny, and I'll really show you what class is. And poor thing passed away before that happened. Yeah. He sailed a lot, too, didn't he? I mean, he yeah, went around he the world. Yeah, he had a big yacht. Yeah. He was an amazingly curious guy. Yeah, and he, he loved the stars. He, he loved he, big stars. Yeah. No, oh, no, the stars, stars astronomy. Stars. Yeah. And when you come over the house, you'd say, look, you know, I know nothing about <laughs> what that. What you say? Well, you went along for the hey, show. Hey, to be hey, on the show, I'd say, it was the Big Dipper. You'd say, oh, Jupiter. I love the Big yeah. Dipper. Yeah, yeah well, that's right. <laughs> Jupiter's great. Let's have a cup of coffee. Yeah. And could I be on next week? How did the attitude stuff start? In my personality, in, in school, <laughs> as a young man in school, I was always yeah. the guy that, you know, that, like, for example, they were taking tests, and I'd stand up, and all of a sudden I'd be looking over another paper, and the teacher said, what are you doing? He said, I'm cheating. <laughs> cheating. <laughs> and I would say, Rickles, you, Rickles said that, you know, and it was like, and it was the way you said things, you know. I could say, you know, Charlie, I'm sitting here, like I did a little tape about you, which you'll hear, but I mean, I sit here with you, Charlie, and I'll tell you the very truth, I'm not too crazy about you. <laughs> not that. Yeah, not my cup of tea, but we're going along with it for the kind of money I am. Exactly. But it's all attitude, and I had that in high school, I had that in, in the Navy. You're more of a Larry King guy. In the Navy, right. you know, and in the Navy, it was, oh, it was really, 
I kept saying, I'm "What would happen in the Navy?" Well, I want to be in special service, and they kept going. You know, it's in the book, stamp the paper. And there I am in the Philippines. Guy says, "Keep firing, keep firing over there, that plane over there." I said, "No, I do jokes. Just keep firing." Has it ever gone too far for you? I tell you the truth. This is the God's truth, Charlie. As I sit here now, as 81 years of age, everything I've ever said, and that's a key thing, I've believed in. In other words, I throw my shot on the stage in fun. And I make fun of people and make fun of my life. What I do is exaggerate. That's all I do. They call me insult. Insult, I wouldn't be headlining in, in Las Vegas and Atlantic City and all over the, the world if I, well, not the world, the United States, if I was somebody that was mean and terrible and, 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 and rude. It's, it's not that at all. And, it, and, it's, it's not, and I never backed up. In other words, when I throw my lines, I always say I believe in it. Yeah. And I've never looked back and said, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Because yeah. that's the kiss of death. It's, it's like a fight. If you say, oh, nah, I better not. Yeah, you know yeah, how fighters, yeah, when they're through, they, they exactly. can't throw that punch. If they start pulling back, they, they yeah. will never have no, another no. win. Yeah. Um, Vegas stage was the greatest platform for you? Vegas is exciting for any young entertainer that's coming up. Comics. Yeah, especially and Canadians. Singers, of yeah. course, and singers. It's, it was the capital. Today, it's getting less and less because it's now big productions and so forth. Right. I've been fortunate Cirque to and all headline that. at the Golden Nugget. You know, I've got a wonderful arrangement there. And, it, and it's great, you know. And I just came from Atlantic City, from resorts in uh, Hilton. And working, working these these cities, people still want to see personalities, you know. Mm. But they're getting less and less because they're using these big production shows. But I've been very fortunate. I've been in Vegas now 45 years. I mean, and they said you you have to gamble if you want to stay in Vegas. And I never gambled a penny. And I'm not cheap, believe me. But I never bet. <laughs> I never bet. Don't know how to play cards. Why not? My father subconsciously was a guy, lo lovely, great dad, but he was like in those days, there was an insurance man and $2, $5 on the horses. Right. My mother used to say, Max, what, what are you doing? Well, I was busy all day. He was out at the track. track right. And somehow that bothered me, that, that affected my father. And don't ask me how, but I never felt I couldn't play cards to this day. Come on, Don. I did a picture with Garson Kanan. Right. And, and David Jansen, and I played a dealer, uh, supposedly a, a, a shady What was the movie? Um, I forget. Okay. Look it up. I'll, anyway, <laughs> it's in the book. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I played the deal. And, I, and, got, and, and, and Kanan says, deal the cards and yeah. take them out of the shoe. I couldn't do it. I was fumbling. On, I had to get somebody to double my hands. Because yeah. I, I never could handle that. But Vegas is, is changing. Are, are the comedians still doing oh, much the, the work? Oh, Seinfelds, yeah. uh, you know, Elton John, you know, uh, yeah. some of the majors. Don't, and thank God yours truly. But... It's, I think it's getting less and less that they're going for big production shows because the hotels are getting so massive, you know, yeah. and it's family. They're getting very, I loved it when it was the guys when yeah. I first started, right. you know, some right. 30, 40 years ago when the guy said, you want a cup of coffee? You know, <laughs> you want to have your whole family stay for a year? Well, you know, it was mm -hmm. like uh, today you get a cup of coffee, sign here, <laughs> sign there, sign. It's just coffee. It's like downstairs when I came in to do your show. <laughs> yeah. And then the guy at the end, I had, after he made me go through the whole thing with the badge, <laughs> right. he said, would you write good luck to Mary? Know, I just said, good luck to well, Mary. You could not go in the building without a badge. I swear to God, the guy true. said, would you write good luck to Mary? <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, the act that you do. Does it vary from night to night to night simply because who's in the audience? And how much of it is in simply in your head and how much of it is planned? Well, I have a beginning, which I have to have a middle and an ending. And each night I would say about... No. Go ahead. Uh, each night I would say about 5% changes around my surroundings. And it's not only, Charlie, the audience itself. It's where I am, what's happening. You know what I'm saying? And, and the atmosphere that I have around me. And that creates a difference. And I, I create a lot of stuff as I'm working and a lot of ad-libbing that's not in the regular performance. So every night the show does change according to my mood and what have you. And I, I'm kind of proud of that. Do you think, as people often write, two things. One, that comedians are crying out to be loved. Mm -hmm. I think so, definitely. Sure. You We're selling ourselves. We have... You, you stand out there on that stage, we don't have a car, we don't have a glass, we don't have a toy. Yeah, right. you know, it's one yeah, person. It's hello folks, you know, yeah. if you don't like hello and, folks, And an trouble. audience full of people who are saying, make me laugh. That's true, that's true. Not so much in Vegas, though. Not so much in Vegas, and not so much in Atlantic City. They're there to have fun, and when they right. come to see you, they buy a ticket, right. they know who they're they going to see. They have a couple of drinks, and they want to be and happy. They, and they're, they're, they're dying to see you, you know. Yeah. So and so therefore, you're halfway there with them because oh, sure. the slightest thing will put them oh, sure. into recognition and a laugh. But now, after so many years, when I travel around the country, I, it's not that way anymore for me because I know when they buy the hard ticket, they really want to see me. And I know that 
it's not a challenge anymore. It's just the, the, the ones that are not sure out of curiosity, is he going to make fun of my aunt yeah. or call me a moron? You know, some people do that. But they come and they know what they to expect. There is also this, I suspect. People want to be insulted or they want you to come after them because it's sort of almost a mark of distinction to be in that audience some, and have you pick them out. Yeah, some people do. And I, I have a, a, a knack. I, I, I don't know how, but I have a knack of making fun of somebody and exaggerating without hurting them and, and doing it in such a way that they said, oh, that was great. You know, uh, in other words, when I, when I walk out and I see a guy and I say, I'm a friend. Lose some weight. You know, it's a heavy guy. <laughs> and he laughs. Yeah. Because it's the way I said it, like I said it to right. you. Yeah. And it's done quickly. And the guy, a big heavy guy, will laugh. So another person says it's straight and might be offended by it. So it's always, it's always what I see around me. It's been a great life. God has been good to me. I, I don't mean to get dramatic, but I have uh, two grown children, two grandchildren. A wonderful wife who's completely opposite in a sense, but again, basically value. How is she opposite? She's like a Valium, you know. She goes, I say, that was a great show. It was good. No, listen, let's go and have dinner. It's 8.30, we're on a little long. Dinner, let's have dinner. Now, that doesn't mean she don't enjoy it, but she's seen it so many years, and, she, and she'll say to me as we're going to bed at night, she'll say, it's a good show. You know. And she has that charm about it. She's wonderful. Yeah. She's How long have you been married? 42 years. Is that right? And, and two say, kids, you say? Two, two, cho two grown children and two yeah. grandchildren. Two grandchildren. Yeah, I have a son. Larry and a daughter, Mindy, mm. and two grandchildren, Harrison and Ethan. No regrets? No regrets, thank God. Anything you wished that you could have done, you didn't do? Believe you it or not, movies, you I, would have I, yeah, I would have loved to have been on Broadway. Really? And I would have, uh, like I told to Nathan Lane and producers, I mm. 50 years ago, I think I, Nathan agreed I could have played that part. Have, yeah. and, 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 uh, and produces a show like that. And there are so many other shows on Broadway. Did you try hard to be yes, on I Broadway? Yes, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. I graduated. Yeah. And there was just a lot of people still in shock when they, when, yeah. well, now they call me once in a while and say, would you come, Mr. Rickles, and make a speech? They never had my ad, name in an ad. It was like, oh, shh, don't say this guy. And I went to the American and graduated with yeah. Tom Poston, rest of oh, soul, yeah. Jason Robards, oh, yeah. and Bancroft. Jason was there? Yeah, he was my buddy. We hung out together with yeah. Tom, too, and, and Bancroft, rest of soul, and, and uh, Grace yeah. Kelly was in the class. One of the great nights at this table was Jason Robards and Zoe Caldwell here. And He's he something else, wasn't oh. he? It was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, the brilliant. sense of dignity and the sense of... Oh, Iceman cometh, my oh, God. Yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable. And yet, when you're with him alone as a friend, yeah. talk about the Yankees, yeah. talk about the Dodgers, you know. And a lot of friends around here, too. Oh. A lot of friends. Um, when you think about the business of show business, is it getting better? Is it different today? Has it changed? I mean, you told me how Vegas has changed. Has the work of comedians changed? Is television there more or less because of the changing nature? Well, I think there's so many comedy clubs now. In my day, there wasn't. We just had joints, what we called joints. I played a place, the Wayne Room in Washington. It was like a storefront yeah. with, with, with a bunch of strip What was it called? The Wayne Room. Oh, the Wayne Room, yeah. And would you believe every senator, including exactly. a great man, yeah. Oh, oh God, I erased that. Great man, Walter Cronkite, can you right. imagine? Came in and watched me in those days. Yeah. You know, he, 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 he I certainly want to see this boy. <laughs> because they used to talk about me being in the strip joint. Yeah. But today, what, what I'm getting to, it was all strip. Today, it's comedy clubs, comedy clubs, comedy clubs. Mm. And they're strong with the language, which seems to be a big hit. Yeah. Don't ask me why, but it is. And they have the opportunity, if they're seen by the right guy, to immediately get a television show. Which is great, you know. My day, my day, it wasn't like that, you know. And you were canceled in 20... I, my, but Johnny Carson's great line, he had more pilots than the Japanese Air Force, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, because they all went in a, in a dumper. Mm -hmm. So I, my television career was... Johnny's talking about himself? No, about me. Oh, about you. Oh, okay. no, no. Me, me. I had a thing called CPO Sharky, which was Oh, I remember that, yes. That wasn't too bad, but that didn't last either. I took a cab. But everything I ever did, because I was bigger than... You know what I'm saying, Charlie? Big, I, I realized later in life, I was bigger on the screen. In other words, when they said, quiet, I'd go, where's the gun? The, 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 the cameras would vibrate. Uh, I was a little too big. It's sort of, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it scared people. That's my opinion. Did anybody ever say... Oh, yeah, the Academy, they always said. But if I lost that... Maybe I wouldn't be sitting with Charlie Rose talking about my career. <laughs> or oh, whatever your name is. Yeah, <laughs> right, because the energy would be gone, you know. Yeah. Uh, when you think about, did you go to Europe much? Did you perform in Europe? Oh, no, I never, uh, yes, I did. This is, I performed for Princess Margaret. Bob oh. Hope brought me to England. Yeah. If you have a minute. <laughs> we Bob have Hope, a minute. Bob Hope brought me to England <laughs> with a golf tour. Yeah. And had me and Newhart and... 
Talisa Wallace and all, yeah. all the stars in those days to, to come and, and, and in England, Roger Moore and yeah. Jack Hawkins right. and Anthony Quayle and all the, yeah. all the distinguished and all the uh, British comedians, I can't think offhand right now, but they were all there and, and it was in the ho this hotel. Big and you, you're pro and also in the audience is Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret, yes, sitting at a table with you know, and, <laughs> the royal booth. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> Papa, to make a long story short, he tells his father and talks about him. Bob Newhart, God bless him, does his thing because I'm trouble, you know. And, and Bob Hope now brings me there, wants yeah. me. Now they I, want you early in the game or late in the game? I mean, on the show, you mean? Yeah. I was the end. You were the end, exactly. Right. My name. <laughs> you do not want to follow. There was a man called Mr. Marvin. There was a man called Marvin Davis who passed oh, away. Oh, Marvin Davis. And Marvin, was a great friend, and we used to go to his parties. And my name right, was. And right. now this is after everybody spoke for the toast. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. And now oh. I never had a name. It was a now. And I had to get up and make fun of everybody. Yeah, and exactly. I said that. You, so, you, so you were now, a closer. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah. So now same thing. Bob Hope gets up. Right. I want to tell you, folks, this kid is going to be, and I want to tell you, he doesn't mean any harm. He's a nice kid, and he really is going to entertain you, ma'am. And I'm telling you, he's not mean. He's not this. He's a nice guy. You're going to enjoy him. He's not a bad guy. I think, you know, you think you're going to, I think you're going to, like, I want to tell you, he's really a sweetheart of a guy. You're not going to be, hey, and I'm sitting there, I said, give me a, give me a triple vodka. I'm sitting there, and you know, in England, how to give the vodka. Yeah, I, got exactly. to I said, that's for a star. I said, fill it up so I can. Drink, please. Exactly. And Don Newhart's pouring the vodka, and, I'm, and a guy comes over, and I do the show, and I make fun of the queen, and the boom. Yeah. And um, so, so calls me over. Hope says, I'll go with you. She, and now it's, uh, she only wants to see Mr. Rickles. Oh. Well, all they said, so Newhart says, I'll go to the airport. I'll get the luggage. Sure. <laughs> Don't worry, Rick. Don, it's covered, sweetheart. I'll take, I'll I'll take the wife to the that's right. airport. We'll all we'll be, be on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> of course, this time I really ripped it up pretty good. So yeah, I got off through, I go and sit down with Princess Martin. Yeah. She sits down with me, Charlie. I swear to God. I said, <laughs> she said, you know something? You're very quick. I did not understand everything, but very quick. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Do you drink? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what do you drink? I said, vodka. Give him a double vodka and give me a gin and tonic. Boom. <laughs> I was sitting there, good luck, good luck, both of them. She says, you're very quick. And she says, are you Jewish? <laughs> so I said, oh, she's anti-Semitic. So it is true. What and you say? and Anthony Quayle leans over. He says, no, no, that's only in a dossier, don't. She doesn't mean anything. Don't. I didn't think she did, but, you know, I, but I did one of his takes. Yeah. I'm Jewish. Yeah. So he said, yes, ma'am. She said, okay. She said, I understand. She had a whole dossier. I understand that your mother lives in Florida. She said, yes, my mother lives right here in, down the street here, you know. Talk about the Queen. Yes, right, right. Buckingham Palace. Said, and, Buckingham. And, and, yeah, and, and your mother in sin has, lives in a in, in, in a in a uh, in a, a condominium. So, yeah. Yes, mom has a beautiful, beautiful condominium. Yes. beautiful condominium, right? Yes. Just an apartment. She said, and, and mom, my mom has emphysema. Your, she says your mom has emphysema. My mom has emphysema. This is the Queen of England. Yes. She said yes. so. They're both alike, Tom. Both have emphysema. <laughs> both have condominiums. <laughs> they should meet. Etta should know. That's right. Etta you know, should know whatever the Queen Mother's name was. That's right. And you know what I said? To what? Her? I said there's one difference, man. She said what's that? Your mother has a flag on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Was your mother? How long did your mother live? Was she she was eighty-three. So was that? How many years ago was that? Oh, about twenty. Now, twenty so, years ago. So. Yeah. She must have loved your success. Well, she lived it through me. She, she, you, you would remember. She thought she was Sophie Tucker. You know, she, <laughs> she used to be at a party. She's the first one to get up. Some of these days, you know, you, 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 you hit a bell. But was she, she a stage mother? Yeah, and a, no, she wasn't the one that would. Not in the she, negative sense. She, no, she was the stage mother in the sense that, that she pushed me. She would come to a club and say to the boss, wasn't he marvelous? Did you enjoy? She's an American boy. Oh, very this bright. Is great. Was yeah. this oh, man, man marvelous? Well, tell the well, truth. Tell the truth. Yeah. Now she would you do like this. You like my Don, didn't do you? Yes. And she That's would what do she that. Said. But quietly she said, why can't you be like Alan King? Why can't you be nice? Why do you pick on people? <laughs> yes. And when people would come around, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he great? But it really, she never really got it. She heart. never got what it was that made you great. That's it. That's it. You said it better than me. Never could well. figure it out. She loved, she loved that Alan King, rest his soul. She loved that kind of quiet, quiet humor, like Newhart. You know what I'm saying? It's not quiet, but it's sophisticated. If you went back and looked over the last 30 years at most of the great comedians, whoever list you would take, take a compilation of all the great comedians that are alive and say, who were the greats? What percentage of them would be Jewish? Oh, God, 50%. 50%. And why is that? I don't know, the upbringing, the background, like the Italians are singers, you know, yeah. who's to say, you know, 
But if you want to, I have a good psychiatrist that can sit with you, Charlie. I can't handle everything. Well, I, I, <laughs> Give me a break, Charlie. You know? The only reason I don't do that, I'd be there forever. You no, know? God, I'd just no, say, what's delightful. your problem? And I would be there no, and there and there. You're delightful. Yeah. How many Dodgers games do you go to? You love not the Dodgers? Not many. I, I enjoy it at home. Only because... <laughs> no, I, I Because they're not winning. No, because... No, not, not only that. But when you go to a game, you know... Mr. Rickles, yeah. say hello to Maria. Yeah, yeah. Charlie, say hello to Gabe Rickles, say, hey, yeah. hockey puck. And all of a sudden, then when I go to the private club, I'm up there, you know, boom, having a vodka, boom, right. boom. And this guy, hey, Don, how are you? And I said, What's, what, what inning is it? I never exactly. see the games. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not that comfortable. I love it when I, when I do go with a few friends, which has been rare. But that's true wherever you go, isn't it? It's not just at a baseball game. It's true... Well, but a baseball game, I love to concentrate. Well, movies, they can't bother you. There's nothing, no bother in a movie. No, the Broadway they, play, they don't make a lot of noise bother. in the movie theater. Yeah. Yeah, but Broadway in the play, lobby, yeah. when you're waiting for popcorn... Well, um, they don't bother me too much. And, and, I'm, and, and, I'm, and if it's not there... <laughs> oh, yeah, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm a great guy with, with some guys can't do that. Like, you know, Clint Eastwood, who I adore. You know, they, they don't approach him. We could walk down the street together. They wouldn't buy If it's Clint Eastwood, they come up with Rickles Hawaii. Say, What's the matter with him? You know, and, and Robert De Niro, the, the Clint Eastwood, have, they hide on the tables when they have meals. You know, I say, how's the coffee? Shh, don't, don't ask for coffee. Call me. And they're, they're making $80 billion when the, move, when the light goes on. But they're very loners within themselves. Other than Newhart, who makes you laugh? Gee, who makes me laugh? Well, when I was a kid, Milton Berle was so used to me. When I was, when I was very young. As I got older, I, Milton was more of a friend that I didn't. I knew what he did too well. But when I was a kid, in other words, you could see it coming. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I knew all his shtick, so to speak. But it, no, it makes me laugh. As I said, it, it, it's hard to pick out Charlie in particular who makes me laugh because today was well, Hackett so funny for you when he was alive. Yeah, Buddy I thought it was funny. Alan was. Alan was brilliant. He yeah. was. Alan King had a great attitude, and I thought he. Style and class, he really did. Uh, How about Shecky, the young ones? Shecky Green. Shecky, but oh, these were all, yeah. these were club guys. Shecky Green was These brilliant. were club guys. Yeah, brilliant guy, brilliant comedy. Stand up. Yeah. Did you ever perform with Richard Pryor? No, Richard used to come to see me in a place called the Slate Brothers, where I got a start in California. Yeah. And he'd say, boy, what you do, boom, boom. He was nobody. Then. What you yeah. do, wow, you make fun of people. And you know what he Is did. that what he would say? Yeah. He, how do you do that? Boom. Yeah. You, you remember what happened. The stand up guys look at him and with awe. Yeah, you know, and Lenny the Bruce guys also. Like, same thing. Yeah, yeah and, I, and Lenny Bruce was, was strange because all the people in business, God forbid you said, I don't like Lenny Bruce. To some the comedians in my age group or younger, yeah. they go, What? Not that I've ever said that. But he had a thing that they were fascinated by. Yeah. They found him very brilliant. It was, it was satire. It yeah. was true satire. Yeah, and it was kind Political of raw, satire. you know. It really, was very. Really. Well, I got in trouble because of I it. mean, I, I, yeah. when I started out, I was a monk next to this guy. I mean, you know, he, he was... <laughs> it was a very different thing. Yeah, but he... I mean, he meant it for it to be real. Yeah, and he, but they respected him, as I did, you know. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Dean Martin, did you know him? Yes, I did. Marvelous man. Again, a gentleman that didn't hang out, played his golf, went home. I did his shows. I did many Dean Martin shows. And he wasn't the kind of guy that, come on, let's have dinner. He wasn't that kind of guy. But uh, Frank loved him? Tremendously. Tremendously. And Dean would, didn't like the limelight, you know. He really didn't like the limelight. He liked to play All the, the great success with Jerry Lewis you know, and all. He, he, he Regis, to... Regis Philbin tells the story of going to some restaurant. Mm -hmm. And you could go there every night at a certain time. Yeah, yeah. Is that where it was? One of them. And Dean yeah. would be there eating alone. Mm, yeah. And you were hesitant to go over and say hello. Well, this he was, was after his son died, and he was very much That's into right. his son. As soon as, as soon as the boy, Mr. Yeah. Saul, was killed. Was killed. The shoulders dropped. I call it the yeah. shoulders dropped. And Sammy? Did you know Sammy well? Yes, but not, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We didn't hang out, but he knew me very well, and I knew him very well. But I, Would you have been part of the Rat Pack? Would you have loved that? Well, I was in a way. I was, I was in the steam room. They called me. They, Frank gave me a bathroom called the Rhino with a rhino head on the back of the bathroom. Don't even. Giant rhino head. I had to walk around with that. Yeah. Like, they, as in rhinoceros. Yeah, that's right. And, and we had fun. Five o'clock, I was in the lounge, and he'd bring yeah. me into the steam room, and I was part of the, that group with Dean and Frank and Sam yeah. and firecrackers and booze and laughs. And women. It was great. And it women. was great. It was a great time. It really was. It was a great time. Uh, uh, as, as you say, Sinatra, and I talk about him a lot in the book because... He fascinated me, too. He fascinated me. Most people don't know this about you. John Landis yes. is making a movie. Oh, thank you for bringing that about up. About your yes. life. Yes. It's called, it's called uh, 
Mr. Don Nichols, Mr. Warmth. Mr. Warmth, That's what Don they call Nichols you, project. Mr. Warmth. Yeah, right? Johnny Carson gave me that title. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Warmth. Warmth, Don Nichols project. <laughs> yeah, well, and the it? news, Charlie. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you said the news. I just found out yesterday. Yeah. They've decided to put us on the New York, uh, New York uh, festival. Film festival. Film festival. Oh, that'll be great. Then, so and, the, it's, the movie's, the film is made, the documentary is made. Yes, it's and 90, you've seen it. It's, yes, it's 80 minutes. But it's not out minutes. yet. It'll be out it'll when be out at film the, festival at next festival. year. Right. And it's going to be on a Saturday, October 13th, on a Saturday night. Oh, that's great. They gave it yeah. the premiere spot. I hope you're there to see it. Oh, I, not only that, I can't wait oh, to see it. Oh, and now he that did a great job. Made. My son Larry Rickles came with an idea. To, Dad, why don't we just do it? It's time about your life and all. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And Landis, who, when he was a 17 year old kid, did a picture called Kelly's Heroes. He oh, I used, know, yeah. You to, and Telly Savalas yes, and others. Yes. Yeah. And he used to bring coffee. You know, he was Mr. Rickles' coffee. <laughs> so I did a picture called Innocent Blood. And the first day he was the director with him. I said, John, get some coffee in a bun. He said, you're going to start that again? Blah, blah, blah. So he heard I was doing this, trying to do this with my son. I got to do this. And John dedicated himself to this project. And we had a minimum amount of money. And he raised the money. And I'm telling you, he did a, such a hell of a job, and he's so now, proud tell of Tell me, it. what's the nature of it, though? I mean, because you, there's so many clips of you from all kinds of television shows, mm. all kinds of things, so you can sort of capture mm. the young Rickles through right. the middle Rickles right. through the later Rickles. That's pretty I much... I said that nicely, didn't I? Yes, you did. Yeah, I didn't say the old yeah. Rickles, yeah. the later Rickles. <laughs> You're smart, Charlie, because for the money I'm getting, I don't think you should yeah. insult me. No, I anyway, so, it. so, Charlie... No, but it's an honor to be here, though. Oh, you, it, it really is. It really is. <laughs> now, I must say that. Every time I've mentioned that you're going to be on me... Because yeah. my Miami, I swear, I'm going to be on Charlie Rose. But you're going to be on Charlie Rose? I said, why? What is he going to do to me? But it was, it was. It's, so what's the Landis documentary about? It, well, it's about, as you said, it's about me. He shows my, some of my performance yeah, exactly. in Vegas. Then he shows my family life. Then he shows my trips with Newhart in Europe. Oh, yeah. Of all of us together. Because somebody took home movies? Or? Yeah, home movies. Bob. Who, you took them? Or no, Bob. Bob, Bob. <laughs> I, I got trouble holding it. Bob, does a, Bob takes care of the luggage. I, I do nothing. <laughs> he just, he, when he sees this, he won't look at <laughs> No, he won't. But anyway. <laughs> no, no, in fact, I have some incentive to have him on now. Yeah. Just to oh, you should. He's great. You. He's great. He's great. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Bob, Bob used to, so he has home movies, the, the New Hots and Ginny and my wife, Barbara, in Europe. And then we show uh, that all interviews with people like Marty Scorsese, yeah, yeah. Robert De Niro, who does a great job. He goes, yeah. He's a, good, he's a good actor. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. That's all he said. Well, John was climbing up a tree to get him to talk. <laughs> you know, said, Clint was cute so, and he didn't talk. So De Niro said, he's a good actor. Yeah, well, I you know, I'm exaggerating, work. but he didn't do much, you know. But it was a, it he was much more. It was much more. It was delightful for him to be on it. Though. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't want you to have to sit here with him for an hour, you know. Because Bob's great. He's a great actor, but hello, folks, gets on, gets on his nerves. Anyway, so it shows all these different <laughs> people, you know, from, right. and, and certainly say yeah. the, 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 the stuff about my Sinatra years and yeah. my Vegas years in the lounge. And it does a whole cabbage of all the things I've done and with these people saying things about themselves, connecting them with me, which mm -hmm. is very interesting uh, well, when you see it. And Sidney Poitier, who I adore. I do too. And Sidney is a very, very standoffish guy when it comes to interviews. He doesn't like... He was Tell so nice. It. He, oh, yeah. <laughs> so he came on and he was adorable. And I've had great talks with Sydney. Yeah. But I never dreamed. I said, Sydney, would you? He said, absolutely. And John came to the house and he was beautiful. So you got a lot of people talking about you. Yeah. And there's an interview with you that runs throughout the oh, thing, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And then you got Ixer from now. Yeah. There's a performance with Princess Margaret when she was there. Is that, you have that on there, too? Uh, I know. Okay. No, we have the inaugural of, of Reagan. Though. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you. When you think about performances and people have been in the audiences, tell me about Steve Wynn, Bill Gates, you heard about Warren that? Buffett. Yes. Oh, you didn't hear about that. <laughs> a lot of money in that that's room. The, that's the great. That's the greatest job I ever had. Yeah. They call up. NetJet the, calls. NetJet. Right, NetJet. That's right. Calls up. Buffett says, owns NetJet. Yeah, yeah. So calls up and says, "Listen." And it's a convention in Las Vegas. Right. Says, "Listen, you just said Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Steve Wynn." Have, we're giving them this big party. For Buffett or for Gates? Or? No, for the three of them. For the three of them, okay. And we want you to come up there and just 20 minutes as a surprise and walk out and destroy them. <laughs> and plus 10 hours of NetJet and a bundle oh, of money. They're going to give you 10 hours 10 of, hours of NetJet, NetJet plus and... a bundle of money. Okay. So and I went for up, 20 minutes. Yeah. And I went up. And I, I don't want to do the whole thing, but my opening line was Warren Buffett, who I never met, yeah. was sitting right in the front. And it's summer, and his suit is wrinkled, you know, from the, he has a linen suit on, and it's all wrinkled. And I get up, Charlie, and I walk over, and I take out a 
Here's some money, I think. <laughs> Warren, here, get yourself a, you know, get a pressed. Here's a couple of dollars. You know, whatever you need, you call me. Boom, boom. That's how I opened it. You know? That's great. Yeah. That's and, great. and then I did to Bill Gates, stop playing with the toys. You're a grown man blowing up glass. <laughs> Dude, get a job, for crying out loud, you know. And Steve Witt, I said, I want to shoot his dog and all that stuff. You know? <laughs> He's got that great German yeah, Shepherd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, when has, tell me about when and Las Vegas. His, Have um, you ever worked for him? Oh, yes, I did. I worked for he him. He used to do the Golden Nugget, Golden Nugget then he had yeah. the Treasure Island, that's, then that's he had right. Bellagio, the and now. I worked for him at the original uh, Golden Nugget. Yeah. And, you know, oh, yeah. He's, he and Frank were close or huh? not? Not really. No, yeah. he knew him. Everybody yeah. knew Steve. But he's a genius at designing hotels and putting things together. He's, and he's a very, uh, unfortunately, has a problem with his no, sight now. Right. But he's, with all of that, he is a charmer, and he knows he knows how to do hotels and how to present shows. He's a, he's a master at what he does. Master. I mean, really does. brilliant for concept. Absolutely. absolutely. Changed Las Vegas, some oh, people Oh, absolutely, say. absolutely. And yeah. it all started with, but you know, you got to realize when it was the, the wise guys, so to speak, yeah. I don't like to use that word, but they were. And when, when Howard Hughes came, that's when the ball game changed. Which because I was sorry to what? see go. What did he do? He started buying up all the hotels. I know that, but so the, how did it change, though? Well, it started to be, you know, bring in your, your family, bring oh, in right, your dog, right, right, right. bring in your, your, your grandma who's 108, you know. <laughs> yeah, yes. and, you know, gambling wasn't the big thing, yeah. you know. How did you handle wise guys? Very, very good. They, they, were, they were great to me. Always, I always had success because I was a gentleman, and I never, never butted into their lives. I, uh, I, I'll tell but you. But you didn't pull back because they were wise no, guys. No, at the Copacabana, no. At the Copacabana. This is before a show, up in the lounge. I wouldn't say the fellow's name because it's not okay. right to say it. <laughs> yes. My mother walked, I walk over, and Joe Scandori was my manager yes. for 40 years, and he had he talked like a bird. Sweetheart, don't worry, everybody's going to love you. Everybody's going to love you, don't worry about it. He's talking, talking to your mother, talking to you. No, no, that, that's, that's Joe Scandori. <laughs> yes. So now I, he says, go over to the table, they want to say hello to you. And it's this important guy with four other guys. I sit down, and I'm ready to talk, and my mother <laughs> comes walking over. And says, I'll call him Charlie. His name's not Charlie. Charlie, I want all the guns on the table. <laughs> Don cannot sit here unless you put all the guns on the table. Hand to God. It's great. Guys put guns in those days, put the guns on the table. Is that right? Table. My hand to God. Put the guns <laughs> on the table and said, okay. You know, your mother's name was Edda or Ella? Edda. Edda. And, and uh, they said, now we can talk? Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Man, she was wonderful. Oh, she was, she uh, was. She I mean, me crazy. Put your there. guns on the table. That's right. My Don doesn't talk to guys <laughs> that have guns under the table. Well, I'll give you an idea how the wise guys went to me. And they'd all sit in the front. There was one story in the book, which is true. Guy said to me, I'll make it fast. Guy sat to me in, in Montreal. He was a wise guy sitting in the front. I, and my joke is, is that your wife? And I go, ooh. She said, <laughs> yes. Moose must be over a fireplace. Look at this woman. Ooh. That's what I did. And the guy said, and the guy stared at me. Show's over, and he comes backstage. Yeah. And it's like in Goodfellas. Right. You think she's a moose? I said, it's a joke, uh, Louis. It's a joke. <laughs> joke, huh? Make me laugh. Say it again, that she's a moose. I said, it was a joke. He said, I'm going to take care of this. You understand me? I'm going to take care of this. And he walked away. So I went, and I picked up the phone, and I called up New York, somebody that, right. that my manager and I knew. Boom. Next night, same guy. Sits down, hand the guy. Say with the same girl. Ooh. Ooh, there she is. Ooh. Comes backstage after the show. Okay, tell her again. What? Tell her she's a moose. She's a moose. You see that? Is that a funny kid? Is that a funny kid, huh? Eh? Isn't he a riot? Son, I was so out of line the other night. I was in a bad mood. You were so funny. Call New York. Call New York. New York called him. Yeah, that's right. And I was robbed once. I was robbed once. By wise guys? Uh, no, I don't know. In Chicago, they gave me a lineup, I won't tell you who, yeah. of guys that might have done it. In the in the uh, in the uh, the police did or somebody else? No, no the police did. Oh, the wise in, guys. In the, in the, in the guys ambassador, so in the ambassador hotel, Charlie. Yeah. Ambassador hotel. They did about three floors. Right. And they, Jaja Gabor, God love it. She was up there too. They took jewelry. They, they took stuff out. I came back. We were out for dinner. Come back. Drawers were open. Guys in white gloves. Sriggles, I saw you in Vegas. You're a funny guy. I said I was robbed. Oh no, don't worry about it. Bob and I said, what do they think? Well, don't worry. It's, it's that we'll find a guy. You, you, you were great in Vegas. <laughs> Charlie, my lieutenant will tell you, you're a riot boom. They kept it. I said, geez, they took everything. They didn't, they didn't take no fingerprints, nothing. They left. About a month later, in Florida, yeah. knocking on the door, he brought you my, mother, my mother opens it, nobody's there. In a brown bag is half the stuff they took. <laughs> and the word got back to me, they didn't know it was me. They were so sorry, they didn't know it was me. Do you oh, believe man. it? That's a true story.
It's a great story. When you uh, go out on stage tonight, when will you be on stage again? Oh, now I'm going to be home for a while. I'll, I won't go on until I go back to Bloomington, Illinois. And end college of this town. Month. Yeah. Now, do college students no, do No, I don't play do it? college. I don't, but yeah. the college kids come to see me. Yeah. And it's, that's another thing. Young people now are seeing me, which is I great. I see they would I See, I can imagine that happening. Charlie, I'm so thrilled. Young people are seeing me. Yeah, because, I mean, it's somehow there's an appreciation of what you did. But give me a sense of what, at the best of times, a day would be like for you. Well, at Vegas, you know. What time well, would you get Vegas, up and what, uh, uh, what would Vegas. you do and how would you get ready and what yeah. would you happen? Well, my, my whole thing is with my wife when she's with us most of the time in Vegas. It's, we love after, after work to have dinner. We always eat late. If it's 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock She's going to wait for her dawn. Yeah, yeah, she meets me down in the dressing room. And yeah. We have our drink together. Then we go upstairs and have dinner. And then if we have guests, that's what we do. Right. And we have dinner. And then no, the but next, what is the act? The act is, is at 8, 9, the, 10? The, the, the shows in Vegas are usually yeah. at 8 o'clock. Right, and they and go for an hour, two hours? An hour, hour and 10 minutes, or right. something like that. And then we go, well, there's somebody on before me, so sometimes right. it's longer. But anyway... So we go so then we have dinner, and, and, and then we, we, we go to bed, and I watched. I'm a, I'm a late guy even at home, yeah. like, but on the right. earphones, like, she's well, turning it off. Yeah, yeah right. I, I got to watch television. <laughs> I, you know, I watch you, I, really, I, right. but I go beyond you. I go, yeah. three or four o'clock in the morning, I'm watching <laughs> yes. a Western, you know. Yes. But it's so used to a nightlife. Or a rerun of, yeah, yeah rerun right. of, of, of Kelly's Heroes. Right. But, exactly. But <laughs> it's the idea, and then we, I get up, oh, maybe 10, 11 o'clock, and a lot of times when my wife's with us, believe it or not, we go to a movie in Vegas together. We have popcorn, yeah. see an, an afternoon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, see an afternoon movie. Come home at 5 o'clock. She goes and relaxes, and I start to work myself up. Yeah. And I go down about an hour, good hour with Tony Opetisano, my road manager, and yeah. Paul Sheffern, who's with me today. Oh, him, right. And they go down with me. I get dressed early. I go down, and Elliot White, my manager, Elliot Wiseman, usually calls me on the phone to see how I'm doing. You boom. I go down early and just sit in civilian clothes yeah. and watch the ball game, the Dodgers or whatever's on, any sport, a big, big sports fan, yeah. Lakers. Like the NBA, like yeah, the Lakers. Yeah, oh, Lakers. And, but watch all the sport things and then have a drink and then start, then Conrad, my dresser. Assistant. No, what? Conrad, he's my dresser. And Your assistant. dresser? Well, he helps me dress, Charlie. You never heard that expression? <laughs> no. Well, Charlie, when you get to be 81, you won't be able to get dressed. Up. You'll be in a home spitting up. I know you, Charlie. Conrad helps you dress? Yeah, sure. What does he do? He hands me the tuxedo and the shoes and the socks. And the... That's you think all he I'm does? Do that? Sure. <laughs> No, he's not. Come what on. does Conrad? No, no. What does Conrad do? He's a, he's a valet. He's a valet. Yes. Charlie, you need a yourself valet. Together. Put yourself together, Charlie. How long did Conrad work for you? Well, he's with me for now almost four years. Four? Yeah. Well, you want five? Okay, five. No, four. No, but but you've always had a valet. Always. I had a fellow called Harry Goins that was with me for forty years. <laughs> for forty. That's right. Late Harry. He passed away. He passed away. Great guy, and he would be a protector, but which Harry but Conrad isn't, but. Not that I knew, but in those days when, you know, you know it, was, it was tough joints and he was, he was a bartender and, he, and he, my mother loved him. Yeah. And all of a sudden we gave him 50, this Harry Goins, we gave him $50 a week to shop for us. And yes. then oh, you're fascinated by that. I am. And then he, then I he, am. Then I, he that's why the, I asked the question. He, What's the life of a comedian? You know, so I'm life. telling you. So, I'm telling, I know. so there it is. I get dressed, do the show and do the same thing over and over again. And my days are normal. Sometimes in the old days, I would I'd play golf. I don't play golf anymore. Why did you stop playing golf? Well, because I had a ruptured Achilles years ago. Yeah. And they said, and I have a, a little bit of a bad back now. But the ruptured Achilles, they said, would be free. tennis. I loved too. I was pretty good. But you play I with free... Carson? You ever play with Carson? No, no. He was too too great. He too busy. But I played up in Lake Tahoe, and suddenly, bang! Up, working in t and for, right. uh, up in the air, working for Harris, Bill Harris. I'm playing in tennis. And bang! I thought they took, somebody took a shot at me. Yeah. And, my late, and my leg yeah. was over there. And the doctor said, if ever you play again, the other leg could be frayed. So I suggest oh, you don't. No more, so did. that was no more tennis. No more tennis. And then like, I played golf for a while, and then my back started bothering me. Yeah. And I stopped but do you golf. miss it a lot? Because I love both of them so much. Yeah, I love golf. I do. I do miss golf. But hey, it was either that or, you know. Yeah. You, are you in great health now? Considering, yes. And except for my back. And, I'm 81. Yeah. And your back. Right, my back. You've been married for... 42 years. 42 years. Right. She's doing well? Thank God, yes. Knock on the table. Yeah. Uh, it's been I'm a sorry great... you didn't meet her. You'd love her. Well, I would have. No, I can tell you that right well, now. Put the gun... I will always remember the story. Put the guns on the table, yeah. boys. <laughs> <laughs> Having a valet like that, that's all Harry did was bring your clothes out. Your no, tux for no, the show. he shopped. And he took care of things. <laughs> he shopped. Oh, no, he can. He took you care can't. of the clothes. He took You're care You're traveling like a king. Luggage. Well, I always had that. I was the kind of guy when I was a kid, my father, you know, I'd say to a guy, give me a, say, here's a glass of water. 
Here's four dollars. Give me four more glasses. <laughs> That's my father always did. Here's five dollars. Make the car work. He, we could do nothing. And the car go. Rah, 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 rah. The guy in the street would say, "Fella, you know anything about cars?" Yeah, here's five dollars. Make the car work. It's the truth. And I was always like that, helpless. That's why I have Tony and, and Paul. I, I always had. What? And Tony? What did Tony and Paul do? They, well, Paul's a publicist, right. and Tony's my road manager. How long can you do this? How long do you want to do this? I want to do it until I feel the audience isn't laughing or I'll think, well, please God, or God forbid, I, I lose can't it. Do it. Right, I can't right, do it. Right, right, right. I mean, why quit when they, and I still, I'm still available and they're still showing up? And now I'm thrilled about this New York documentary right. and the book. And so I mean, really my career is, 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 at this stage is, hasn't slowed <laughs> up and I'm just as fast, in my opinion, as I ever was. In your you judgment? don't agree? No, I, <laughs> no, I that just, little pause I just, scared but, me, But the Charlie. pause was dramatic effect. Oh, let oh, it sink good. in. I'm oh, just good. as fast as I've ever been. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> scared me, Charlie. All right, so this is a good year. You're 81 years old. Yeah. You got a movie about your life. John Land is not a bad producer. Great filmmaker. Director, director. You got a book that David Ritz wrote no, with you. Absolutely. You're appearing on. Jimmy Kimmel did an hour with you. Yes, he did. Jimmy. You yes, know, he did. You. Larry King is yes. a great friend. Let him on let him many too. times. Letterman's great. Letterman. Letterman has a lot of Johnny Carson. In him he does. When I'm on his yeah. show, I, have, I feel a lot of that. Jay is good. Don't misunderstand. I know. But, it's but different. Leno, though. Letterman has that little bit of Johnny Carson. What is that? You're right. He's a Midwest right guy, it. and like you are. Well, you're the Southern guy. Yeah. He's a Midwest guy that right. just exactly. just sits there and, and knows when to jump on you, and knows when to, exactly. which Johnny did. Has a feeling in the rhythm of the thing, yeah, and really good. wants you to look good, good and have good. Wants yeah. to oh, see you yeah. happy. Jay does too. I don't want to. Make no, no, I know. But it and is Jimmy's, different. Jimmy, saying Jimmy's a daughter. Jimmy's like a cherub. I know. Jimmy's it's like, true. hello. It's true. Ah. <laughs> well, Larry King too throws the glasses on the floor. They laugh, you know. But yes. David <laughs> plays another game. You yeah. know, he's he's very, yeah. very attentive as you are, very attentive, and mm -hmm. yet knows when to jump yeah. in. The interesting thing about David, I mean, I talked to guys like. Have you interviewed David? I have indeed. Sat right here and smoked a cigar for the entire interview. You are very lucky. He's another guy. It's hard to reach. I couldn't get him on my special. I know. I'm, I'm, he, we asked him, and he, and he is. He, he does think a lot. He a very interesting life. You know, he spent, he, first of all, he's bought land all over the place. Mm. I mean, he has 25 acres. I mean, it may have changed now. Yeah. 25 acres down in St. Bart's. He's got a, a whole, thousands of acres. Very smart. Uh, in Montana. He made Plus race cars. Lots of money. He's yeah. got races cars. I mean, he's, a very, he's very interested in living. Yeah. Uh, but he's not a guy that hangs out. You don't oh, see no. him hanging out in New York. I've no. never seen him at a restaurant in my life. You know he what he did in the restaurant for me, Charlie? You know what he did? I always made a joke on the show, have dinner with me. No, I, I can't. No. Charlie, come on. Come oh, yo, come you on. said that to him. Yeah, yeah. have dinner with yeah. me. Because Regis is always a oh, Regis, Regis Philbin, who I adore. <laughs> I he's just, he's yeah. I just had with him last night. Yeah. He's oh. just a great guy. But you no, asked yeah. David to have dinner. He said, yeah. well, let's have dinner. Yeah, that's a, no, no, no. And I did this a few times. <laughs> so one night, I'll get through, and one of the producers says, Don, you going? I said, I'm going to go to 21 tonight. I said, why? Just go. do what I ask. I said to the wife, okay, we'll go to 21. We go to 21. Major D comes over and says, Don, go downstairs. There, somebody, you got to see something. And I go down into the wine cellar. Right, right. And there he had his entire crew and cast, and his producing people, and, mm -hmm. you know, and light people and all, sitting with a giant buffet, all set up for me and my wife. And That's he great. came down. It's that's classic. what he did. That's, that's what he, he showed up. And then he did it again, with, but on a smaller scale. Yeah. But that's why I had it. People, I, he, I'm not a friend of his, you know, but I know him and respect him. And, and his executive producer used to work with me briefly. And he, what is amazing about him is that he would do that, A. You know, and the fact that he loves people, like Snyder. He loved Snyder for what oh, he was. Oh, Tom was great. Give him to no, Tom, too. Yeah. yeah. Lovely he loved, man. But David loves that. He loved Jack Parr, mm. David did. You know, it's a great, he loves Regis. Mm. You know, yeah, he yeah, has Regis a great too. appreciation for people, you know, who do what they do mm. really, really well. And he also has a great appreciation for people who have been giants in comedy or in broadcasting mm. or, you know, mm. the legends. I mean, it, and it just shows you his own, his sense of respect for excellence right. and the, deep inside the generosity. Yeah. And the shyness. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm. tremendous shyness. Mm. Strange. Well, Johnny had the same thing. Yeah, I know. Light goes on, Charlie, both of them. Light and, goes on. And Johnny had, but Johnny had, a, 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 in a different way, all these interests. He loved astronomy, mm. you know, yeah, and he yeah. loved to play the drums. Oh, yeah. He loved to do all that kind of stuff, you know. And he still had all these interests. You never got him on the show, No, did you? no. Never tried hard, although mm. I knew he watched the show. Yeah. I mean, I think oh, he, he would was like communicating to me that he watched the show know, a lot. I know he would like it. You know. This book is called Rickles Book, Don Rickles with David Ritz. Uh, John Landis' documentary will be out later this year. Uh, perhaps we can redo something when this movie comes out at the New York Film Festival. Oh, that's very sweet of you. I would love that.
It's great to have you here. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And it's, and it's a, a really a pleasure to meet you because I had no idea when I heard, when we submitted our name to your people, I said, gee, he, he's yeah. not going to, he has a different, it's a different life. And everybody said to me, what an interesting thing. You're going to be on with Charlie Rose. You on Charlie Rose? <laughs> I'm very flattered that you asked me. Thank you, Don. Don Rickles for the hour. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. damn show we can do for those three people because it. it matters to them you got it meanwhile i'll sell the indian rug <laughs> but okay where, where did where did the insult act start because obviously you're doing it somewhere before you got on carson and well you know you say start my whole my whole life even since i was a kid i was always uh, the guy as most actors and i think you will agree i'm basically shy and so i was a very inhibited guy and very shy and my mother, Esther, was a very uh, strong lady and aggressive. My father was outgoing. And so to, to cover up my insecurities, I started ribbing people because I didn't know how to communicate. And, I, you know, my uncle would come in the living room and say, close your robe, you look ridiculous, you know. And I, <laughs> you know. And I would make fun of my family, and uh, it sort of became part of me because that was my personality. And yet when I'm away from the camera and I'm... And I'm with my family or friends. I still kid around a great deal like that. But uh, basically, it started just being part of me. And then I embellished on it, and it became a show, so to speak. Way back when, you were working those old burlesque houses, right? With acts like, uh, we have researchers here, acts like Monique Levine and Zokina and her King Cobra. <laughs> I remember the Cobra. <laughs> but I, 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 I didn't call them burlesque houses. I worked what they call, we call them strip joints. I mean, they were like uh, the, the exotic dancers. Those girls worked very hard. And they had a, about ten girls, continuous entertainment, and about five comedians. And we went round and round and round from about, I used to go on, say, 11 o'clock at night until about five in the morning. Continuous, you know, and just with sailors. And that time was the war days. It was right after the war and sailors and soldiers and they were all just looking for the girls so that kind of comedy was tough there was no improv you know with bud freeman who was great for young comedians but it was it was tough you know guys used to just sit there with zip guns and want to pick you off you know waiting for the girls so that i'm guessing is really what put it in high gear this kind of insult the audience sort of thing because they're they say hey get off we want to see the the girl with yeah, the ball constrictor yeah, right and, and i and i could never tell a joke to this day i couldn't you know if you were you and i had a party i mean well, you and I wouldn't be at a party. But I mean, <laughs> if, we, if we were at a party, I, I, I got a little ridiculous. I started to think we we're going to hang out together, <laughs> which is out of the question. Absolutely, it but is. I'm a very busy man. I know that. <laughs> Running after Joe Garaggio going, Joe, do they like me? <laughs> but uh, I, I, I did jokes. I was saying about jokes. I, I did jokes badly. And, and I did impressions, you know, like a million other comedians. And they were going right in the dumper. So I started to talk to the audience. And over a lot of years of talking to the audience, when a guy would yell at me, I'd say, I'm getting fed up with you, you know, I'm going to suck your neck, or whatever I said in those days. And they'd start to laugh. And so it became a conversation with the audience, and that's how that insult thing became little by little, without writing one thing on a piece of paper. It just became part of a performance. And over many years, it developed into what I, what I consider a, a full job, but it took a long time. I don't know if I got the chronology right here, but sometime in the mid-50s, you were at a Hollywood club called Slate Brothers. Yeah. And is that where you met Sinatra or first got close to Sinatra? Actually, I met him in a place called Zardy's Jazz Land. He came in with Peggy Lee many, many years ago in California, which no longer exists. And he brought in a party. In those days, he wore the straw hat and the coat over the shoulder, you know. He brought in an entourage. And, and it's the old story. If Frank laughs, everybody with him goes, you know. I said, good evening. And Frank went, funny, funny stuff. And all the guys went, it's a funny joke. <laughs> they all talk like that. The so guys. it's kind of an honest reaction that you can really gauge your material by. <laughs> what he thinks is funny, I fall on the floor for. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, he, he was great because he would bring in a lot of celebrities and, and people that enjoyed. And, and they, they really, uh, he was a, a booster that way. But how did you get the courage at that stage of your career? You're not Don Rickles with Tonight Show appearances and everything else. How did you get the courage to early in your relationship, say from the stage to Sinatra, Frank, make yourself feel at home. Punch somebody. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jilly Rizzo could have come up with an Uzi, and that would have been the end of it. <laughs> I don't know Jilly Rizzo. <laughs> don't drop names like that, Bob. Don't you have a family? <laughs> uh, last time I checked, someone called St. Louis to <laughs> see if they're still breathing. I can see you on your show tomorrow night just sitting in the chair going, why, why does the left side seem numb? <laughs>
But I, I'm, I, I got to tell you that uh, the, these, these people that uh, so-called, uh, like Jilly Rizzo, dear friend, guys, he would bring in all the, the guys, what I call street people. That, and I'm, I'm, I relate great with street people. And that was fun for me, you know, to, to bring in guys that I could really hit with the jokes and how I say to Frank what I said. You have more courage as you're a younger man than you do today. I mean, I still do what I do. But in those days, you, 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 threw, you threw it to the wind. You know, anybody that came in and said, Frank, I'm really getting fed up. I don't care who you know. I'm going to make you limp when the show's over. You know, whatever I would say to him. And he would laugh because you just, you just knew by looking at him that he was for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and it's been like that ever since. Dean Martin uh, was a key uh, player in your career too, yeah. because I guess shortly after you'd been on the Tonight Show, Martin had his own uh, his own show that was on on Thursday nights yeah. uh, at that time in the '60s, and yeah. and he used you a lot, right? Yeah, Dean Dean used me. the the big uh, break with Dean was once with Roy Rogers, which was a, a fun show, and and yeah, if you know Roy, he was a a guy you know that you know he would laugh at grass growing, <laughs> so uh, but it was a sweet man and. Uh, we had a lot of stuff to bounce off with him, but the big thing was uh, uh, they turned around and uh, had had me uh, go with all stars in the audience. Uh, they brought uh, oh, about 15, 25 stars, and they said, Don, just let the cameras roll and you make it up and pick on all these people. <laughs> Ernie Borgnine's laughing. Big Academy Award winner. Remember you and Marty? He was so brilliant in Marty, and today it's over. That. Go figure this business. Baby Rosemary, so many years I've known you. Remember the old days? You, Mary Small, are all in there. <laughs> and now your career is slowly sinking into the... <laughs> Look at this. Bob Newhart just said to the wife, he's not going to mention me. <laughs> Bob Newhart went into shock. His name wouldn't be mentioned. One of the great stammering idiots of our day, Bob Newhart. When did you first go on, Carson? I started at the very beginning with him in New York. And everybody was afraid to put me on. Uh, they said, oh, this guy, this guy. And Carson was, uh, and Freddie DeCovita, 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 uh, a good friend. They, they said, hey, let's, uh, Peter LaSalle, they said, let's give Rickles a shot. And uh, they did. And the chemistry worked. I mean. <laughs> it's like a motorcycle going by the <laughs> street. I thought we were in Iran. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> gee, how do you know? You got a great studio, real soundproof. <laughs> Guys in the hall going, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole place is it, but uh, chip in and close the doors. But uh, <laughs> you're a dull guy. <laughs> how do you how do you, how do you stay on it? Even at one thirty, it's dull. <laughs> but uh, I must say, uh, uh, these kind of these kind of things work for me, and and so I I just threw it all to the wind. What about the time, and there were so many appearances on The Carson Show, and in the 60s and 70s when you would come on The Carson Show, it was one of these deals, uh, like it later became with George Carlin or Steve Martin. Mm. You, you'd look in the TV guide or you'd hear the night before that that person was going to be on, and you'd make a special effort to stay up and watch it because it had the feeling uh, of an event. What ones stick out in your mind? Well, the, the interesting thing is, he would, we always make notes, you know, like you do. Any, any host always makes notes, and he would always say, they would tell him that Don's going to discuss this, we're going to discuss that, we're going to talk about uh, Newhart, and then we're going to talk about uh, this, this trip, that trip, and blah, blah, blah. And we, he never looked at the card, and we never did. And I'd come by, and in Johnny's way, he would just look at me with that, with that stare and just say, well, you know, and I would go from there. You have signed a $3 million deal to appear here once no, a no, week. No, no, what do you, no. And uh, <laughs> with a clause in if you're moody, maybe. <laughs> Because Ed told me that. He said, what a deal he's got. Huh? <laughs> I got to sit on a couch like a moron, and I was a colonel. <laughs> Attitude is very important. Milton Berle once told me that uh, many, many years ago. And, and so right, which I think uh, young comedians, some of them that don't make it, to have an attitude. Mine was always, you know, the angry guy, you know, come on, coming on Bob Costas, like I saw you in the hall and said, I don't need this, I don't want it. I mean, and no dressing room, you know, it, standing in the hall asking the cop to stand in front of me while I take off my <laughs> pants is ridiculous. But I mean, so it's all attitude. That's, that's what makes the performance, I think. Attitude and, and, uh, and how you say it. There's other guys that can say certain things to people saying, you're an idiot. And boom, it doesn't come off funny. If you have a way of saying it to a person, they'll laugh. Roll the film. Well, do you want to explain what it's about? No, who cares? You don't care. 
Well, no, it's cool. about it's yeah. a, us against the world. Is about a group of uh, wonderful stars from the different networks, all the big names: mm. Susan Katz, Al Lipschitz, <laughs> Barry Green, Harry Marvin Farnham, yes. Lou Brock. <laughs> Oh, uh, Nicky. Getting on my nerves, Lou. <laughs> you used to say at the end of your shows, I'm not sure if you do it anymore, but at the end of your nightclub act, you used to say, uh, you know, it's all an act and uh, I hope I haven't offended anybody. And some people who were fans of yours said, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't get out of character. Uh, you know, it's all an act and uh, I hope I haven't offended anybody. And some people who were fans of yours said, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't get out of character. Yeah, you really do your homework, yeah. I've had that by many reviewers saying, oh, Rickles cops out at the end. I do a little piece at the end, uh, which I've done for many years. And I'm not copping out. I'm just saying to the guy that's sitting there, the average guy, that I'm a guy just like anybody else. And this was a, was a party. And I was having some fun at the party. And now the party's over. And I hope you got to know me as the guy at the party and as a human being. And that's all I try to say. And a lot of people say, he doesn't need that. I ought to go off with, you know, as some of these guys today are doing with, uh, you know, <laughs> let your mother get hit by a bus. I'm cleaning it up. But, you know, it's, uh, it, I feel that it deserves that and I think the audience I owe that to the audience and I Jack Parr in Miami, where some bit was set up, but... <laughs> I wanted to be on, I was working in a place called Murray Franklin's, which, uh, again, gave me some, like the Slate Brothers, gave me a little reputation in Florida. That time, Larry King, by the way, throwing that in, Larry King had a radio show on a, on a houseboat, and that's how Larry and I became friends. I used to run over there and do his show uh -huh. at five in the morning, you know. Anyway, so uh, we, were in, uh, we were in Florida, and uh, Jack Parr came down there, on location at the Roney Plaza. And everybody said, you gotta get this hot kid in Miami. He, he'd be great on your show. And you know, Jack Parr, who I got to know personally through High Everback, a friend of mine, uh, socially, and uh, lovely man, he said, gee, Don, I, I, I remember that. I didn't know the kind of guy you were, and so forth and so forth. And they said, put him on, and they made me a cab driver. And Jack Parr had no idea what I was gonna do, and Jack Parr was doing his, uh, 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 folks, I'm here in Florida, and I had to come out with the cab driver. <laughs> so ridiculous. But the cab driver, knowing him, the man was in shock when he saw my face, you know. And I had on the cab driver hat, Bob, and I walked out and said, hey, hey, Jack, sweetheart, boom, you want a cab? I'm going to help you, and you're a beauty. Uh, uh, honeysuckle rose, baby, boom. And he went, what are, what are you doing? <laughs> and I went, <laughs> like I'm doing now. Hey, Jack, it's great. I'll give you a cab ride right up to, uh, right up to Collins Avenue. You're with me, baby. You're as we get some broads and booze. Why are you on here? <laughs> and uh, I went right in the dumper. And, and I stood there and I said, my career is ending. This man is ending my career. And my mother, God rest his soul, was up in the balcony. And she said, oh, my God. Oh, my God, he's through. And the audience was all senior citizens sitting there going, what a vice guy, what a vice guy. <laughs> <laughs> this vice guy. And uh, that was a disaster. Didn't someone let Paul in on the joke? No, I don't think at that time he knew. They said there's a guy that's going to pick on you. But he had no idea yeah. that it was going to be like that. And I had no idea he was going to react like that. And I looked into his eyes. You know how you look into a guy's eyes and his eyes said, you're dead. It's over. <laughs> It's all over for you. And I, and I just looked at him and, and flop sweat. In those days, I would be soaking wet when I said good evening, no matter where I went. If I sat in a restaurant with my mother, I said good evening. And the waiter said, I'll give him a napkin. The guy's, he's, he's on Guam. I was soaking wet all the time. I don't know why. I keep looking over there and there's nobody there. I'm looking in. I feel like I'm George Shearing. Hello, anybody. You know. Someone go stand over there. Huh? I keep looking over into darkness.
What about the Ed Sullivan show? It was sort, oh, of, the, was sort of the same thing, right? You were going to come out and surprise beauty, him? Beauty, or? beauty. Bob Pratt said, listen, uh, Ed Sullivan said, you know, I don't want to do impressions, but knowing Ed, he was a classic. He really was. And a good friend. He said, you know, what are we going to do with Rickles? We can't. He doesn't do jukes. We've got to put him on a show. We put him on a show and it'll be fine. What can we do? So Bob Pratt came up with an idea, which I didn't think was bad at the time, that every time they'd bring out an act, I'd run out on stage and tell Ed how wrong this act was for him and how he should never use this act again. And we'd do that as a running gig. And at that time, Ed Sullivan was the biggest thing in the world. I said, oh, what a break for me, and that'd be great. And it was at Circus Circus at that time. And I'll never forget it. Uh, you know, had to be the swinging acrobats and the clowns and right. all. It was the, the tumult of all time. And it's like, da 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 And now, the Bonzini monkeys, whatever the hell it was, you know. And the monkeys come out and they do their whole thing and they do tricks and boom, 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 boom. And I'd run out on the stage and go, Ed, I gotta tell you, the monkeys don't make it, you don't look good with the monkeys, and get rid of the monkeys. Why don't you get off the stage? <laughs> what are you, stupid or something? Those monkeys are marvelous. You're not funny. The monkeys are a riot. And I walked in the wings and I went, what? <laughs> what is he doing? He's not supposed to say that. And the guy says, no, no, he'll catch on. I walked out again. I had to, you know, prancing horse or something. I said, you don't need the horse. The horse is ruining. He's prancing. He's too loud. You're dynamite. Ed. Get rid of the horse. The horse is marvelous, and you're getting on my nerves. And I get off the stage, and I went in the wings. Why? Why is he doing this? And it went like that until I was right in the dumper again. And I went back to the hotel with him, and I said, he said, you were marvelous. What a show we had. I said, Ed, you ruined me. <laughs> and that was that. What debt, if any, do you owe to Jackie Leonard, who was a little bit before you, and he used to do some insult stuff himself? Yeah, interesting you'd say that. Jack was a good friend, and he always, uh, always said, uh, you're doing me, kid, you're doing me, which was not the case, because Jack always felt that I was doing him, but Jack was a jokester. He really did, you know, one-line puns, you know. Oh, you know, you know, little cocker, you know, your mother, uh, 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 suck a bathtub, you know, whatever, <laughs> and people go, ah. And I, I didn't work like that. I, I did more or less uh, uh, just, just talking in general without leading to a joke. And the joke came out of the conversation, if that makes sense. But that's pretty much, and he was a one-line machine gun kind of thing. And I'm a machine gun kind of guy when I work, but it doesn't come out as a joke as Jack's did. Jack's were primarily jokes. That's the best way I can describe it. Early in your career, didn't you open for Louis Prima? Yeah, well, I, the word is, I really can't say I open. I was, they, in those days, they called it sets. Uh, for the lack of another word, opening's fine. But I mean, I, I went on, admit, Louis Prima was the star in the lounge. We worked over a bar, no big, with, with short little bar with the, maybe 10, 15 people in front of you. And, you know, they were missing their mouth, you know. They had, had this, <laughs> we had the she-she crowd going, Bore, you know, belching on the socks. <laughs> and so, uh, and I would go on at midnight, and then Louis Prima would be with Keeley, would go on, he was marvelous, at two in the morning, and then I would go on again at uh, like 3.30, and then again like 5 in the morning. 5 in the morning, I don't remember. I used to go on at 5, five in the morning? Yeah, but with a few vodkas, you know, I, I used to just stand out there and say, how was the show? Well, and what would the audience look like? <laughs> Derelicts. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of this. <laughs> Rose, isn't he great? <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a show, and they'd have a steam table, and they'd be serving breakfast while you were on. I mean, guys were having eggs going, uh, Charlie, pass the rolls. And you were up there to, to <laughs> telling us some dumb remark, and the guy going, uh, well, more eggs. And, and the chef was hitting the steam table. And these are really the degenerate gamblers who just kind of have been up around the oh, clock, and absolutely. they just, they're waiting for the casino to open again, or the guy to come back to deal again at the blackjack table. Oh, yeah. Oh, fanatic gamblers. Yeah, they stay up all night and all day. Bloodshot eyes and just, and they were there. But I got news, it was, it was an experience. And at that time, uh, in the lounge, uh, Shecky Green was the first guy to really make it happen in the lounge in those days. And then I came along. And then, uh, little by little, many other performers worked. But uh, it was really standing over a bar. That's really concentration to get people. And I used to jump over and run into the casino. I'll never forget it. And the guys are gambling, and I'd say, Hold it! Hold it! Stop the gambling! It's too noisy! And they'd all go... <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the casino stopped similar to Sinatra when I made him stop. He was sitting with a, a well, it's in the lounge of the Sands, we were sitting together, and I, he was sitting at another table with all security around him, and I was with this girl, a classy, I've told this story many times, classy girl, you know, lipstick over to here, you know, and I was single and in terrible heat, you know. <laughs> I was looking for an old monkey, anything, you know. 
bad shape. It's, it's good that you reveal yourself this way, though. Oh, yeah, well, nobody watches this. <laughs> if I thought anybody was watching, would I be telling you this? <laughs> anyway, so I was there with this girl, and she said, do you know Frank Sinatra? And I figured, you know, she says, yeah, it's a big chance for a score here. You know, I said, yes, I do. And she said, well, if I could beat him. I said, sweetheart, it's done. And I walked over to Frank on my knees, and I went, Frank, psst, if you could come over to the table and just say hi to me and the grill would help me. He said, you got it, kid. And he walked over to the table, make a long story short, and the violin's up, it's done. And I walked over to Frank on my knees and I went, Frank, psst, if you could come over to the table and just say hi to me and the grill would help me. He said, you got it, kid. And he walked over to the table, make a long story short, and the violins are playing, they're serving drinks. And he leans over and says, hi, Don. I go, Frank, not now. Can't you see I'm with people? I'm talking to the girl. How do I know if your album's going to sell? Get out of my life. And the girl dropped the drink and just went, oh, my God. And he had me thrown out. True story. Is only just beginning to dislike me intensely, which means that the best is yet to come. We give him a chance to get warmed up and then really pull the sword out tomorrow night. In the meantime, we want to remind you he's at the Golden Nugget in Las Vegas between June 6th and June 10th. And until tomorrow, we'll see you later. Thanks for staying up later. We're back with Don Rickles. We talked about uh, some of the appearances on The Carson Show and uh, his nightclub act the last time. Did you ever feel as if, just by the law of averages, doing hundreds of shows, you went over the line accidentally and then you regret it? I don't think I regret it. One time I said, gee, I really dug into that person in my beginnings. I think in, uh, as years went on and I found success that I never thought about it twice. I mean, I always said, I'm right. If they can't handle that, they got a problem. But in my beginnings, I would say, yes, I, I dug in a little deep, but uh, that's, what gave, that's what made people look up because if you come out like a monk and sing a choir song, nobody's going to care, you know. What's your first name, Muhammad? What's your first name? Habib. <laughs> How the hell did you get in the front? <laughs> Look at the way they put him. He could pick me off in five minutes. Right in the front. I got a Fakat the Arab over here, a boozed up gypsy broad over there, three kids in heat over here, a German pain in the ass over here, two Japs that passed away, trick or treat Harvey with a turtleneck sweater, Ma Frickett sitting over there waiting for the Pillsbury Bake Off, the Spanish guy planning to attack the Mexican, and two Polacks on the end waiting for their truck to be fixed. <laughs> I always had to, uh, always had to uh, uh, pick on people and, and, and make it work for me. And that, that, that doesn't help all the time. Because when I did, interesting enough, Bob, when I did uh, television, I had three television series. They, uh, Carson, all of them love to say, what's your next bomb coming up? I had CPO Sharky, The Don Rickles Show on ABC, CBS The Don Rickles Show, and, and then I had follow-up spoops and blunders with Steve Lawrence, which was a mistake from the beginning. Not Steve, he was great, but, <clears throat> but every show... Overnight, Chicago, New York, Detroit, biggest thing, forget about it. You had to run alongside of my limo, knocking on the window, you know, Don, say hello. And then when we got to Des Moines, and we started to hit Elko, Nevada, the three guys went, Mary, shut it off, that loud guy's on, you know. So those, those were tough places for me to get. But overnights in the major cities, I was always successful. See, but I would also think with those TV shows, even though they tried to open them up and let you be yourself, it misses the electricity and the danger of a live television shot. That's where you were at your best. What's going to happen when he comes out on The Tonight Show? Mm. Is it going to work? Is he going to get on Absolutely. a roll? What might he say? For better or worse, it's live. You can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I, it's very true, the, that excitement. But how do you create that? See, guys would say in shows that I was on, when I had my own show, they'd say, hey, let Don do, a, let him do a, a, a rampage. Let him just say anything to fill in here. And you, 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 if you, you can't really do that, then you, then you become the guy I do on the, on the nightclub stage, and you wanted to make it a character. So we were confused sometimes between the character and Don Rickles, you know. So it was hard to blend sometimes. You know what you look like, Robinson? A man on welfare. He's just been told he has three ex-wives to support. All ugly. And then you gotta be kidding about this. I mean, you're gonna throw away 24 years, give up a career just because your new CO is a woman? You got it. I mean, what is the matter with you? There are women in the service all over the world. Well, I just read the other day that in China, they got a woman who's captain of a ship. In China, they can get away with it. They all wear pajamas, and they all look alike. <laughs> you really gonna send this in to the CO, huh? No, I'm gonna send it to Dear Abby and sign it puzzled in San Diego. Do you have any kind of regret at all? I mean, not that you'd trade it 
on balance, but any kind of regret that your tremendous success and visibility as a comic pretty much eliminated any chance to be an actor in, in most roles because people would say, wait a minute, that's Don Rickles. Well, that's the price you have to pay when you get, <clears throat> pardon me, when you get that kind of identification. You know, I was always, as you know, the, the insult guy, Mr. Warmth, you know, the, the sultan of uh, whatever, and, uh, and all these titles they gave me. And it was tough to overcome. Producers would back off a little bit because you get this image. But as I say, uh, you can't have it all. I, I still feel before the, you know, the big guy in the sky gear takes the hook for me. I would love to do something, uh, you know, which is uh, a little bit away from character, and hopefully that will happen. Uh, uh, but uh, I've, I've had my chances. I've done a few films that I, Rat Race was, I played a heavy in that, and that was a picture with Debbie Reynolds and Tony Curtis a lot of years ago. But as I got more and more popular with this kind of image, it was, it was, it was tough. Yet you take a young, brilliant guy, like a young man, like a Billy Crystal, you know, who's become a big star in motion pictures. That's great because he's always been funny, but he's never had that, that image of, you know, like I, like you said, the guy that was rapping on people. And so when you have a, a, a tough image, it's hard for people to shake that, you know, that, that thought of you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Billy's uh, success as a, a comic is in getting into characters. Yes, yes. He Rather than, than being creating a specific Billy Crystal Absolutely. persona. Absolutely, and he's wonderful, he really is. Yeah, another film you're in was Run Silent, Run Deep with Burt Lancaster and uh, Clark, Clark Gable. Gable. Yeah, I carried them. <laughs> yeah, I was Burt Lan I'll never forget the first time, that was the first picture, I, I never was on a movie set, it was at Goldwyn, right out here, and, and I had to read for this thing, and I had a, you know, one of those work lights on the stage, and I came to the studio and uh, with this... Uh, I was with uh, Henry Slate and a few other people, and we walked in, and he said, Mr. Rickles, you're going to read uh, for this part. And I said, and, and it was pitch dark, and I was just standing with a light, and Robert Wise was the director, and I said, well, it, will, will Clark Gable or Burt Lancaster? He said, no, 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 no. There'll, there'll be a voice off stage. They'll just read the lines for you, <clears throat> and you just read it, and you'll hear them answer the lines, and you do it. And I stood out there, and I said, whatever the lines were, I said, uh, I said, well, well the, the, the ship is sinking, sir. Will, will the men be all okay? Well, sh shall we fire the torpedo? And a voice off camera went, take it down 100 feet. Dive, dive, don't worry. And I went, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And I started to spit up on myself. And Clark Gable said, do you, do you have a problem, young man? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I went to pieces. But uh, fortunately, I got the part. Were you entertaining on the set with guys like uh, Gable and Lancaster, or were you too intimidated no I, I wasn't I was at the beginning but there was a guy called Jack Warden who's a marvelous yeah. actor great sense of humor Jack is haven't seen him in years but he's been he was a funny funny guy and we did a lot of crazy things and Gable used to love it you know uh, we once got completely undressed Jack Warden and I and we embraced each other and sneaked into Gable's I've never told us and sneaked into Gable's the uh, trailer <laughs> And Clark Gable was a very humble guy. He really, very quiet, like, had a little scotch and went, uh, to any, to anybody, uh, you know. And, and Burt Lancaster used to sit around going, Clark, we're going to do, we're going to do another scene in a couple of minutes. He said, fine. And, and Burt was still doing those days, doing circus tricks. But uh, whatever that means. And so we both got undressed and we were in the thing and Gable walked in and saw us both on the bed and went, Oh my God! They're out of control. Like they're, I think, I think they're fags. I don't know what they are. Wow! Damn! I don't know what's happening here. Wow! Down! <laughs> and he went nuts. And Jack one went, "Hey, sweetheart, we're just having a good time. What are you worried about?" <laughs> yeah, we did crazy things like that. <laughs> kind of an enlightening tale behind the scenes <laughs> of, of an epic motion picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speak, speaking of epic motion pictures. You will be surprised and perhaps flattered to know that long before I ever knew that I'd be sitting here with you, I had seen Man with the X-Ray Eyes, Ooh. the Roger Corman film with you as the carnival barker and Ray Milan Ray as, as a guy who was, people thought he was a circus act, but he actually could see through stuff. That's right. And he had his eyes fixed. They had, they had to, you know, put things in his eyes and make it like giant eyes, and he got an infection. The guy almost died doing this part. And in those days, we did a movie in 15 days. 
you know, you, you just came in, there was no rehearsal, nothing. They said, roll them, you went, what's my first line? Good evening. Oh, good evening! You know, you, and, you, and, you, and you did it, and you boom, 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 and it went like crazy. But it was a, 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 great, a great experience. And, and that picture, surprisingly enough, in those days when you did those quickies, those little thrillers, they made money. And, and uh, I played a real heavy in that, and uh, Raymond Liam was, was a great guy. All those guys, yeah, it's interesting, Gable, Burt Lancaster, who is, uh, he's watching, he hasn't been too well, but I wish him the best. Burt Lancaster, Clark Gable, and you go back, Tony Quinn, all those guys, they really, uh, wonderful actors, Gary. Burt Lancaster, Clark Gable, and you go back, Tony Quinn, all those guys, they really, uh, wonderful actors, Gary Cooper, who I never, I, I just met once or twice, all those kind of guys never did the method or anything. They were pretty much themselves. Yeah. But they portrayed, if they were supposed to be sad, they acted sad. You know, it's like the joke, like you say, uh, Clark Abbey, you say, all right, roll him. And he says, uh, you know, Steve, I'm fed up with you, and I'm going to kill you. And then you go, cut. And he goes, how about going to lunch? <laughs> and it's the same guy, you know. Everybody says, what a great actor. <laughs> That's what always knocked me out, you know. <laughs> That you did Beach Blanket Bingo, right? Which that was, was I think, biggies. the last of the beach movies with uh, Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello. In fact, that was such a hit that Barbara Bush, just recently, Barbara Bush, who I met when I was in the White House, and I was invited to a state dinner, which is another long story. My wife and I have never been to Have you been to a state dinner? No. Well, don't, don't, don't make I, any plans. I was actually invited to the White House once. Were you really? Yeah. You want to hear the story? Maybe you don't. No, I, hey, I'm, I got time. <laughs> I was invited to it's the... It's in the morning. Where are we going? I was invited to the White House because Bush invited these baseball announcers. He invited Jack Buck and Tim McCarver. And I think Vin was invited, Scully, but he, he couldn't make it because the National League playoffs were opening in Chicago. It was in early October. And I was going to do the American League playoffs in Oakland, Toronto and, and the A's. And I felt that I couldn't give up the day before as preparation and then fly in mm -hmm. overnight because it was the last series that NBC was going to do before we lost the baseball. Mm -hmm. So with regret, I had to pass up this chance to go to the White House, and, and basically Bush has been a broken man ever since. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> George, I never said it. A 38-year-old kid did it. <laughs> so anyway, you were at the state yeah, dinner. Yeah, so I was at a state dinner, and it was for the president of Tunisia, and I being Jewish, that's one of my favorite countries. <laughs> Ah, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of sheets and a lot of guys going, <laughs> One guy had a sword, which I thought was out of line. <laughs> he wanted to make me Jewish again. <laughs> oh, funny stuff. If only it was on a show that was on early. <laughs> Blowing all this stuff with a 1.30 in the morning job. But I, I went to the White House for President of Tunisia, and Barbara Bush was great. And the, the seating, when they came for the seating, so another story, was by the fireplace was Barbara Bush and the Marine guard took me over and said, this is your seat. I said, no, it must be a mistake. This is Barbara Bush and that seat is mine. He said, and all of a sudden the voice said, sit down. It was Barbara Bush. And I sat down next to her. We had the best time in the world because we had this uh, Arab gentleman sitting alongside of her and he kept going, and she kept saying, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I got nervous. I figured maybe, maybe he saw my mezuzah. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it was a wonderful time, and th we got to be friendly. Well, she knew me for the inaugural Ronald Reagan previous to this. I did the inaugural uh, with Frank Sinatra, boom, 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 and the cabinet went into shock when they heard I was going to be on it, but it was great with Ronald Reagan. Anyway, so that's how I got to meet them originally. Now, they're up in Camp David, and for some crazy reason, she saw Beach Blanket Bingo, Barbara Bush, and in her own handwriting, wrote me a note. She said, Don, I saw one of the classics of all time. Beach Blanket Bingo. Frankie and Dee Dee. Hi, Frankie. Hello, Dee Dee. Stand up and get sick with you. You two 43-year-old yo-yo skipping around the house. Grow up. You're a man already, Frank. How long can you stand in the bathroom in front of the mirror? Go, Zabba, Zabba. <laughs> You're 43, Frank. You're old and wrinkled. Did you ever hear yourself sing, Frank? I'm telling you, scared trains. <laughs> You sing, Frank, you sing. I'll be my luck. You're old. Let me hear you say one note. Say, ah, uh, uh. wrong. You see what I mean? <laughs> That's what I mean. This kid cannot sing. <laughs> and I want you to know one other thing, Dee Dee. I never liked your personality. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're too short for this type of work. <laughs> so she saw one of these shows. So I said, I can get your beach blanket bingo. 
And she and my wife and I found a copy of Beach Blanket and sent it to the White House. And she wrote back, what a great classic. I am so moved. George, uh, George and I just love it. As a joke, she was putting me on, naturally, you know. <laughs> so we have that kind of conversation together. And she's been writing us ever since. And now I'm starting to rip up the letters because it's a little too much. <laughs> you know, how many times can I keep telling George is wonderful, you know. But it's you know, an interesting image. Colin Powell on the hotline. And Bush is in watching Beach Blanket Bingo. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, that is good. <laughs> Can we go on? <laughs> well, if, if you sit at a state dinner with, uh, with Ronald Reagan or George Bush, do they want to be insulted? Do they want you to do you for them? No. I've never got, except at the inaugural for Ronald Reagan, and I think, I think Ronald Reagan knew, knew me when he was governor, and I ribbed him at many roasts at the Friars, and so he knew pretty much. I think George Bush has always been a wonderful man, but I don't think he wanted Don Rickles to stand up and say, I'm getting fed up, George. I mean, he, uh, in fact, I was at a Bob Hope thing when he was running for president, and Bob Hope got up and said, Don, you'll come along, and at the end, you'll do a few minutes. Well, Bob Hope that night happened to go over. <laughs> so uh, he said, you don't, you don't have to get up. And I was all set. I, you know, little pus was coming out of her mouth. I was, no, I was ready for the poison to really give the president some shots, the, the future president. And he said, you, you don't have to get up. And I said, I'll just say a few words. And George Bush leaned over and said, don't, 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 get, don't get up. Hmm. You don't, don't, don't say nothing. They were so nervous that I was going to get up and say something wrong. Anyway, we became friends. And, uh, and then I, uh, uh, I saw the president at the, uh, as I said, at the dinner. And he was great. He walked by me and went, hello. Yeah, that was about it. Dan Quayle was the one that hung with me. He said, can we have a drink together? I said, don't beg. I hate that. <laughs> you know, so Dan Quayle and I walked around a little bit. But uh, the president was very nice. And Barbara Bush, they were a wonderful couple. Forgetting politics, they're, they're both very down-to-earth people. He really is a sincere man. I don't know why I'm saying this. I, I'm not going to run for governor, you know. I, <laughs> I got my own troubles, you know. Back after this. Oh, why? What does it feel like, even after you've had some success, when you hit that night where, for whatever reason, it isn't working and you think you're dying on stage? Is there any way to describe the loneliness and the desperation that you feel? Well, for me, I always kept going. It's the concentration. I always kept going like I was a hit. I used to say, they're wrong, I'm great. You know in your heart when you're not really making it. There's no question about that. But you'll let, never let an audience know. That's, that's the kiss of death. And I think in my entire career, I never let an audience, even in my, everything is relative, even when I made a hundred bucks a week and struggling in joints, I never let an audience know that I was falling on my you-know-what. And I think that's, that's good advice for any of us in any, in any business. That if, you, if you show them, hey, when the show was over, certainly I told my mother, rest her soul, because uh, she was a great influence on me, and I told her all my stories. and. Then later on, my wife, Barbara, we, we would discuss, you know, you know when you're not cutting, all of us know. But yeah, I, I always, always had the, the dignity for myself to, to never let the audience know that I was falling on my face. You mentioned your mother several times. And when she was living, you often referred to her in your act. You'd come out and say to Carson, I was talking to my mother after the last time I was mm -hmm. on. And this mm -hmm. was her take on, yeah. on my last appearance. Why do you think your relationship with your mother was so close? Well, I called her the Jewish Patton. <laughs> that was my fun name with her. And she, she really wanted me to be a different kind of performer. I, I, I have no, no excuse about that. It's, it's the truth. She wanted me to be, Alan King knows it. She said, why can't you be like Alan King? Or like you said, why do you have to insult people? Why couldn't you just come out and tell jokes? I said, Mom, I don't do that. But the great thing about her was that she was very supportive. I was a very terrified guy when I was a young man. I, I was, you know, I was uptight about a lot of things. And uh, she, she really worked on me and made me believe in what I did, even though she didn't sometimes think that was so funny. But she really believed in me, and she was uh, a strong woman. She wasn't the, the most perfect woman in the world, but for me, she did a lot. And uh, I, was, uh, I was almost like, well, my father died young, so I was almost like a second husband if that makes sense, to her. I was everything to her. She lived her life through me because she wanted to be an entertainer. And I think I performed and she saw herself as me. And, and uh, she wanted to be what I was. And doing so, she helped me to gain confidence. Would you hear from her that her contemporaries had said, oh, I saw your boy Donnie, and I know he's successful and he's very funny, but he is mean. Why did he say that? 
Oh, sure. She they wouldn't get, get it, you know? Oh, sure. She would, she would get that, sure. And she would always defend me. And then she would say quietly, you know, Rose was right. You didn't have to call that guy an old man. You didn't have to do that, you know. And then I'd say, well, the check is here, right, Mom? And she'd say, I don't like that kind of humor. She did that, see, because her gums would lock. <laughs> but uh, she was something else. It's the last of a breed, you know, and so... And the joke was, I, I got lucky. I married a woman that said, now remember, I'm not your mother, that's my wife. You know, she said, I'm not going to be your mother. I'm me. And she really has been herself in her own right. Because you've got to realize, when, you, when you're 38 years old and never married, and tight and living in the same apartment with your mother all those years, I mean, and a girl comes along, that's a tough, you know, that's a tough deal. All of a sudden, here he is. And I, so even into your late 30s, you were living at home with your yeah, mom? Yeah, yeah. And at that point, you were reasonably successful out there, Yeah, right? well, I was doing okay, yeah. I, I, I was, well, you know, when you travel on the road, you know, you met Laverne Laverne, you know, and you didn't want to marry her, you know, because she did card tricks. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you didn't exactly meet, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll make the pot roast here, you sit in the living room, you know. <laughs> she was dancing in the hall, nude. So, <laughs> so it wasn't easy, but I was fortunate to meet my barber, and she's, she, she's, we've been together, married happily 26 years. ...at the Golden Nugget in Vegas and at Bally's in Atlantic City. Now, before we go, Bruce Kornblatt, our producer, who evidently is, uh, is a Rickles expert. A devoted human being. Absolutely, but too shy. The Ayatollah Khomeini couldn't have people love me as much as this man. Bruce, I'm telling you from my heart, you should be in this chair. You're better than this man. You're dynamite, Bruce. You're the best living thing. And basically, your personality is weak. <laughs> Work on that, Bruce. Work on that. And see your dentist. The right tooth. Bad. Just, just say goodnight. I'm leaving the right. seat. I'm leaving the seat for Cornblatt. He's too shy, but I'm leaving it. Okay. The for Cornblatt, maybe Bob Newhart wants to be the host. He'll do anything to get work. <laughs> Thanks a million. Good night, folks. Wasn't that a dull half hour? I can't stand this man. This man's going nowhere. Look at him. All he left is a toy mic. Eleven-year-old <laughs> dummy got hot in this business. Go figure. And I got to kill myself at 64. But I still got it. The left side could be picked up a little bit. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom so bad. Is it over? I can't take it anymore. Costas, what a stiff. This man doesn't belong on the air. Oh, God. Now I got to go over and run after Johnny Carson's car. And Thanks very much, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the 92nd Street Y, where tonight we're going to introduce America's newest author, Mr. Don Rickles. And you're in for quite a night, too. Anyway, I've been a friend and a fan of Don's for, uh, we were trying to figure it out the other night, for probably 45 years. I lived in Los Angeles. I went out there in the 50s and lived there through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s before I came back to New York in 1983. And I must tell you, in those years, Los Angeles had the greatest collection of comedians living right there in the city. Many of them came from New York when the New York politicians foolishly let the television industry slip away to LA. Some of them came out of vaudeville, some had their own radio shows that we all remember, and then starred in their own early television situation comedies. But they were all there. And in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there seemed to be a major banquet every other month, honoring or roasting somebody in Beverly Hills. And this was their chance for all those comedians to stand up and show their stuff. These were routines they had worked on for a lifetime, polished to perfection, every line, every word, carefully put together. And these people were very, very competitive with one another. Their timing was impeccable. Their delivery flawless, and if you were in attendance and saw all this talent in one night in Los Angeles, you would never forget it. But when it was over, when they had to close the show, the only one they called on was Don Rickles, and he would come on like a hurricane, seize the night, seize everyone there. Uh, it was just, it wasn't a written act. I mean, it was a spontaneous combustion of comedy made up at that moment 
about who was there, what they had said, and what we had just seen. And he was so lightning quick, and he was fearless. He would say the most outrageous things to the biggest stars in show business, and they loved it. And the reason Don Rickles closed the show was simply because nobody else could follow him, and everyone knew it. Now, over the years, I've interviewed Don uh, many times. I'm going to show you some of those clips. Actually, it wasn't really an interview. It was, it was really just a meeting. I was the entertainment editor for Channel 7, Eyewitness News in Los Angeles. And if Don was appearing somewhere, I'd grab a camera crew and go to the event, really just to talk to him on camera and have some laughs. Like the time the Friars Club was having a lunch for the manager of the Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda. Take a look. I'm here for the Lipschitz wedding. <laughs> the Lipschitz wedding? No. <laughs> Tommy who? Tommy Lasorda. He's the manager of the Dodgers. He's wanted by the Italian people in Sicily. <laughs> this man is wanted. I know he's wanted. He was in a cave in Salerno with my uncle. Look at him smiling like it's a lock. He's got a personality like a bad dugout. What is your name, sir? <laughs> my name is Regis. <laughs> Regis? Do you wear a dress? Hello, Regis. Where's your earrings? <laughs> yes, just get out of the way. These... Why is this light on? What do you people want? <laughs> there you go. That's the Don Rickles that uh, I love. So how did this all happen to this quiet, somewhat shy kid from Queens? How did he go from the toughest nightclubs in New Jersey and, uh, and Brooklyn to the four shows a night in Las Vegas lounges to become the top comedian in show business, the one no one else could follow. Well, it's all in the book, the Rickles book. <laughs> and get ready, everybody, because here's the man himself, ladies and gentlemen, Don Rickles. Honored guests, <laughs> Rabbi Shulman, <laughs> Kanta Chayman, and Father Kanglin. Shalom, shalom. Thank you, Regis. I will join you in a moment. Uh, sure. I can't thank you enough for your wonderful words, which I really can't live up to. When you think of 81 years, how God has blessed me to come this far to get a chance at the Y. And everyone said, as uh, David Rosenthal of, of Simon & Schuster said, Don, this is where it is. These are the, these are the people that will buy the book. And I'm looking at the crowd. <laughs> this is a donation crowd. This is a donation. <laughs> but I'm here. My wife and I had a chance to be in Miami at Donald Trump's home to be Regis's help. <laughs> Regis goes there with joy every 20 minutes, and they have... And Trump comes in and says, take over everything. And I've been down there. But he's good friends with Donald Trump. Donald Trump I've worked for, too. But that has nothing to do with it tonight. We're not honoring Donald Trump. And we don't plan to honor Donald Trump. And I'm fed up talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> but it's nice to see in the front some of the elders wheezing and spitting up while I'm talking. <laughs> That's the crowd Regis gets. God bless him in the morning when I do the show, they're all going, Regis. <laughs> Regis and Kelly. <laughs> Who the hell with any brain gets up at dawn to see the two of them walk out and introduce Farlin Mifluman and whoever the hell. <laughs> but it's a great show, it really is. He's come a long way, Reg. I remember when we stood on the sunset on La Siena Boulevard. And yes. We mentioned Joey Bishop, and you yep. dropped your pants and had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, the, he was the Ed McMahon of the Joey Bishop show, and Joey used to say, hey, Regis, <laughs> don't worry. And he always advised us. Remember when I used to do the show? Yeah. Joey said, you know, Regis, you, you've got to come on a different way, a different attitude. And Rickles, <laughs> you've got to try to be funny. You've got to try to be humorous, funny. And now he's in Newport in a home. Anyway, uh, 
I just said that, and Reed just went. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joey's a good guy. We, we made fun of him. He kind of, kind of very tough with his own words, but yeah. he was a good guy. But I've come a, a long way because of you people. I miss, at a night like this, I, I think of an emotion time. I think of Johnny Carson, rest his soul, who was so magnificent for me in my days. <clears throat> God, I had such great times with that man. And he was pretty much of a loner, personally. And when you hung out with Johnny, it was a treat because he didn't like to be around a lot of people. But I was great. I used to be able to kid around with him and say most anything, you know. And he would always laugh, and that saved me because that's how I started his show in New York. I came out on the stage, and he said, Mr. Rickles, I'm Johnny Carson. I said, and I always used to pick that up. I used to say, Johnny Carson, when I had my own show for 20 minutes. Johnny Carson, he said, I know who I am. You don't have to keep introducing me. <laughs> and I laughed and he laughed and I never saw him again. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that's not true. Uh, he passed on and uh, he was missed. And a young man by the name of David Letterman has, has done a great job. Uh, he has a lot of qualities that I would think you and I would agree that Johnny had. Nothing to take away from Jay Leno or, or Jimmy Kimmel, they're all fine artists, but. Uh, David has that extra little quality that Johnny Carson had that I admire so much and I've had great success being on his show as well as with Jay, but really with, with Johnny was, uh, was a special time in my life. And of course, I, I'd be amiss in, in the book. I take a great deal of time to talk about a man that I, that, I, that I adored. He was tough. He was moody. He had all kinds of strange ways about him, but he was special to me and to my wife and my family. And his name was Frank Sinatra. As David said, uh, uh, very sweetly, he said, Don, why do you write so much about Frank? I said, because David, he was a part of my life that was so interesting. He gave me chances. Can you imagine a Jewish kid from Jackson Heights, Long Island? A guy that, and I don't want to, that's why I didn't write a book about that. You know, you think my book would be about, as, as a lot of people write books like, uh, um, started in the Lower East Side, my mother had cancer, and my father was a gangster, <laughs> my uncle was a drunk, and my aunt was a fag, and my brother was a wild <laughs> fighter pilot, whatever the hell, and it was so, who cares? Nobody cares about that. <laughs> in fact, I have relatives that say, we're not in the book. I said, why would they care if Lou Pearlman got a headache? They don't care. <laughs> so my book is, is David Ritz, God bless him, who helped me structure this. We did it with he would speak, I'd speak into a mic about six months or more, and we'd speak into a mic, and then he'd double space it and put it on his typing machine, and we'd go, away we'd go, and I'd leave space, and I would rewrite it in my own hand to get my own voice, and I hope that comes across. The stories about Sinatra and my great days with him. Some stories about Regis, and my opinion of Regis, who, who I cherish and love. And that's what, it, that's what it's all about. Uh, short little shots about my memories of life, but as I was going to say, the greatest treat, the greatest treat for me was the inaugural for Ronald Reagan. I mean, he was a man that I knew as governor of California, and I was at Rose and I made fun of him. And then I'm in Hawaii with my wife to make a short story, and the phone rings, and it's Frank Sinatra. And he got on and went, the summer wind. No, no. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he was pushing an album at that time. <laughs> I can say that now because he's dead. Anyway. Because if he's not, and he heard this, I'd be up here like saying, walk on, walk on. <laughs> I see I'm going too fast. <laughs> so Ronald Reagan, there I was, the phone rings, and Frank says, get dressed, get Barbara, get your stuff together, get to Washington, you're going to be on the show, and we're going to, Ronald Reagan's second inauguration. I said, Frank, you've got to be kidding. No time for kidding, I'm telling you. And as it happened, the cabinet said, you mean you want Rickles on a show for the President of the United States? And Frank said, absolutely. He said, well, what's he going to say? He said, I don't care what he says. He's, he's whatever he wants. And that's the God's truth. They said, well, you can't do that. He said, if you can't do that, if I can't do that, you can't have me then. That's it. Rickles and me, otherwise forget it. And sure enough, they said, okay, Frank. And I got up and made fun, and it was very successful. I told Reagan never to take a nap when I talk. And, uh, <laughs> And cabinet did what you people did. <laughs> but it was a great night for me. And from then on, we became great pals. He was, 
He was something else, and he, he'll be missed. And the younger generation will hear his voice on records. For my book, if you buy it, I'm very grateful. My wife has jewelry, and my kids want to go to college. <laughs> my grandchildren, my kids are grown. I, my daughter went to USC and, and studied uh, tennis. <laughs> anyway, uh, she talks like her mother. Dad, my, listen, my backhand was weak, was weak. I make fun of her because she married a rich guy and took her off my back. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I will now uh, join my dear friend Regis and we'll chat and, and I thank you with the people of Hawaii for having me and, and I thank my dear friend once again for just taking time out from his busy schedule. He's, his wife Joy is at home now. The cook died and she's trying to make a meal. <laughs> so thank you and we'll go on. Thank you so much. Well, well, you me. covered everything I was going to talk about, so I guess... Uh, well, something. we can wrap it up. Get a sandwich and let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Don, uh, I met you while you were doing your business as a comedian, and in the book you talk about the early days of your life in, uh, in Queens mm -hmm. and the fact that you were somewhat shy. Mm -hmm. Were you really? Well, as I say, Reg, I, I don't know if I said it in the book, but I, I said, I think even including you, if I take that opportunity to say... I think all of us as actors in our beginnings were shy. I think that's what made us actors. I mean, I always, I used to hide behind. See, my mother was a very aggressive woman, mm -hmm. American born and yeah. very bright, but she was the type of woman that if you went to Radio City Music Hall and there was a line, she said, there's a line <laughs> and we will go in the front. <laughs> and I was sucking on her ankle going, don't, Ma, don't. <laughs> It's called exaggeration, but she had, <laughs> she had great aggressiveness and sure. great self-esteem. Yes. And she would go to the manager and say, my son is going to be an actor, my sonny boy, actually, said, going to be an actor and we'd like to have our seating. We've been waiting for hours. <laughs> and the manager was with those little nerds going, you, you, you got it, Mrs. Rickles, you got it. And we watched the, the movie. So that's the way that, but she was, all in, she was on your side all the way. And you know, I, I have a confession to make. I don't think, Reg, that she ever got me. She laughed and supported me. She was like, bravo. And she'd say quietly, why can't you be like Alan King? <laughs> yeah, I'd say, I mean, Ma, why? Because she, she was worried about my picking on people yeah. and making fun of life, you know. Right. But in the early days, you, you tried acting first at the Actors Studio, right? Right here in New York? Well, it wasn't the Actors Studio. It was what too was big it? for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, okay, which I graduated go. from. And, I'm very proud of that, mm -hmm. I really am. <coughs> and the audience is too. And you became friends? Sounds like a Bob Newhart turnout. <laughs> and you became friends with, you know, people like Jason Robards, yes. terrific actor. Yes, he was. We, he loved your mother too, didn't he? Yeah, he used to come to the house and my mother made, made great chopped liver. And you don't have to be Jewish to have chopped liver. It's the kind of chopped liver that we just, you would have loved yeah. because you did that on your show the other day. It's like that you go, <laughs> Do a lot of that with my mother's chopped liver. You go to bed in the middle of the night and go, Mo. <laughs> But you loved it when you had it. Yeah. So Jason used to come, Tom Poston, who we just lost, Tom, yeah. rest his soul. Yeah. So I hung out with them and Conrad Bain and uh, gee, there was, there was so many women. Grace Kelly was in the class. I, wow. I never got near her. I just would smell her cologne by the locker. Uh -huh. We used to hang out in the Carnegie Bar, because in those days in, in the acting, you had to be a tree or a lamp or a bird. <laughs> or, and I used to say to Jason, I'm a bird. <laughs> and we'd have 12 vodkas. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Did you take it seriously? No, I drank the vodka to forget about it. <laughs> of course, it, but it, it taught me a basic background. We did plays. We had great directors, and mm -hmm. they always heard that I ate up the scenery because I was like, you know, I come from the nightclubs. It was like, you, sir, you know. <laughs> they'd say, all right, this will be a scene. You say you love the girl. I love you, Shirley. <laughs> I said, take it easy. <laughs> take it easy, you know. But he said, never lose that energy, and that energy has carried me. But I love the stories in the book about, you know, your, your career. Uh, and the first movie you made was with Clark Gable yeah. and Burt Lancaster. Is that something? The, the, the uh, submarine movie, right? Right, right. 
And, and of course, for years we've chuckled about uh, the line that uh, Clark Gable said when uh, there was a, yeah. something uh, on the horizon yeah. to think well, towards him. It, it, can you imagine, as, as Regis were up, it, I tell it in the book, but yeah, I'm telling it now in person. Here I am, I've never done a movie in my life, and all of a sudden, uh, the director, uh, oh my God, it slipped my, my mind, one of the great, he just passed away. Anyway, I'll get his memory in a minute. <laughs> Dig him up. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, what's his name? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, we had this movie, and he's decided we've got to have Rickles in this picture. For no reason, just like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a sailor, and I said he'd be great for the part. And actually, there was a, there was a, a few agents at the time that, that helped out wow. and, uh, to get me this part. And I came on and said, but I had to read for it. And I never read for anything. And there was a work light, look, as, as Regis and I know, you people in our business, a light they put in the middle of the stage, and it's pitch dark out there. And I said to them, I said, uh, is, uh, uh, you want me to read this about, uh, just, Mr. Rickles, just read the part where Mr. Gable answers you on the ship about the torpedo. I said, is, is, is Mr. Gable out there? <laughs> no, 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 there's no Gable. <laughs> the, 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 oh, oh. You, you, you sure there's no Clark Gable out there? <laughs> no Clark Gable, don't worry about it. All right, quiet. And I pick up the script and I go, the sailors are ready, the gun's in trouble, and the, the men are on deck. Should we fire, fire, fire? And a voice from the darkness comes, I say it, take it down, fire, fire, fire. And I went, ha, 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 ha. He was there. Yeah. Oh. Ha, 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 ha. And the director said, snap out of it, you're getting a fit. <laughs> How'd and you get along with him? He was great. Yeah. Bert was a lovely man too. Mm -hmm. Bert was serious, and Clark was, you know, came from the oil wells of Alabama. You know, and he was, did he really? Yeah, and he liked to drink a little scotch. And uh -huh. I loved that. You know. Yeah. I was with Jack Warden, also a very famous actor who was in the film and a great friend, and he passed away just recently. You know, everything I think about, it, everybody's dead. It's only you and me. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Just to sidetrack, my son, as Regis knows, uh, he's been at my home, up in my in my dressing room. There's a bunch of pictures. So my son comes upstairs and with his friends and says, you want to see my dad's pictures? And he goes, dead, 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 critical, cancer, dead, hanging on the ropes, fading out, died. And it's on my wall. I'm the, and I keep checking myself. I go like that. And now Regis, thank God, had a heart job and he looks great. Thank you. Oh, gosh. So, Don, but I mean, you know, I just told everybody about what it was like in Beverly Hills when they had one of those banquets and you would close the show. All of these guys got up and did the material that they were known for, that they worked on all their lives. But when you got up, it was just like spontaneous combustion is what I call it, and you just went out. When did that start, and how did it start? Well, it's a hard thing to say, but uh, I tell you, it started primarily at, at, the, at the parties. You know, I, I'd get up and... Uh, They'd have everybody speak, you know, wishing somebody luck. And I'd get up and go, I'm fed up with this party. I don't need it. The food is lousy. I never told jokes to this day. You know, I said, I'm annoyed with the host. And to make sure the guy on the left doesn't use a deodorant and it's really getting to me, you know. And, and they would laugh and ha, 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 ha. And it started out as a little joke. And little by little, they started to say, and, get and Rickles. And all of a sudden, a guy, uh, when we did, uh, when we did the, the Dean Martin roast, yeah. uh, they, they called me and said, listen, Don, we'd like you to be on it. And to make a long story short, I, everybody else had prepared material, which is very right, and I never could prepare material. Mm -hmm. I just listened to what everybody said, right. got up, and then bang, 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 and said what I want, you know. Sure. I, you know, I was the first one to say to Frank Sinatra, I heard you sing, Frank, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and he did what you did, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Had he not, this leg wouldn't be working. <laughs> uh, well... It's, <laughs> Frank was, um, you know, but uh, in the later years, Don, you became a big monumental success in the business, and, and you always, it was your show. But in the 90s, Frank asked you, in, in his final tour days, right. to be with him. That was great. And so you opened for Frank. Yes, I did. I saw you here at the Radio City Music Hall, remember? That was a treat. Radio City, stood with my mother on 57th Street. She said, look at that Don Rickles and Frank Sinatra. And by the way, Frank never got over that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to do, you know, Laughter for Love and those songs. Yeah, sure. And he'd be in the wings going, why is he singing? <laughs> I hired this bum and now he's singing. <laughs> but it was great too. The last two years of his working life, it was, we traveled. But he had a temper, didn't he? 
Well, yeah, he, he had his moments. Yeah, but never with you, was it? No, no, once he twisted my arm, no. <laughs> no, he was, I was blessed. Uh, you know, I, I would make fun of him, but he had a certain compassion for me that I, I cherish. Uh, uh, and gentleman, that the gentleman's right, road manager now knows he used to be with Frank himself, Tony Obedesano, mm -hmm. and Tony traveled with him, and then Tony used to be with us. When, and Jilly Rizzo, remember Jilly's? Sure. Jilly's in New York was a little tiny restaurant uh, uh, on Broadway, and we all used to go after work and hang out there, and Frank was, was there. What was Jilly like? Jilly was like a guy with one eye trying to see where the road was. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, uh, he, Jilly was a warm, passionate guy, but when anybody touched Frank Sooty, he went, don't do that! <laughs> and then the guy walked in and says, I have swollen wrist, I got a swollen wrist. <laughs> no, he was Frank's protector and, and yeah. brother, and Frank loved they him. They were very close, yeah. sure. Well, so, uh, so Don, your, your days as, as a comedian began in, in Las Vegas, in those lounges in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm, tough. And uh, you worked the shift that began after midnight. I started at midnight. I followed the great Louis Prima with yeah. Jilly Smith, and they right. were magnificent. Yes, yes. This is in the Sahara Lounge, yes, right? Sahara yeah. Lounge. And, and he um, had two shows, yeah, and then you would come that's on. That's right. And it, at that time, uh, reach, everything would clear out. There wasn't mm -hmm. a soul there. Yeah. And I walk out with three guys, a piano player and a bass player, and just playing doom, 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 doom. <laughs> And I'd come out and go, sir, your nose looks ridiculous. Your, your wife, is that your wife? Ooh. And I would do, see, that's the A stuff when you see me for big money. <laughs> this is just like a Jewish rehearsal. <laughs> and I know there are non-Jews here, but you'll get over it. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I always kid about the Jews because I'm not. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, see, you, you can't tell without the armband. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> hey, there's no voting. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, as I said, uh, it, it started in a lounge, and nobody was there. And I started to build up a reputation just by standing out there with the seat of my pants and talk to the audience. I never mean-spirited. I never regret anything I've ever said, because I never was out to hurt anybody. I was out to make them laugh. And if I laughed, I thought it was funny. And if I thought it was funny, hopefully they thought it was funny. And God has blessed me. They, you've gone, come a long way uh, with me, and I've been proud of that. But I used to stand out there at 2, 4, and 5 in the morning. Yeah. And, and, and do a show over a bar. There was a, just a pit, like, here, here, here we are. Right in front of me is a bartender serving drinks and mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. And food. God, when I think about it. And people they? sat at the bar. Sat at the bar. Yeah. And I would make fun of what they're eating. So, and so if forth. the guy came into the cowboy hat, he yeah, was Yeah, I would do game. 10 minutes on the cowboy hat and why he was sitting there, you yeah. know. And that... And then I used to run out in the casino. That was, that was my big thing. Run out into the casino. Everybody's going, shooting a nine, five, five, five. And I run and go, hold it! Hold it! I want it stopped right now. Hold it! My hand to God, and the whole casino went, I don't want any gambling. It's not right, and I want it stopped. I'm doing a show in there, and you pay attention, or I walk. You understand me? And I walk back on the stage, and the owner said, what is he doing? <laughs> True. And, but that's how you built your following. Yeah. Uh, uh, the and then it helped when Frank would come and see you, right? Yes. The whole to... Rat Pack, Dean right. and Sammy, they'd and, all come. And they'd all do tricks. And I, and I read something. It wasn't in your book, but I read something about uh, one of Frank's uh, visits to your, to your club. And uh, he would get up after a while, 45 minutes, and he'd say, okay, that's it. Let's go home. While you were still working. Absolutely. He did that one night. You said to him, sit down and shut up. I had to hear your singing. <laughs> you, you were. Well, I, mean, I didn't use the word shut up, Ridge. That's why I'm famous and you're hanging on the ropes. <laughs> no, actually, what I said, I said, Frank, I listen to you sing, huh? Be a man, sit down. <laughs> there's a way, you know, there's a way. I, I was never unkind, but as you said, the biggest thing in the history of me, as you know, is when Florida, when I first met him, he came in right. with a bunch of his guys, and all those guys used to sit with him going, Oh, a show, a show. Uh, uh. They were choking from gunpowder. A <laughs> uh, show, Frankie, show. <laughs> and I said, Frank, stand up, be yourself, hit somebody. <laughs> and the audience did with you, did. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I got a big laugh, and we became friends. Let's go over a few uh, of these celebrities. Now, what was it like to work with Bob Hope? <laughs> You know him? <laughs> because he was a perfectionist, Bob, and he wanted everything scripted, and he wanted a certain you know, delivery. <laughs> it's a funny story in the book that is just so Bob Hope. He, yeah. 
he, what happens is Bob Hope was a perfect, like Milton Berle, same thing. Same thing, From yeah. the old school, the old school. In those days, they were from the old school. I had to say, I'm from the old school. But every time I worked with Bob Hope, he, he liked me, but he was a very strict man when it yeah. came to his work. And I liked to kid around. And they had what they call a dress rehearsal with an audience. And they had it all on cards. You used to read the cards. And when I, and I had, I did the, the big one was with George Foreman at the time and, and uh, uh, Rocky Graziano and uh, all the fighters, you know, and, and some football, uh, Alex Grasso and football players that were, you know, popular then. And it, it was a sports and a locker room scene. Uh -huh. So, you know, I read the lines, uh, Charlie, the helmet don't look good. And Bob Hope said, that's so funny. Jesus. And I thought it was boring. I'd say, the helmet don't look good and your head is swelling and you look like a moron. That's what you look like. And I used to embellish, you know. You're that lip, sure. And the audience would start to laugh. Now, dissolve. Now we go in his office and he says, Don, uh, you know I love you, but let's, let's go over the script now. Now you walk out. What are you going to do? I'm going to say, hi, Bob. Is that, is that the way you're going to say it? Well, yeah, Bob, what, what, what's wrong? <laughs> like, and the writers were all sit there, and they'd yeah. all do what you did. <laughs> you know, this is before I even said anything. <laughs> they were like guys with sticks on their ass, those dolls, you know? <laughs> and, oh, I used ass, and this is the Y. <laughs> Cancel a minion. <laughs> and so, so they would all sit there, and, and I'd say, he said, try it again. Hi, Bob, how are you? <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. You, you, ask the writers. It's wrong, kid, it's wrong. <laughs> Ten times in an office. Hey, Bob, hey, Bob, wrong, wrong. <laughs> That's the way he was. He, he wanted it just a, a certain sound. Uh -huh. But he was a good man, and he, he but, always made it a little difficult. But he him. was a good friend. Didn't you go to England with him and meet the, all the royalty? That's right, Princess Margaret. Yes, one of the... They had a show, uh, uh, Bob Hope, uh, Newhart, my good friend, and I, and, uh, and Tully Savalas, and Roger Moore, and they had a, Jack Hawkins, the, the great British actor, and had Princess Margaret there. Right. And Bob Hope gets up and make a long story short, and he introduces Bob Newhart, and he does great. And he introduces Tully, and he does some shtick, and it was great. And again, I'm the last guy. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm saying to the guy, could I have a, a vodka, please? <laughs> and in, in England, the vodka is to hear. <laughs> I said, that's okay if you have a sty. <laughs> But you, but you so, talk to the but, queen. So, so, they all do it. Bob Hope introduces me, right? Yeah. Bob Hope goes, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, that's weird, that was his hook line. I want to tell you, we have a kid here from the United States, fine young comedian, he's a wonderful kid, he's a fine guy. He's going to make fun of you, but it's only a joke. So, <laughs> your majesty, your ma'am, please don't worry, it's just in fun, and I think you're going to enjoy him. Everybody here, and it's all royalty there, and everybody here is going to enjoy him, and he's going to make fun of the queen, but it's only a joke, he's a fine guy. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't mean really any harm. Worried. Yeah, he was serious. It, it yeah. doesn't mean any harm. So what do you say we give him a hand when he comes out? But it's a joke, and remember <laughs> that he's trying to be nice. And I said to the guy, give me a triple vodka. For <laughs> and I went out, and I went, and I made fun of Princess Margaret, and made fun of the queen in, in my good taste, and I, I felt it was, and everybody laughed, and it was great. And the show was over, and I sat down, and a, a guy in white gloves comes over. He says, ah, a man would like to see you. So my wife, naturally, she starts to get up, and Bob Hope says, I'll go with him. He said, no, no, just wants to see Mr. Rickles. So Newhart whispers, I'll go to the hotel and get the luggage. <laughs> <coughs> Sit down, Princess Margaret, Jack Hawkins, Anthony Quayle, they were her escorts. Mm -hmm. And she has like a dossier in front of her. And her opening remark is to me, Sit down, all well, their secret Scotland Yard is standing around. And everybody says, oh, watch this, what's going to happen? Because I made fun of everybody. And she said, are you a Jew? And I went, oh, jeez, oh. <laughs> and Jack Hawkins immediately reached, leaned over and said, Dawn, it's only a hard dossier. She's not anti-Semitic, it's nothing like that. I said, oh, oh, oh. And she wasn't, she really wasn't. But that's very abrupt. She had it on the paper, the Jewish. She said, you know, I know so much about you. She said, you're very quick. I didn't get it over, but you were funny and quick. She said, may I tell you, she said, you'll talk about your mother. Your mother, your mother lives in Miami Beach, am I, am I correct? I said, yes, but your mother's, at the time my mother was, your mother's 83. I said, yes. She said, my mom is 83. She's talking about the Queen of England. <laughs> I said, yes, she said, 
Oh, isn't that wonderful? Both 83. <laughs> she said, you know, I understand your mom has a condominium in Miami. I said, yeah, she said, my mom has an apartment right down the street, sort of a condominium. <laughs> Talking about the palace. <laughs> She said, so you see, they both have emphysema. Poor things, they both had emphysema. Yeah. Emphysema bad. She said, yes, both emphysema. So alike, Don. Isn't that wonderful? I said, ma'am, there's one difference. She said, what's that? I said, your mother has a flag on the roof. <laughs> oh, God. Such great stories. You know, Don, I showed a, a little clip I'm showing people a clip of the interviews and the things that we did uh, years ago out in Los Angeles. Yes, we had fun. I just take a crew just to be with you and, and get some laughs. And uh, so it, this is um, this takes place in the Palladium in Hollywood. Oh. Paul Anka had a TV special. You were a guest on the show, and uh, you walked by and uh, interrupted my interview with Paul Anka. Take a look at this. Please see, thank you. I guess so. Yeah. How do you feel about this uh, special you're doing? Well, this special is very special. We got a lot of dear friends on, got some good buddies. Uh, it's a good moment for me because ABC and I have been for such a long time. <laughs> you better let me say hello to you in a minute. Come over, over here. Come over here. Come over here. How are you, Paul? There's a basket case landing four lines. Yes, can I help you? <laughs> I'm talking to Mr. Hanker. We don't, don't need any strangers from Ralph's Market, <laughs> if you don't mind, sir. <laughs> they are looking for some derelict. He seems been sitting in an alley with a brown bag and a bucket of wine. Just stop it. Go away. Is he singing? Is this I'm not telling way? you anything. Why did I wear this outfit today? Why did I wear this outfit today? You want to get yourself a tree and become a... <laughs> which you That's can't even use, but you're a definite parakeet in that <laughs> trick-or-treat outfit, making a fool of yourself. Paul, it's good to see you. Right, God bless you, really. And good luck. He has a great show. Some great big stars are in there. You're and, included? Pardon me? Absolutely. You're included? No, no, I'm on a tour. <laughs> I'm in downtown L.A. on a tour, and the bus got stalled here, and that's why I came by the Palladium. I'm waiting for Lawrence Welk to suck bubbles for a half hour. <laughs> Dumbbell, why am I here? Go away, Regis. <laughs> that's why you'll never be a star. You got some sort of wheezing disease. <laughs> Paul, God bless. Take care. Oh, Long live Lebanon. <laughs> uh, and then there was the evening that uh, Don uh, attended a party at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. This was to uh, salute all the Los Angeles people who would come to the Sahara to see you perform. <laughs> and we had, a, we had an experience there. <laughs> Who are all your friends here tonight? And what is this party all about? I have no idea. I'm with the chef's union. <laughs> this man here, this is a Chicano, and I'm helping him out. They plan a strike, and I'm going to lead the march. And we're going down to Parker Center for a few laughs. Isn't that nice? That's great. <laughs> Hello, Mom. <laughs> ABC News doesn't go to Torrance or anyplace else, does it? No, no, just stays in town. We stay right in town here. Good. Tell me about your summer plans this summer. You and Newhart going away? Yeah, we're annual... going to go down to the beach and attack a lifeguard. <laughs> Actually, we're going to go to Paris, but you wouldn't know too much about that. It's too long a bus ride. Yeah, but this you. guy wants some food. Pardon me. I hate an old guy that's hungry. I hate that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now you look terrific. Irving Berlin. Anyway, uh, good to see you, Irv. Love your tunes. But uh, this is the uh, biggest Sahara affair tonight. You know, yeah. the, all the people that are <laughs> going to spend their money at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, and I'm here to, with Bert Condon. Who's this guy hanging over your shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, Isn't that the real oh, You remember him. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the Hulk. <laughs> anyway, uh, works on a barge out of Detroit. I don't know who he is. But uh, Newhart and I are going away right after this affair. No, like shortly it. we're going away to, uh -huh. to Europe, this Paris. Going to Europe, and then and we're going, going to, to Marbella, Spain, and so forth. Good for you. You're becoming world travel, isn't it? Spit all over me, Regis. I love that. <laughs> How is your show doing? I don't see it. It's on too early. I understand you're putting it on at 5 in the morning now. No, no. Before it's on at night. It's the top rated show in town. <laughs> really? You're so humble. I love an Irish guy that's humble. <laughs> but I want to know why this party's being held. Is the Sahara getting nervous? No, 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 no. See, the, the, the people of the Sahara get lonely, see? So they throw these big parties in town to get the feel of a crowd. <laughs> see, it's a very big hotel. You know about it. You well, read it in all the papers. Why are you here? I see a billboard full of Buddy Hackett, Johnny Carson, Eddie Arnold. Why are they here. <laughs> they weren't invited. <laughs> Never at a loss for words or, or for a funny line. You ever think about moving back to New York? I have to hang out with you? <laughs> One I, time. I, I, I tell you, oh, go ahead. No, but years ago, but maybe 20 years ago, you did come back to New York and you and Barbara walked in to see the Trump Tower. Mm. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and Donald Trump came out and this was the first time Look, you saw him. I remember him. that. And this was, you know, 20, 22 years ago. Yeah. 
And uh, you told me a funny story. In, uh, about he, he took us, we were, we were curious. We went to see an apartment. I said, Donald, went to see an apartment. And he took us into an apartment. The kitchen was about as big as that box. <laughs> the living room with these two chairs. <laughs> the bathroom was like on an airplane. You pulled the ledger. He says, Don, look at the view. Look at this bay window. Two billion seven. <laughs> Two billion seven, and that's for you. That's for you. <laughs> but then he looks... said, you got to do what Paul Anker did. You break through a whole wall, you go all the way across with a bay window, seven billion nine. <laughs> it's a bargain. Oh, gosh. But we never came back. <laughs> and how did you meet your lovely wife, Barbara? She was a hooker for the FBI. Ah. Oh. <laughs> okay. She had a good job. Yeah. yeah. No, God bless her, I always make fun of her, but why not? It pays the rent, you know. <laughs> no, she's a great lady. I met a, a Jack Gilardi at the time, a fine agent, who's still an agent sure. at ICM. He, he was, uh, had Barbara as his secretary. And Barbara was with him for six years, and before I met her and took her away from all of that, uh, she, she was a very, very astute, wonderful girl with mm -hmm. a, a great deal of warmth and charm, but a layback lady. Uh -huh. And I was the, you know, the hello, how are you? And she was going, <laughs> Stop it, pull yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> so did you pursue her? Well, the way it happened was I came to see Jack Gelati one day and she was at the desk, my first meeting with her. And I, this is God's truth. And she said, and I, and I, I do her voice sometimes. And I said, I'd like to see Mr. Gelati. And she said, what is that in regard to? <laughs> I said, I'm a butcher and I have a <laughs> truck outside. And she said, being a wise guy <laughs> will not get you in to see Mr. Jalal. <laughs> Please, I want to see him. Just control yourself. <laughs> and Bob buzzed and went in. That shocked me because she came on so back off. And then I was in the lounge, fast forward, and she was with some friends and standing behind a rope. In those days, I was really hot in the lounge. And yeah. she said, hi, Donna. It's me, Barbara. Oh. Can you get me a table? I said, See the head made a deep. <laughs> <laughs> and then I always had a thing for singers in those days. If the girl sang and you were on the road, they go, Swan, ooh! Anyway, <laughs> so I was always with singers. And uh, my mind was pretty well occupied because when you're on the road, you're lonely. But I kept calling Barbara. Oh. Right on the phone, calling mm -hmm. Barbara. She said, what is it you want? I said, just a date. <laughs> and the first date we went out and I pulled up the car and I said, Barbara, come on, sweetheart, here's the car. And, she said, and I had the motor going and she didn't get in. I said, why didn't you get in? There's a thing called opening the door. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of a Jew torture. <laughs> but I love her sure. to this very day. We're She's, married 42 years. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific woman. Oh, God. Now, why don't we reminisce a little bit about the people you met in the business, some of them mentioned in the book. But Ed Sullivan, did you ever do the Ed Sullivan show? Once. You did? And we were good friends. Yeah. And I did it up in uh, Lillian Lewis's home. Uh, Mo Lewis, her husband, rest his soul, was a big promoter and friends of Ed and ours. And mm -hmm. we all stayed, we all had a party at her house. And, and Ed was there. And, and they, his son-in-law always said, you know, but Ed wants you on the show. He said, I want Rickles on the show. I think he's a funny kid, funny guy. And I say, Ed, I, I don't do stand-up. I don't come out and one and tell jokes. But it's not for me. You can do something, damn it. Be a hell of a night. Hell of a night. So his son-in-law said, I got an idea. Don, you come out, and in between each act, you'll put down the act and say, Ed, he, you don't need the act. Ed will laugh, and then you'll run off. In, in Las Vegas, the monkeys come out, the Barzini monkeys. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Barzini monkeys are going to come out here on this stage, and I run out. Ed, Ed, what are you doing out here? Ed, you don't need the monkeys. The monkeys are lousy. They're going to louse up the stage. They're going to be dirty. You're going to have to put paper down. Get rid of the monkeys. The monkeys smell. Bum, bum, bum. You smell. <laughs> Why are you out here? Anybody ask you to make fun of the monkeys? And I ran off and I said, Bob, oh, the guy's going to kill me with this. And every time I ran out, he said, Who the hell sent you out here again? Show's over, we go back to Lillian's house, we're having a drink. I'm in the other room with my wife going, oh, my career's over, I'm moving. <laughs> Ed walks in and says, what did I, you killed him. You were special. You son of a bitch, you really knocked him right on their ass. And then he said, we were very good. Yeah, like yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did it, kid, we did it. <laughs> we did it. 
buried me, buried me. But not, not meaningful. He didn't even realize it. He, he didn't, you know. He used to go to Danny's Hideaways in those days, you know. Yeah. And he'd say to me, is this a great night? I mean, we didn't have anything. We just <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> what a night. This is a great night. Tell me about Jack Benny. All the comedians loved Jack Benny. Yeah, he was, a, he was what he was. The way he performed, he was that kind of guy. Wasn't cheap, though. Certainly wasn't cheap. Yeah. But he created that great image. Right. And uh, my experiences in the book, uh, he, uh, George Burns told him about me. He said, you know, Jack, Jack, you, you got to see this kid. And, 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 and you'll love him. He, make, he makes fun of everybody. And, and, and you're going to think it's bad, but it's not bad. I'm telling you. I know the kid, and you're going to love him. You know, George, I don't need it. I don't need a guy making fun of me. Forget about it. No, you don't have to applaud it. 30 years ago, I needed you for that. You know. 50 years. Anyway, you know, I don't need the kid. Anyway, make a long story. Benny, uh, George convinced Benny to come see Now well, I come out on the stage, and I'm really uptight. Jack Benny, Jack geez, I want to do yeah. good. I do the show, and God, it was, good. it was a good show. It really was. Show's over. Uh, my stage manager comes and says, Mr. Rickles, Jack would like to see you. I said, oh, great, great. B please bring him up. I came up in the dressing room. And I'm sitting there in, in the bathroom, and I'm still like a little perspiring towel. I'd say, gee, gee, Jack, it's so nice of you to come to the show. I hope you enjoy it. And he just went like, you know, kid, <laughs> I've seen a lot of guys. George told me you insult people. You see. And I'm the first one that it's not my cup of tea. You know, tonight, watching you was a big kick for me. You really, really came through, kid. And God bless you. And I enjoy it. How about dinner? And I said, thank you, Jack. I said, Barbara, he enjoyed it. Barbara said, stop it, stop it. Just that casual. Okay. <laughs> And you we go to dinner. Yeah. And in those days, in, the, in the, the room, the restaurant, they had the flaming carts, you know, and the, and the violins, you know. That's how I used to get broads. <laughs> <laughs> the flaming carts. Sure. And all you know, Barbara and I sit down. <clears throat> and Barbara says, I'll have the, the uh, vodka martini with the olive of them, and I'll have a, another vodka of them. Jack, what do you have? I'll have a diet Pepsi. <laughs> okay. So next thing comes. Flaming thing. I said, I'll have the veal, Jean Baton, blah, 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 with the flaming sauce. And Don, what are you going to have? <clears throat> so I'll have the, the lamb chops with the lambana and the mayonnaise and the boom on the side with the boom and the salad. Jack, what are you going to have? I'll have two poached eggs <laughs> on toast and a hot cup of tea. <laughs> oh, he's great. That was my dinner. Just wonderful. Um, you talked about Johnny Carson, and remember the time that I picked you up and, uh, and then two of you wound up in the tub? You didn't know that was going to happen, no. did you? No. They played that over the years, over, over and over, and over again. Over. Yeah. It was great, it was great. He came up with some great things. And, he really did, and that and, was a highlight thing with me. And then you were playing the CPO Sharky, mm -hmm. and I guess on the show, oh, you, God, <laughs> you broke his little cigarette box yeah, or something that like thing, that? Yeah, And he took umbrage and came right across well, the hall at NBC. Yeah. yeah, it was a joke. Did you know he was coming? No. Uh, in those days, you know, as you know today, you have the handheld cameras. Yeah. Those days, they had those big, giant things. They had to push wheel it. Push it all the way yeah. into the next yeah. studio. Yeah. And he came in, and that's, that's when the famous line came, and he made fun of me during the middle of a take, and blah, blah, blah. And then I said, Johnny Carson. He said, I know who I am. Stop <laughs> introducing me. <laughs> and that became his favorite thing. It was a classic. Well, Don, were you much of a ladies' man before you got married? <laughs> I mean, you were 38 when you got married. 38. You know, I had, I, my younger years, too, as I got older, that sort of eased off. But even later on at 38, I always had the reputation, you know, being the loudmouth guy that would snitch on him if we had made love or anything. Really? You know? Well, it wasn't me, but they always thought that, you know, don't go with Rickles, oh, the whole world will know what happened, you know. But, <laughs> and I always became a little shy about that. Oh. And everybody thought I was the most brazen kid in the world. Yeah. But thank God, God was good. He sent down my barber and saved See me. See that? Saved you. Yes, he did. Saved you. All right, uh, I'm going to show you how Don Rickles uh, attracts women. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised. I mean, they really come on to him. <laughs> And I was over there, it was the night they were honoring uh, Danny uh, Thomas, and it was a wild night, and the people, the crowd was wild, and this woman came up to you, 
and wanted a kiss. And it became a little bit of a classic. Take a look at this. Look at this, Ethan. Who are some of the giants here tonight? Uh, King Kong. <laughs> I'm about the biggest. You're the biggest name in the world. I looked room. around and they're all warm ups. But Frank is Kenny coming. Rogers is running around the lobby going, Gambling Man, Gambling. I said, Fine, Kenny, great. Great song. Great. And Ed Nelson is my idol. He's my trainer. What is it? Look at, oh, he's dusting you off. Daddy Simon asked me to kiss you. Yeah. <laughs> and this is just some weird woman. <laughs> anyway. Everybody wants, everybody wants to be with you. All right, lady, wait in the back. Wait in the car, lady. I'm sorry, lady, you can't touch you. Lady, what do you want what from do you Don want, Rick? Lady, give me a break. My career is hanging on the front here. Daddy Simon asked me to kiss you. Daddy All Lebanese were surrounded. All Lebanese. Warm up the car. It's all Lebanese. I don't have a chance. They got the wild eyes, don't they? Okay, God bless. Get the truck. Get the truck. Are you in the north? Wait a minute. There's one Lebanese girl. He took over. Wait a minute. There's one Lebanese girl who wants to give you a kiss. Hello, my darling. Will it be a donation? Shalom. Shalom. Uh, Regis, this turned out to be a special, Regis. It's a special. This lady still wants I don't know who this lady is. Put me on your time. Get her a newspaper stand, something. Go downtown Hollywood. I, I don't need this kind of bedlam. You know how Daddy feels. You know how Daddy feels at Hillcrest now, huh? I hope your camel dies. Leave me alone already. Sorry, Mr. Regis. I can't handle it anymore, Regis. Goodbye, Never call me again. Raise your camel. Go away, lady. Go away. See that? Oh, God. I just have one more tape to show everybody, but you know, one time I did a, a five-part mini-series, Don Rickles in Las Vegas. Mm. Flew over there with the camera crew, and we, and we, we did a five-parter, uh, an interview in Don's dressing room, and uh, on stage, and backstage, and, and all of that. And um, uh, we, we began the series with uh, this story about uh, the Don Rickles that not too many people know. Watch this. You know, there were really two Don Rickles. I should establish uh, this right now at the beginning of the series. On stage, on camera, he is the relentless attacker, the consummate wise guy. His act spares no one, no nationality, no religion, no race. No one is exempt, not even his wife. He takes no prisoners and he plays no favorites. But off stage, Rickles is warm and sentimental and loyal. Example, years ago here in Los Angeles, there was a small nightclub on La Cienega Boulevard called the Slate Brothers Club. Rickles made that his home base and the movie crowd flocked in. They loved him. The biggest crowds in Hollywood vied for his insults. But Rickles' career was at a standstill. He befriended the club bartender, a man named Harry, Harry Goines. And he promised his friend that if he ever got that break, he'd take him along with him. God only knows how many promises like this have been made in small clubs all over this country, but this one was kept. In 1958, Rickles saw some daylight. He called his friend Harry, told him to pack his bags, and together they ran for it. And through the years, through all the good times and all of the bad, they have been together. Now, of course, there are only good times. And at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas, Harry is there with us when Don Rickles walks in. Here he is now. What a night this is. Mr. Rickles, how are you? Oh, what a treat. You're here to see me? I can't believe it. Just when I want to get dressed, I have to have that annoying person like you in my room. I want to thank you, Harry. This is Harry, my dear friend. He's been with me a lot of years. He checks for grenades and everything. Check the room, there's no mines in here. Now, Harry's been with you how many years? Well, it'll be uh, almost 22. We met at the Slate Brothers. He was a bartender, and I was a comedian searching for women and in desperate heat. And this man used to calm me down by singing a spiritual by my, by my bed. But actually, you made uh, Harry a promise, right? That uh, I said if I make it big, I would uh, take him with me. And now, thank God, I've been successful, and I'm dumping him. <laughs> I, I don't need him anymore. <laughs> Oh, gosh. I just, I just want to say a quick word, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Regis, that was very sweet. Uh, Harry Goins is a man that was with me for 40 years. He was a bartender. <laughs> and I wish he was here tonight. He was a hell of a guy. Well, wonderful gentleman, yeah. Well, Don, now, uh, you know, I know that you all have questions for Don Rickles. I mean, he is here to... Uh, to entertain and, and to inform you and to tell you the answers to whatever your questions happen to be. What we need is a little light so Don can see you. And then if you, if you have a question, just kind of raise your hand. Let me know that you want to say something to Don. Don't be afraid. <laughs> we have security here. Yeah, there's a gentleman right over there. Why don't you stand up and yell out your question? Now, wait a minute, there are two guys. One at a, l let this guy go first, and then I'll get you. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> he was referring to, I used to do a, a, a joke about my wife and Geronimo, and I strapped myself to the bed, circled the bed, and, went, and I was Geronimo, and, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and she'd say, attack, Geronimo, attack. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's the next? Yes, sir. I don't have, uh, my career has never been involved with hecklers, and, and if I do, I would never talk about it, because early in my career, uh, maybe a few stood up, and now they have Blue Cross. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anyone else? Yes, yes, sir. Hey? <laughs> hey, Charlie! <laughs> Yeah, it was true. Buy the book. <laughs> that was a true story, and yes, it, it's in the book, and I uh, love the way you tell that story. It's a great, great Don Rickles story. You, yeah. Yes, anyone else? Yes, way over there, and that gets the wall. Yes, ma'am. You know, Thank you for asking that. No, you know, in my career, I have never, to my knowledge, and I'm sure there are certain performers and just people. See, my, my theory is when you stand on the stage, as Regis and I do, and I can't speak for Regis, but I'm sure he'll agree, when you're out there selling yourself, you can't please everybody. And I'm sure in my performances over the years, but nobody in particular, thank God, has made it a very uh, noticeable thing of dislike for me. But if they had, I'm sorry, but I do what I do, and I feel that all of us, when you sell yourself, as human beings, you can't win everybody. I try to, I try to. You know, but the celebrities were the ones who caught on to Don Rickles first. And uh, no kidding, they, they, he was a tremendous hit in Hollywood in this club. We were talking about the Slave Brothers Club. And it was people like Frank Sinatra who brought the crowds to, um, to Las Vegas. And, and Frank was one of the ones you would insult, and, and they all really, frankly, loved it. And I, the word reaches, you know, has made me successful. I always keep saying it's not insult, as Johnny Carson gave me that great title, which I use today, uh, Mr. Warmth, when they introduced yeah. me, uh, which is true, because uh, uh, the word insult always, was always something that, that was a lousy kind of guy, and I really don't do that, but I, it, people have known me with that title, so I've gone along with it over these years, and it's been successful for me, but I, I'm really not that person that insults somebody. I exaggerate and make fun of us, but it's not like an insult to me as somebody that's facetious and kind of mean, and I'm certainly not that. He really isn't, <laughs> so don't be afraid. Yes, sir, okay. right here. Would you stand up, sir? Uh, do you have a favorite uh, Dean Martin celebrity roast story? Do you have a favorite Dean Martin celebrity roast story? Oh, there's, there's so many stories about Dean, and I think that the book will tell it all. Not to cut you short on that, but we'd be here till Tuesday if I started in with Dean Martin. But one in particular, I remember Frank Sinatra at the inaugural for Ronald Reagan. We were in the dressing room, and Frank brought me up. I was in a small dressing room downstairs in, in the Kennedy Center, and Frank said, tell that bullet head to get his bags and get the Secret Service and get him up here. And sure enough, there I am with Dean, Frank, and Sammy, and all of us in this big dressing room. And Sammy went out someplace, and all the, all the guys were standing with the Uzis in the coats going, they were supposed to guard us. They're going, look at what Don's doing. Look what Frank's doing. You know, <laughs> if somebody wanted to shoot us, they'd be too busy watching us. <laughs> anyway, so we were there, and Frank said, now listen, guys, there's no drinking before the show. There's the President of the United States. It's a big night. I don't want any booze. Nobody tell you got it, Pally. <laughs> Rickles and I are gonna just sit here and wait till wait till you just go out there and do, do a little show. And, <laughs> there's gonna be no boozing, no boozing. You got it, Frank. You got it, baby. And Frank left, and sure enough, Dean walked out. He opened up his coat and it was like airplane bottles, like <laughs> <laughs> And he said to the president, boom. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. What, what did he say to you? Well, basically, he, he started talking about, uh, he brought up the Navy. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, he, he, he asked me, like, you know, were you in the Navy? I said, no, my father was in World War II. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, well, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Very nice. Way back there, yes. Speak up. I never get into politics, but I do think one thing. No matter who the president is, and there, I've known five, I do think that our people in this world today, when they talk about a president, whether they love him, God forbid, use the word hate, I hate the word hate, or dislike, fine. But I, I think the office should be respected, that people should not, <laughs> should not get vicious and nasty and say things. If you say, I don't like the man, or I don't approve, fine. But don't go and SOB and this and that, if the President of the United States, don't you think the guys in Europe and the other countries say, look at this, they make a, a putz out of our President. I mean, maybe, maybe some of us, and a good deal at this time, have problems, but still respect the office. That's my opinion. Okay. All right, ma'am. Might you stand up? <laughs> well, what I leave out is stories about my uncle Saul. You don't <laughs> you care if he smoked a cigar and yelled at my aunt Dora? Who cares? <laughs> so I wrote memoirs, little episodes in my career that I think are fun and some some are serious about my mother, and my father and things that I think would be your interest, and a, f a good read and a fast read, that you don't have to worry about chapter nine, what, what are we up to? And so that's my thought, and uh, as far as uh, you saw me at the Copa, I thank you, those were, those were great days. She wanted to know why, why are you writing the book now? We've talked about this over the years. Well, as David, you know, of uh, Simon & Schuster said to me, he came to see me with my manager, Elliot Weissman, and said, uh, listen, Don, you, why don't you write a book? I said, everybody has a book, you know. He said, no, because it's you. And I bought that, he said, you. Get, I want your voice in the book, and from the folks I talk to, say that my voice is in that book, and I, I hope you'll all agree. When you read the book, it, it is like Don talking to you. That's, that's the way the book is written. Yes, way back there. Yes, sir. Not at all. I just think, there, I think the star quality in those days was different, and the young people today are Time marches on, and I don't think they feel that kind of thing anymore. And uh, uh, they, they do have roasts, and some of them are pretty strong, but hey, if they still buy it, more power to them. But uh, the old days, I think, are gone, and, and now it's time to move on. You know, that's one thing, Don. You never really have used the four-letter words or anything even close to that in the act. No, no, never. No. Am I right or am I yeah, wrong? It's, it's true. It's, it's not something I planned. It's just in my personality. A son of a bitch, pardon my expression, is my big word in the act. That's about it. And I've never gone any further. And I never felt I had to go any further because it's not my style. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Blue shirt, yes? Hi. Hi. Um, so what is your opinion of stand-up comedy today as well as comedy in general? The uh, funny is funny. I, I, there's so many young people coming up and so many guys and, you know, like uh, Jerry Seinfeld is, is a gem in what he did. Uh, there's so many, I, I pick him out because he just recently came to see me in Atlantic City and he's a charming guy. And uh, the young people, if, if an audience laughs and some of them come on with some stuff that's pretty weird to me, but they laugh and I sit by the set and I laugh. So I guess as long as they laugh, they got it made. The fellow behind him, yes. Who? <laughs> Bob Newhart's book. Oh, that's a silly question. You know damn well that I enjoy Bob and he enjoys me. We're not in competition and I love what he says and, and I like to think he loves what I say. Wasn't, isn't that a strange friendship though? It's apples and oranges. Uh, we met because of our wives and I say that and Bob always kids me. There he goes again, it's key, the wives are key. And it's true, if the wives get along, in my opinion, the guys will always become good friends, most times. But and didn't Bob, 
Just go ahead. I'm no, sorry. and Bob's wife and, and, and Jen and my wife Barbara became sort of like sisters. They're very close. They talk to each other constantly about life and what have you. And Bob was completely different from me from the Midwest and very uptight about a lot of things. He, he was a very big Catholic when I first met him. Now he's practically a Jew. <laughs> 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 with, with my coaching. He still, he still, Reg, to this day, I swear to God, to this day, he can't say what you know. He goes, I say, Bob Lachayim. He goes, Lachayim. <laughs> and I say, that's a ranch in Mexico. <laughs> Didn't he worry when, when, say, you were on a cruise together and you were a little loud or obstreperous, you know, and he would say, please, don't, don't attract that. Well, that, that, I used to do that to put him on. Like in Germany, we're in Munich. Yeah. And I would walk into the restaurant and the waiter would come up and say, do you think we could have the salmon? <laughs> And Newhart would go, don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't start that. It's not funny. Don't do it. <laughs> then we walk down the street and I go, you know, Bob, my legs are bothering me, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know what, Tom, what time is it? Because uh, we... it's 12 o'clock. We got to go home. <laughs> Really? It's now quarter to nine. Quarter to nine. Okay. Yes, sir. White shirt, sure. Uh, I thought you were absolutely great. Oh, thank you. Oh, sure. But, you know, as time goes on, uh, it's hard to find parts uh, that are suited to... Uh, I'm 81 years old, and, you know, there's, uh, how many grandfathers can you play? But uh, hopefully, if before it's all over, if I get an opportunity, I would love to do that. And I thank you for Casino. I got the part, uh, Marty Scorsese, who is a great director and a lovely man, he happened to think of me, and I wasn't even in the original script. And he wrote in a part called Billy Sherbert. And I worked with De Niro, and that was great, because with Bob De Niro, who was a marvelous actor, but I came from, you know, I, you know, kidding around a lot. I said, Bob's very serious. Don't kid around. You know, he's very serious. <laughs> so the first day we're on the set, and I got a handheld camera, and I walk it down. They go, roll him, and he goes, Oh, you know, I don't feel good. Oh. <laughs> I feel it. The boy. I says, I can't work with this man. He's a mumbler. I can't. <laughs> From that day on, we became great friends. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get as many as I can in here. Oh, okay, this fellow right here. This is his third question, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, thank you, but I, I like to think I was part of that. We used to meet in the steam room in the Sands Hotel, and Frank and Dean gave me a bathrobe called the Rhino. <laughs> and this bathrobe had a giant head of a rhino on back, and each one had a title, and I was the rhino. And I always hung with them before the show. My show was midnight, and they went on at 8 o'clock. And Frank had hors d'oeuvres and booze and what have you, and we, the doors were closed, and we all sat in the, in the steam room and had great fun together. So I was a little bit part of the Rat Pack. Didn't they once force you out of that steam room? Yes, you they, were naked? in the middle of the day, that's right. In the middle of the day, the lunch hour, we, we went early one day for some reason or other, and we're all sitting there, and Frank says, let's, let, hey, Rickles is doing so good. Let's make him really big in this business. Something you might think of. <laughs> let's make him really big in this business. And I'm completely nude with a towel, and all of a sudden the door opens, and I pull the towel off, and there I am, completely nude by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and people go, look at Rickles trying to be funny again. Look at <laughs> Is there anybody up in the balcony who has a question for Don? Guess the balcony doesn't like you. Look at that, Abe Lincoln's up there. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, well, go ahead, let's hear it. Uh, Don, what do you think of Regis as a singer? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Why the hell did I go to See, the balcony? See, said singer, look at this, the old man took a cab, look at this. There's a big fan, right in the front boy, of the Boy, oh cab. boy, walked right out. Okay. He was afraid I was going to sing to him. Yeah. I think of Regis as a singer. Regis, whatever he does on the stage, he does it well. And he's charming and beautiful. And when he sings, and I always kid him. I said, Regis, you're going to do that. When Irish eyes are smiling, or, you know, and I always kid him about that. But he sells whatever he does. And that's why he's a big star today. And I love him. Isn't it funny? You started with Sinatra, you wound up with me. <laughs> yes, lady. Yes, 
Uh, again, I think the Ronald Reagan inaugural. I do, uh, with, with Mr. Sinatra and, and having all the cabinet and all the distinguished. And you put gentlemen. out a good show that night? Oh, yeah, geez, I was right on. I, I had no idea what I was going to say. I just ran down the aisle and uh, Secretary Schultz at the time was yeah. sitting in the front. I said, Mr. Secretary, your dicky is popping up. <laughs> Did they get it? Absolutely. They got it, sure. <laughs> well, we're about to close shop here. What do you want for 25 bucks? <laughs> is that what it was? <laughs> 25 bucks. Man is killing himself here. But I love him. I, I got to tell you, as a young guy, uh, I forget where I saw him first, but I was so taken by him that when I was working in San Diego, California, starting my own television career, uh, I heard that he was appearing at a, at a ad agency's luncheon. And so I went down to see him and we did an interview out on the sidewalk in front of the U.S. Grant Hotel in San Diego. And, uh, well, I, I just fell in love with him and I've been following him for years and years and years. And the biggest thrill I would have in this business is that when I would have Don Rickles as a guest, because I knew it was going to be sheer dynamite and entertainment, and Don has never, ever let me or any other television host out. He's always been the best, most outrageous guest we've ever had. I think we can wrap it up. I want to say something about you, though. I want to say something. What was that? Well, wait. You know, you've been very patient, and we, we thank all of you. I just want to make notice my friend, uh, Conrad Hermogenes, uh, Stand-up comrade. He's a Filipino boy that's been, not a boy, a man that's been with me now for two years. He's, he's from Mabuhay, Mabuhay. I have to do that, otherwise I go home and can't find my sport jackets. <laughs> but I, I do want to say, I, I think, it, I, think it, I can say this. Yes. I do want to say, you, first of all, you've been a magnificent audience to me, and I think that I owe so much to this man sitting here, not to embarrass him, but as he showed clips, we go back so far. But I tell you, when I'm in New York and I get an opportunity to be on his show or to be with him and his wife, Joy, my wife, Barb, and I love him as a friend, as a gentleman, and as a great performer. And may God give you years. And I was so, my prayers were with you when you went through your, your terrific operation, which is a tough one to do. And you came out with flying colors and God is in your corner. Oh, thanks, and I'm Don. in your corner and I love you, dearly. Thank you very much, Don. Time I go and tell the boys start kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. Better stop kicking my dog around. Come on, Blue. Oh, you good dog, you. Hey, can I know you? Yeah, Harry, I'm John Landis. John Lennon, oh, yeah. where do I know you from? When I was 18 years old, I went behind the Iron Curtain to the former Yugoslavia to work as a gopher on a movie called Kelly's Heroes for MGM. This is a film about Don Rickles, who I met in 1969. Man was a pain in the ass runner. Kept running up to my trailer. Mr. Rickles, they're ready for you. Not now, you little pain in the ass. Go back to the warden, you little son of a... Just a private enterprise operation. Those creeps! That ain't an army of the circus! Could get a perfect crime. And me, 
So I figured I'd start with Clint Eastwood. I've seen probably his act as, as more than most people, more than I'd like to remember. That's nice. What's in it for me? You see the action? What kind of action? This kind of action. He used to always in his act, he'd say that, he says, what do I look like, Larry Dickman from Des Moines or something like that? And I always thought, Larry Dickman, I said, that's a hell of a name. And so I've registered in, in hundreds of hotels across the country as Larry Dickman ever since then. Since Kelly's here, has got all he's done for me? How about nothing? That's how good an actor I am. How about nothing? The man raves, they all do that. De Niro, same thing. Don Rickles is a good actor. I'm sitting with a cardboard box on Hollywood Boulevard with my wife. My name is Larry Dickman. Uh, well, he is a, uh, a, a great comedian and very funny. Uh, his delivery is, uh, was always, you know, great. And, and, and I like that kind of humor. When you're alone with he's what he's like De Niro, he don't light up a room. This is about Don Rickles. I'm out of here. I know that the casino is very happy when you don't record here because they got more gaming. They, you know, people are more, you know, it's, I would say high class, high rollers. Four suite close to an elevator. You'll be dressed, you'll have the tuxedo on and everything. I meant to tell you, if I gotta put my hands in mud and run on the tuxedo. It, 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 we'll figure that out. It's it's we know. We know that that's an issue. We're gonna figure out how to do it. I'm the cigarette girl here at the Stardust. Anyone that needs cigarettes or cigars, I take care of that, but I also sell lighted souvenirs for adults, kids, all different ages. If the Dodgers win tonight, they'll be in good shape. That'll put them what uh, two, two and, and a half up? Yeah. I go in the showroom, the restaurants, everywhere except for the fine dining restaurant. Uh, I go around all the tables, the whole casino floor basically.
And now, here he is, Mr. Warmth himself, Don Rickles. Goddamn band. <laughs> what the hell's the matter with you, for Christ's sake? It's a Mexican thing, it's important, for crying out loud. I go da 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 da. I walk out and do the circle, they play the music. They're playing it wrong, and now the whole goddamn kitchen is gonna quit. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? I don't want the colored guy to butt in. My name is Joe Mealy, and for the past 20 years, I've been working for Don Rickles. I am his conductor, his arranger, and his pianist. Did you pass away? <laughs> what am I talking to a wall here? These are nice people. Look at the front. I'm working to stay home, for Christ's sake. Look at this. Look at this old guy <laughs> spitting up all over himself, for Christ's sake. I hate that. I hate you get old. Go home and die. I'll pay you this. The My luck, this guy will pass away. <laughs> ah, you ruined the whole goddamn show. No, I want them to do a good job, for Christ's sake. I really did. What are you doing, smelling your hand? I'll tell you this, though. The guy's sitting there going, gee, I stink. I'll tell you this. It's the whole goddamn... Get your head out the street. It's not a boat trip. I'll tell you this. Try to do a goddamn job, and there's no... You people in the back, you got screwed with those cheap seats. I'll tell you this. That's the main thing. I try to do a job. I swear to God, that's the whole goddamn thing to understand what people do. Well, how'd the Chinaman get in there? I'll tell you this. 40 million Jews, they got a chink sitting right in the goddamn front. Jesus Christ. Get out of the way, goddamn it. That's the whole damn thing. What's your name? John. Get up. Now get your ass out of here. I don't want you in here. I wanted to be with you so bad, lady. <laughs> I'm much older than you, but the spider's alive. Are you queer? No. Oh, okay. So, Am I all right? <laughs> what are you, Irish? Italian? Italian Irish. Italian Irish. Oh, your father was a sailor? I'll tell you this. You get the hell out of the way, for Christ's sake. I'm trying to do a show, and I got a big ass sticking right here in the front. That's the whole goddamn thing. I spoke to the home. You're going back. I'll tell you this. The old lady's sitting there wheezing like it's normal for crying out. Chinese, Filipino, Japanese. Three years in the jungle looking for your father. <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> Three years I had a lot of that crap. <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's, some guys just have that thing. It's like, you know, being funny is like being a pretty girl. You just get away with a lot of shit. You know, it's like he's got big tits. It's like, you know. <laughs> it's like he, he can do no wrong. You Italian? What is, what is your heritage? German. German? Get a rope. I'll tell you this. What's your name? Fritz? Hans? What? Frank my ass. Frank. Never met one in World War II. My name is Frank. Does this relax you, Frank? You want to put on your helmet, don't you? Yeah. Is he smiling or going for the rifle? 40 million Jews, I got a Nazi sitting on a goddamn front. Started playing with Don when he was at the Golden Nugget. So it's been about 20 years now. Is that your wife? Jesus Christ. I'll tell you this. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. That's a joke, I swear. You're a pretty woman. I'll tell you this. I grew up in New Hampshire, so 
other than like me, I'm a Jew, there weren't many other like there were no minorities or anything. So listening to Don Rickles albums and stuff really taught me about what other people were like. You know, and then when I did meet a black person or a Japanese person, I was able to know what to expect. Now that's what I do. I laugh about people, no matter what the hell you are. Irish, Jewish, Italian, Negro, Puerto Rican. Well, Puerto Rican... <laughs> Puerto Rican said to me in New York in an alley, I went, son of a bitch, I don't even know Maria. Anyway, hey, this is what you're going to hear, lady. If you're waiting for Billy Graham to come in and make your kid walk again, forget about it. Ginny said to me, he, he's the sweetest man I think I've ever met. And she said, he's just, he's such a family man. And, you know, it kills him to be on the road. And I said, well, honey, his, his act is going to be a little different than the person you just met. So we go in and Don comes out. First thing he says, he said, the stammering idiot is here from Chicago <clears throat> with his hooker wife from Bayonne, New Jersey. So, and with that, my wife's face fell. <laughs> I said, that's, that's him. The funniest thing for me is watching people respond because they sort of act like they're a little bit indignant, but you know they're so glad that he picked them that it's just, you know, harumph, harumph. Oh my God, Don Reckles picked me out. Black people can do black jokes, Jews do Jew jokes, Italians do Italian jokes, etc., etc. He does them all and gets away with it because he's hysterical. Everybody wants to get shit on by Don Rickles. Don has never lost his uh, disdain for sensitivity. Clint, I say it, nobody else has said it, and I say it from my heart. You're a lousy actor. <laughs> I guess it's from the great tradition of the fool and the jester, of the, you know, being there to kind of level the king and keep it real. Good evening, Mr. President. Nice to see you, sir. And your lovely wife, Nancy. It's, it's a big treat for me to fly all the way from California to be here for this kind of money. <laughs> Secretary of State's here. And Billy Graham, nice to see you, sir. This hand is bothering me. Anyway. <laughs> is this too fast, Ronnie? Anyway, uh... He's sitting there looking at the program going, where does he say he makes fun of me? Where does it say that? Really good ones could insult the king and then back over. I'm just a jester, you know. I'm oh, just kidding. <laughs> what are you talking about? But your wife, without the hump, is a very attractive woman. He just can't help but tell the truth. That's where he's at. That's why one of the reasons I put him right up there in his own way with, like, Lenny Bruce and Pryor, because he's fearlessly honest. I'm married 41 years with Jewish broad. Don't applaud. You never saw her. Anyway, uh, 41 years, just lays in bed and goes, is that about it? Anyway, I make it exciting though. Last night I was a barge going up the Mississippi. Barge coming up the Mississippi. Boom. 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 And she's the dock. Boom. And she lays there, hit the dock, hit the dock. Boom. Then I get a black brother to stand on my shoulders going, oh, man, river, boom. <laughs> then I got another one, Snow, and Philip, I tell her I'm a beaver. I put my ass on top of the bed, and I go, and she lays there going, find the dam, find the dam. <laughs> oh, the, the other one, the other one, I tell her I'm Geronimo, see? I'm like a wagon train. I tie her to the couch and tell her she's a wagon train going west. And I circle the couch, I'm an Indian, attack her, and I go, hey, no, 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 hey, no, 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 hey, no, no. And she lays going, attack, Geronimo, attack. I did that last night for about an hour, and then I got fed up and put an arrow in her. <laughs> She's still up in the room going, finish me off, Geronimo, finish me off. <sighs> You're a nice crowd, God bless you, nice people. I mean that sincerely, nice people. This lovely lady, are you Chinese, dear? If you're not Chinese, you better get your eyes fixed. Okay. <laughs> he did not say that. He did not. But he was going in for the kill, and he did. He killed. I can't believe he's saying that kind of stuff. You know, that's not right. But it was so hilarious. You know, it's like a guilty pleasure. Kind of like, you know, tongue kissing a third cousin or something. It gets funnier when he picks people out of the audience, of course. The minute he turns to the guy in the front row 
It's over. Where's the guy that's Italian? You Italian? What is your heritage, my friend? English. English? Well, how'd you get those seats? <laughs> we need your people for the muffins. I'll tell you this. Are you married? I love you guys when you make love. Want to take a pop at it, Mary? <laughs> Gotta be like the Jews, circle a bed and get an estimate. He's really wonderful to watch because he ties everybody together. He's the plate spinner comic. It's, he keeps working everybody off everything and, and he's just, he just vents. He's just, what was it, the, the, the movie with the, the Last Angry Man? Yeah, yeah, he's like that. And, he, and he's very much like that, except he's just hilarious. I had moved to the West Coast and was pursuing my own career. And one of my first jobs was at Channel 13 in Hollywood. Went down to San Diego to, uh, to do the news. You're a lovely couple. Are you married here? Are you a mute? <laughs> Get Jerry Lewis on the phone. I found a mute. So after the show, I said, you know, I, my name is Regis, and I'm starting out in television. I'd love to interview with you. Uh, could we do it outside on the corner? And so we went out to the downtown San Diego, right there on the, uh, on the sidewalk, and we did an interview, and of course he beat me up, and I loved him even more. Where, where's that Japanese guy? Where are you? Where's the Japanese guy? Raise your hand, the Japanese guy. Where are you? The, what, what's your name, my friend? Joe. Joe? <laughs> I remember you guys when the truck stopped. Hey, Joe, want to meet my sister? <laughs> what's your last name, Joe? What? Tan. Joe Tan? Tan. No need to get pissed off, Joe. <laughs> Just asking your name. My name's Tonio Pedersano, although most people call me Tonio. And I've been Don's road manager for about 14 years. And before that, I was with Frank for a good 10 years. It was about a four year overlap when I was doing double duty with both of them. Who is your favorite male singer? Honest? Yeah. Dick Haynes. <laughs> Dick Haynes, I've never, I've heard you with the modernists at the Paramount. Ooh. You always annoyed. As a road manager for Don, I, I'm in charge of sound and light design. Red watch. And now, here he is, Mr. Wong himself, Don Rickles. with him pretty much till he goes to bed. Same thing I did with Sinatra. Although the hours with Don are a lot shorter. With Frank, we rarely went to bed before six or seven in the morning. Yeah. Dead. Dead. Cancer. Dead. Hanging on the ropes. Very bad. Very sick. Almost dead and dying. Don has a little boy in him, and he's a rascal of a little boy, and he is a busybody little boy, and he gets into your life, and he walks the edge, and you know what that edge is. Everybody who's ever seen Don work, they know what that edge is, and they, as a matter of fact, they come looking for it. But that's who he is, and that little boy still exists in the man. I see it. Every time I, I, I see him, and if I have a conversation, <laughs> if I have a conversation with Don for a minute, there's never been a time when that little boy didn't show up. We're going to be Japanese soldiers. I'm going to be General Takasayama. You're going to be Colonel Yodoyana, and you're going to be Corporal Atayama. I'm about to give it Harry Carey. Okay. You say, do not die, great general. Do not die. Do not the die. Japanese people are strong. We must never let the island be taken. We will fight to the last man. Let our people know we are strong and we are brave. Banzai, banzai. But if they attack, we will attack them and we will never die. Banzai, banzai. And you, James, say right. Come here, Now we bend our knees and we stick out our teeth like Japanese soldiers. Look at the sky. Look at Japanese soldiers. It's a very dangerous thing to talk about why things are funny. It's, it's a bad business to be in because then you start dissecting things and you start uh, getting strange. It's, it's bad. Uh, 
it's such a visceral response. I first saw Don Rickles live in the 70s at the Latin Casino. And at that time, I was uh, punk. And Don came out and did that show and holding the mic and dropping it and, and that intensity. And he had this quality of pleasing the audience was the most important thing in the world. Not in his life, in the world. But he would not compromise in any way to please them. A very complicated, very important idea. In a certain sense, the definition of art. Don Rickles, my dream guy, and I'll see him soon, live at the Latin Casino. I think I'd better call in my reservation now. Enjoy Mr. Warmth, Don Rickles, plus Fabian and dinner, live at the Latin Casino. Call now for reservations. After I'd seen Don, it turned out that the people that were my heroes were like the Velvet Underground, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, you know, uh, Bob Dylan, Houdini, Don Rickles. <laughs> Him and I saying they're nice guys, huh? The computer guy. Let's go on. I mean, when I was growing up, Rickles was probably on every show I remember watching. All my favorite shows as a kid. There was the Munsters. Uh, he was on F Troop. Gillian's Island. Uh, Dick Van Dyke. Get Smart. I Spy. I remember The Twilight Zone. Adam's Family. He was on Bewitched. Gomer Pyle. Oh, and he had to remember a great scene with Don Nuts on The Andy Griffith Show. I think every show in the history of television, at least in my little world, in the 1960s. How much you weigh, Tiny? How much you weigh? I have this affinity for Don Rickles. It's the same kind of thing, that if you can't laugh at yourself, just make fun of other people. And that's your husband? You must lay in bed at night and I go, No! God damn it, no! Then you wake up in the morning and go, Some bitch, I'm flat came to see him in Vegas. I actually came to see Lorna Luft, but I stayed for him. You're looking good, Ma. Give him mouth to mouth so she can see the whole show, okay? <laughs> I managed Frank Sinatra, Liza Minnelli, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, Ben Vereen, Paul Anka, Julio Iglesias, Sammy Davis Jr., and Engelbert Humperdinck. You ever watch those old Jews in Florida in the health club? Can I get a rub, Herbie? <laughs> Then you get the other type. Hold the elevator doors. <laughs> you like that, eh, you Nazi bastard? I saw you laughing, you German son of a bitch. I'm a nice guy, so put your mind at ease. A polite guy, lady, how about your knees? Love little kids, kind of stray cat of dog. But this group tonight is from the seat. Catalog on my sweat, God. The band thinks I'm groovy, but they're all hot. They think they're out of movie. First time I was aware of him, I think seeing him in different movies. I think it was like uh, Kelly's Heroes or, you know, in those where you go, who's that guy? Ruby, you worried about drills? No, sir. Poplin? Now look, I never keep anything from a crew. I don't expect them to keep anything from me. So come on, speak up. Well, I, I guess it's... It's Area 7, Mr. Bledsoe. Did you hear the captain read the operation orders? That's just it, sir. They specifically mentioned the Bungo Straits. Bert Lakers would always come over to me and say, learn about the submarine, learn what happens, learn the controls. And Gable would say, what is he bothering you about the submarine? Just do the lines. I want this scope up as we dive. As we dive, sir? I want to be ready to fire as soon as we level off at 50 feet. Now, I know this is all new to you, but you'll just have to get used to it. The whole purpose of this drill is to dive and fire as soon as we level. Let's try it again. Surface, surface. Gable was always nice, and he always, I always sat in front of his trailer and kidded around with him. And Jack Warden comes out and says, listen, tonight we're going to do something good. While Gable's on the set, you and I are going to get undressed. We go into his dressing room, and we lay on the bed, and we'll act like we're two gay guys having a good time. Why? It's my dressing room. I don't knock on the door. Well, I'm not going to do it. I think somebody's in the clock. He says, thank you, It's clock, Gable. I'm coming in. We open the door, and there he sees the two of us laying on the bed in our underwear, hugging each other. And Gable goes, I can't believe it. These guys are fags. These kids are fags. I can't believe it. Down, down. God damn it, they're fags. I was never offended by his faggot jokes uh, or his black jokes or his Asian jokes because uh, my mother was 
Vietnamese. No, he, but I was, nev- I was never offended by any, any of that because, because nothing is sacred to him and he just kind of, it's, you know, all bets are off with him. I first became aware of Don Rickles probably on the old Tonight Show, the real, t- not, not that this is a fake Tonight Show now, but the Johnny Carson Tonight Show. Here's a dear friend that I affectionately call Mr. Warmth. I grew up in Oak Park, Illinois, worshiping The Tonight Show. So I became aware of Don watching his repartee with Johnny. Would you welcome, please? I wore a clean shirt. You know, that's all I had to do. Anyway, when I looked at the rundown and saw Rickles was on, or going to be on tomorrow night, or whatever it was, when I saw Rickles was going to be there, I got excited. My parents would watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I was too young to stay up, but I would hide at the... Uh top of the stairs where they couldn't see me or hear me or know I was there. I heard them laughing, so I knew that I was at least hearing something very special. That he's going to ignore Johnny and make a big fuss over me. That's pure Rickles. I mean, that's Rickles to the nth degree. That that is Rickles right there. Johnny would never prepare material for any Don Rickles appearance. Whatever was on Don's mind, whatever came out of his mouth, that's the way they would go. And he was like a representative of the black people before we had a lot of uh, black comedians on TV. He's more like the Jewish the ethnic guy. Well, they all, all comedians were Jewish in the day, but uh, he was more a, a black taste of comedian. So I must have been five or six, and I was watching uh, uh, Don Rickles, and of course, the reason I'm in the business, Red Skelton, Red Buttons, Red Fox, Pinky Lee, you know, all people of color. My next guest and good friend, Mr. Warmth, Don Rickles, is, is finally very busy. His television series, CPO Sharky, seen on NBC Wednesdays at 9, will still be on this fall. Thank you. That's a new record. Rickles has lost more pilots than the Japanese Air Force. One time on The Tonight Show, he, uh, he went out to the audience, and uh, <laughs> there were two kids. He asked two kids, he said, you know, what's your name? The kid gave him his name. He slapped the kid in the face. Don't lie to me. <laughs> what is he doing? He's out of control. <laughs> you don't do that to the audience. You're slapping the audience. <laughs> it's, not an, it's not an actor. It's not somebody in show business. The poor kid is just, he told you his name. <laughs> but even the absurdity, why are you on television? You know, why are you part of this audience? It's all absurd. I was a fan of him on CPO Sharky back on NBC in the 70s. So, I mean, every time he was on The Tonight Show... I always watched. I remember one time. I was guest hosting for Johnny Carson. And Don was a guest. And we were talking and talking. And, and, and Don gestured somehow, and he slammed, he slammed his, his hand down on the, on the desk. And, and he broke Johnny's cigarette box. Johnny had a wooden cigarette box. This is not your land, you crazy guy. You're not going to have the land. You stupid man, you're not going to have the land. There's no good. This is not your land. You take... Come on. A Carson cigarette box. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Carson cigarette box. Carson cigarette box. <laughs> and of course, everybody went, oh, oh, oh. Oh, you're in trouble now. Oh. Uh-oh. What the hell happened to this? You know how long I've had the cigarette box on this desk? You brought that out from New York City? I brought this from New York. What on earth? It happened last night. Who? Don Rickles. I did not see the Don show Rickles last. did it last night. He's taping across the hall. CPO Shark. Can Where I get over there? Can I get over there? walked through the hallway and they took the camera with with them back there which was like really innovative at that time because you never really saw what was going on backstage and Don was rehearsing he was in his Navy outfit and they went at it and are they on the air I don't give a damn if they're on the air <laughs> Rickles Rickle, hold stop the taping stop the taping somebody broke my cigarette box <laughs> I 
just started the show. I picked my box up off my desk that I've had for nine years. My box is broken. They told me, they told me you broke it on the show last night. Well, I, I, I really... I, 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 I... No, but I'm sorry about the box. Well, so I will I. I, I will come up with something. Well, I hope so. But just keep me on your show. You mean so much to me. Can Certainly. I? No, no. Please. No, no, no. Don't, don't humble yourself. Please, I want to be with you so big. Don't, don't humble yourself. I want something back. Okay, oh, carry on. Help me. Carry on. Help Let's see. Please. Johnny Clark, they know who I am. Okay, now, wait a minute. Why do, you, why do you always do that? Johnny Carson, they know who I am. <laughs> Okay, now what do we do? Well, that's, it, I mean, to me, that's the ultimate, to have Don come on, because I used to watch him with Johnny, and, you know, to see him try to nail me, Jay, with your stupid cars, and he makes me laugh, you know. Him, Rodney, all the, all the sort of, the kings of comedy. You told me I was going to have a career. It, since casino, I'm in the toilet. I can't get a job. I don't know what the hell's the matter. Didn't I make a fuss? Didn't I walk around no, with your you mother did. and tell no, her? You did. Didn't I say I, I'll tell you where the medicine is? That's right. Didn't I do that? <laughs> Didn't I say you were normal when you were wheezing and spitting up behind the camera with that lousy oxygen mask? <laughs> Marty, you never liked me and you ruined my damn career and I don't need it. I don't need it. I was the asthma. The asthma spray. I, I didn't have one on me on the show. Of course, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I couldn't breathe. It was, it was merciless. Merciless. Classic. Who else is in that age group? Still packs them in the house in Vegas and, you know, does at some Indian casino. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, when I go places, I go, who is just here? Rickles. I go, Rick, Rickles is just here? He's 80. <laughs> will I be performing when I'm 80? Yes, I, um, Don will be gone by then and I will be doing his act. My father, his name was Max Rickles. Max S, which we never knew what the S stood for. And my mother's name was Etta Feldman, her maiden name. She was born here in the United States, and my father was born in Russia. He came here when he was three with a gun, a grenade, and a picture of Stalin in his pants. I was born in 1926. Donald J. Rickles, J-A-Y. I don't know, J-A-Y, for J. Rickles. I was raised in a place called Jackson Heights, Long Island. Once I ran away from home, I, I, I got fed up. My mother was yelling at me and said, I'm leaving. In those days, there was on the corner, the Fifth Avenue bus used to be. And I said, I, my mother packed a little bag and said, goodbye. I said, okay. Tell my father I left. I was maybe nine, nine, eight, nine years old. So. And I went to the corner and stood by the bus. My mother opened the window and yelled out, you forgot your sweater. And ever since I was a kid, I made fun of people. I used to make fun of my mother the rest of the way she smoked a cigarette. Then my aunt drove a car. There were my cousins rode their bikes in the schoolyard. And girls, I always had a problem with girls because I was a smart ass. Pretty much what I am tonight, always with the smart ass remarks. And invariably girls would say, here comes Big Mouth. He's so crude, he has no class. Big Mouth is coming. Then I get him under the stoop and I go, go Big Mouth, go. <laughs> I went to Newtown High School. I was uh, president of the school. I was president of Mask and Bowl Dramatic Society and failing every subject. And I got a lucky break. World War II came. <laughs> I was so happy. I got a job with the Navy. I told them when I, when I enlisted at Grand Central Station in New York, I do, I do comedy and jokes. And I'm an impressionist and I'm an entertainer. I said, fine, I like to be in special service. Fine, bang, bang. And they'd stamp my papers. Next thing you know, I'm on a train with the shades down. I, I'm in special service. Yeah, where am I going? Don't worry. Bang, bang, bang. And they sent my ass to the Philippines for two and a half years. I was on a PT tender, 300 men. And a PT tender was where the PT boats would get repaired. They'd go into attacks on, in the islands. We, we stayed in a place called Lady in Tacloban in the Philippines. And all I remember was a guy running around the jungle going, Where are you, Jew? Where are you, Jew? <laughs> when they said attack, I kept saying, I'm in, I'm in special service. I don't do this. I'm supposed to do comedy. And they said, Keep firing. <laughs>
after I conquered the Japanese, I came back to conquer Broadway. I really didn't want to be a comedian. I thought I'd be an actor. My mother was was very supportive, and my father too. But they worried because, like any other Jewish family, they said, "Well, if you can only get a you know a more secure job, where's he going to go being an actor?" The American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. I went and I auditioned, and I, I, they took me, and I I was delighted, and I, and I got in the class. And it's a long story. And I became great friends with Jason Robarts, who was a dear friend, and Tom Poston, who's still a friend, and and Bancroft. Uh, who was in my class, but we weren't that much beyond buddy, buddy. John Erickson, Don Murray, a lot of guys. Grace Kelly was in the class behind me. We didn't know each other, but I always watched her with the chauffeur and she wore a pillbox hat in those days and gloves. And she was very nice, but I, I never had any conversation with her, but I wanted to be with her so bad. I could have been a prince. <laughs> there was a fellow called Phil Loeb, uh, this is a great director. He said, Rickles, you have one problem. You've got to stop eating the scenery. Stop eating up the scenery. Because I'd walk into a scene and the guy would say, you know, Charlie don't feel good. Why? Why? What's the matter with Charlie? And, go, boom, boom. and the set would almost fall down. What the hell's the matter with Charlie? You know, I, I, I was always out of control. And then I would try to calm down. He'd say, do me a favor. I'll never forget it. He said, never lose that energy. Because that energy is going to make you pretty important. I learned a lot from just walking around Broadway. My mother would say, how did they go? I spent half the day in the Capitol Theater watching a movie and a show and then go and see two agents. I read for Stalag 17, which I thought would be perfect for me. And the, the joke was every time you're on the dark stage with the work light, you know, and the guy goes, thank you for coming. Thank you. That became my title. Thank you for coming. They thought I was there for lunch. Thank you for coming. Then I did for Josh Logan. I read Mr. Roberts. Thank you for coming. Roy Dower, he was an agent. And he used to take me in the Brill Building. He went up in an elevator. i never forget it. And he'd take you by the window and say, Rickles, come here. He'd say, why are we by the window when the traffic was going? He says, because I don't want anybody to know the money I'm paying you. I don't, why, it's that good? No, schmuck, it's nothing. And he gave me like maybe $25, $30, work with Tony Pastor's band. You know, I was the comedian with a girl come out. I'd do all my, my dumb impressions, and they'd go, da 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 and they'd bring on the girl again. There'd be about three or four comedians, and we'd go in circles, but I was the star, so-called. And in between the, now Sally Batunia, boom, da boom, ba, na, 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 boom, da boom. And now Don Rickles, ba, tell four jokes, ba, ba, boom, impressions, boom. And now Benita Bandanina, and ba, da, boom, ba, boom. And it continued like that. Half my life was in strip joints. You know, uh, Night Train was my favorite number. Dum, ba, dum, ba. I, I, when, I, when I heard drums, I started to take my clothes off. We met in Washington, D.C. I was working at a strip club called the Blue Mirror. My job was to, to sing a couple of songs in between the, the strippers just so they could dry them down. And then I, then, I, then I went out to sing a couple. And then they came out and danced. And when they sweated, they, they dried them off. And then I had to do another set. And Don was working at a place called the Wayne Room. Here's a place where I'm walking around going, you're a dumbbell, where are you going Bring out the broads, shut up, Charlie. And all of a sudden I do this dramatic thing, the lights go down, and I did a takeoff of Peter Laurie. I made it up, Peter Laurie, going to the electric chair, and people could see into his head. And I'm going, why are you looking into my head? Why are you looking into my head? They thought it was magnificent. I first met Don Rickles in Miami Beach, and I was doing, in 1958, a talk show at a restaurant called Pumpernick's. Uh, in which I interviewed celebrities. And that's where I met Don Rickles. He was working at Murray Franklin's. And I was like the warm-up guy. And I just, I didn't have a performance. I just talked to the people and made fun of them. Not mean-spirited, as I think you can tell, but... <laughs> I just had a good time. And my mother, who, rest her soul, was a strong woman. She's sort of a Jew pattern. <laughs> and Dolly Sinatra, Frank's mother, rest her soul, and my mother, rest her soul, she was at a hotel that my mother knew, and my mother was a very strong lady. And Dolly, Dolly uh, Sinatra was a lovely lady, very, very strong, too. My mother went up to see her, and they had coffee. She said, Dolly, darling, can you help, can you help Don if you can get Frank to come and see him? It would be so nice of you, please. It's done, Edda. It's done. That was my mother's name, Edda. It's done. One night, there it was. Frank Sinatra in the front row with all his friends. Those wonderful men that sat behind him. I was there nights when, when Frank was in the audience, it was unbelievable what he would do to Frank. Frank, you're old. Frank, go up to your room. Frank, 
the chambermaid, the chambermaid, Frank. And then he would look over at Jilly, who was Frank's very close friend, and he would say, Jilly, it's okay to laugh. Frank says it's okay. <laughs> and Larry King, who I know 45 years later, this is Larry King. I'm Larry King, and you say to me, my brother has, has a brain tumor. You say, my brother has a brain tumor. Really? Don't worry, he'll be okay. He'll be okay, he'll be fine. Just, you, just don't worry about it. Up on the top, that's Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan, who I got to know because they always said he was strange, but he was, he was great with me. I, I, made him, I, I made him believe he was a good Jew. He's very religious. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, he's big religious. How often do you, have you see Bob Dylan? Once in 30 years. <laughs> I was in Florida, working in a place called the Seville Lounge. In those days, it was a big thing for me, and I was doing real big. And one night I'm on the stage, and from the back came, no, pal. It's showtime. <laughs> and I went, my God, is that the great one? Could that? And there came Jackie Gleason walking up the aisle with a chair in his hand, a drink in the other hand, came right up on the stage. Oh, well, you got a minute, pal. And put the drink down, picked up a table, put it right next to me, sat down and said, all right, sonny boy, <laughs> make the big one laugh. Jackie Gleason, Mr. Miami Beach. And that was it. And I did the whole show talking to him on the stage. Well, Lenny Bruce, uh, who at that time was just becoming a big, big star doing this off-the-wall stuff. And he was working in, in a place called the Slate Brothers. So uh, I, I got a call. Boom, boom, boom. Henry Slate says, this guy's terrible because he did the F.U. this and F.U. that. And in those days, it was unheard of. And Henry didn't like it, and he fired him. And he says, get this kid Rickles. He insults people. Maybe he'll catch on. First time I ever saw uh, Don Rickles was when I went to see uh, the Slate Brothers. They told me that this funny guy was over there, and he was also, you know, a good friend of Frank Sinatra's, which na naturally drew me to it because uh, I love Frank Sinatra too, since we made From Here to Eternity together. So Ernie Kovacs and I were out here doing a Playhouse 90, and he says, you want to see somebody crazy? At this little house, the Slate Brothers, little uh, nightclub. I didn't know what the Slate Brothers Club was because I had just come out for my first movie, my very first job. And I went there with friends. We sat down, and uh, there he was. <laughs> he was. He was what he is today. He was explosive. He was impactful. He was funny. I mean, outrageously funny. He'd pick on anybody. I mean, big star, small star, director, you name it, uh, big executive in, in, in the show business and everything. He just ripped them apart. Every star in Hollywood felt that they had not made it, really made it. I mean, they could be in Hedda Hopper's column, they could be in Luella Parsons' column, but if they hadn't been insulted by Rickles, they really weren't with it. So everybody showed up at the Slate Brothers. Slate Brothers become, became famous because of Rickles. I wouldn't sit down front once, once I learned. I'd sit way in the back, so then he couldn't get at me so easy because I was a target. He really liked to get at me. Oh, you married that schmuck? Or, you know, he was, <laughs> it was Don. It was all because of Sinatra. When Frank came, he brought all the stars to see me. Elizabeth Taylor, Jane Wyman, and Sammy Davis Jr. The Slate Brothers didn't have a dressing room that good, you know. This was like a pantry. <laughs> and who should be there but his mother? And don't you know, she offered me soup. Would you like to have some soup? Oh, sure, why not? So I was there <laughs> eating soup. My mother lived, lived the acting through me. My mother got up in the morning and thought she was Sophie Tucker. Some of these days, she was always, always, if I said, you know, lady, mom, I think, shh, I'm talking. She had a tremendous drive, she drove me crazy, but she was like the driving force for me. And she'd always say to me, you were wonderful, darling. Well, why can't you be like Alan King? Eddie used to just beat his chops. She just... She she would she would say things like Why can't you be more classy like Jack Carter for God thank She'd say I saw Shecky. He was on television. Now that that's a funny man. That's a funny man. <laughs> but he was very close to Adam. They had an apartment in Hollywood in uh, at the Sunset Plaza where a lot of actors stayed and she was a lovely woman. She was uh, she was all for him, such a fan, and she loved people, and she loved show people, and everybody was welcome there. She always had, there was always food going. I always returned to the base, 
to home base, where she stood with her stars in the living room. Good morning, son! Well, and I had a salute, take off my clothes and inspection, the whole thing. He'd always talk about her in the act, and, and, uh, and she was living in Florida, so he'd use that to go into a whole d dissertation about Florida and, uh, and uh, the, the, the community down there. We're here on film from Florida, Mrs. Etta Rickles. Hello, doll boy. Tonight has been a long time coming, but I never doubted that it would come. From the time we would use my knitting needles to conduct the orchestra at Ready City Music Hall, I never doubted that you would be a great entertainer. I wish I could be with you tonight and serve this delicious chopped liver. Chopped liver? For seven days you laid in bed. People came into my room and thought it was a harbor for ships. And my dear mother, my dear mother, when the whole world booed, mind you, when the whole world booed, this great lady stood by me. I loved her. I wish you, my friends, for years to come what I have. People around you who care. You're more than kind, and I appreciate it. I oh, Jesus, trouble with the luggage? <laughs> well, in the Slate Brothers, there was a guy called Harry Goines, and he was a bartender. And again, my mother and he became very good friends. He adored my mother. And he, and he, I had no dressing room. I used to go in the back and change right by the bar to take off my tuxedo, put on a hanger, and Harry would take care of me. And then he, we became very close, God bless him. Then he started traveling with me. This is my friend Harry Goins, and we've been together over 35 years and more. And the beautiful part is he was with me when I was flat broke. I think you all realize it's so damn easy to have a friend when you're doing great. Everybody wants to be around you. But when you're up against it, boy, friends are hard to come by. And this great man has stood by me. And now some 35 years and more later, because of you people, I've been blessed with some money and success. And I'm proud and happy to tell you tonight, I'm now getting rid of Harry. <laughs> you know, you don't find guys like that today. I mean, he... He really cared. I mean, he, he, he would worry about me and so forth. I'd worry about him. The best thing I can say about him is I trust him with my life. I'd like very much if you'd give my very dear friend a well-deserved hand. I'm Roger Corman, and I directed Don Rickles in X, the man with X-ray eyes, in I think it was 1963. X, the most fantastic experiment you have ever taken part in, presents Ray Moland in his most challenging role since his Academy Award-winning Lost Weekend. X, the man with the X-ray eyes. I've directed around 60 movies and produced I don't know how many, and I remember that picture very well because it was just a joy to make that film. I sometimes wonder what you're doing here on the Small Time Hustle. What do you mean? I didn't mean nothing, except I wonder what do you want, Mr. Mentalo? All you have to do, Ray, is run down the street. We have the ink in your eyes, and you scream, what's going on? Well, it's 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. I don't forget it. I said, man, it's 5 o'clock. He walks at 5 I was his interpreter. He walks at 5 o'clock, because Ray was a very laid-back guy. I said, the man wants to go garage. The man wants to go to his trail. It's 5 o'clock. I was, went with them, because we all got along. And this is my conductor and friend for 20 years. He's been with me. I met him in New York. He was uh, playing his organ in my car. I had his monkey. Anyway, uh, he's a great musician, and he worked with the famous Copacabana, and then he saw me down at the Golden Nugget with my manager at the time, Joe Scandori, who said, oh, I think this guy's good. My manager was like a bird. He had a little feather on his ass. How, how, I think you're going to like this guy. This guy's good. My manager for 40 years was a fellow called Joe Scandori. He was, he was a hell of a guy because he took me when I was really just trying to make a move, and he was the guy that made it all happen. Joe discovered him. Joe stayed with him. Joe believed in him. He and I hung out. We became good friends. My mother adored him. That was a big part of it. My mother adored him. And I loved Joe. He would always wear, you know, real Italian, burgundy shoes, short ankles, black socks, and wear these. He always wore, I don't forget, a silk shirt, and he was kind of heavy set, and the shirt always parted. And all you could see was the Catholic cross laying on his chest. And I swear to God, if God knew what he did, the cross would have melted. Joe Scandori was a short man. With a, with a lot of class. I mean, in those days when you worked the Copa or you worked Basin Street East, which I worked all those places, and in Florida when I worked the hotels and all, it was all mostly, you know, wise guys. Well, you, you, uh, you never asked um, of the owner, what did you do before this? 
No, it's it kind of <laughs> an unwritten rule. Kind of <laughs> sweet man, very sweet man. Always looking for girls. He was a lapel guy. He, he would always say, he would come up to you, you know, saying, you know what, uh, I was just thinking about you the other day, and you know what's happening? You know, he's always done this. When he died, you would think he was the most holy of holy guys, which Joe wasn't. He certainly wasn't a man wanted by the law or in trouble that way, but he knew everybody, you know. So it wasn't that you say Mary Johnson was at the funeral and Tom Pliverton and Irving Katzman. It wasn't that. It was Vinnie Boom Boom, Charlie One Eye, Eddie the Dribble, Charlie the Nose, some of those people. Now, he has a, a Monsignor or a Cardinal. I'm not Catholic, so I don't know, but I all know that they got good costumes. And he's laying there, boom, and I'm in the front row, and boom. And there's a guy called Mikey Falco. He's, he's gone now, but he was, he, he was like, Joe gave him, gave him to me years ago when I, when I was at Basin Street as my bodyguard. I said, Joe, I don't need a bodyguard. This guy said, I'm going to take care of you. He talked like Joe. Don't you worry, sweetheart. Nobody bothers you. A drummer one night said he didn't like me, and he took out a stick and boom, and almost broke his leg. I said, why'd you do that? He said, he didn't like you. I you know, had no right to say that. He's got to show respect. It was crazy. Anyway, he was insane. But anyway, so he was always around me. So now he's outside. He's in charge of the people pulling up in the cars and seeing the people get into the church. So happens the church is packed. There's no more room, and it's a snowy day, and, the, you know, the exhaust. Like you've seen the Sopranos, guys in coats. All guys, you know, they looked like a bus at them. You know, they're all walking in like this. Nobody was normal. They were all like this, you know. Anyway, so he's outside, and the guy says, I'm Charlie, the can opener. I love Joey. Want to get in? Can't get in. It's closed. Closed. It's over. Boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, the door opens. You let me in. I'm a friend of Joe's. I cut. I suck your neck. Spiriti fondo ponto. Hey, there, Joe Scandori. But the door comes ajar again. I I tell you, sister, I'll take the eyes out of your mother. And we're all trying to be straight. <laughs> I was like this. People said, Don't gotta pull himself together. I was trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> Every time the door opened, huh? I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take your sister and wrap her in her own dress and shoot her in the head. You've got to open the door. <laughs> That's what happened. Curtis as the nicest guy who ever came from Milwaukee. Debbie Reynolds as the beautiful babe from Tampa, scrambling for survival in a jungle of men. I'm ready if you are, sweetie. I was born ready. Selling herself for 10 cents a dance, left without a dime to buy a bed of her own. She's like a big plate of hot fried chicken at a truck driver's picnic. Everybody's grabbing from every direction. They called me at Paramount. And they said that uh, Don Rickles is going to play this really bad guy. There are just two roads you can take. One says the good times. The other says the bad times. Now, which one are you going to travel? He's going to be your boss at a dance studio, and you're a call girl, kind of, kind of semi-call girl, I guess. Dance hall girl, you know. No! <laughs> You got anything more to say? I knew he wanted a family, and I knew he wanted a special lady, and you don't meet him on the road, necessarily. And I always prayed that he would have that happiness. Ruth, you danced like a baby hippo with leg cramps. <laughs> You didn't have a sweet tooth, you had a sweet tusk. And in the dense swan lake, 200 swans plucked themselves to death. And after you danced swan lake, you made it into swine lake. <laughs> Don was a fellow that was looking. He was always looking for the right girl, but he was always looking at hookers. <laughs> Jack Gelardi was a picture agent, and my wife was his secretary. And I came to get a job at, uh, at the GAC at the time. I met Don uh, when I was a secretary at GAC, at the theatrical agency in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, actually. And I said, hi, dear, I'd like to see Jack Gelardi. And she said, what is it regard to? 
And I said, uh, I'm a butcher, I have a truck outside, and I'd like to sell some meat. Being a wise guy will not get you in to see Mr. Jolly. I said, what is wrong with you? She said, nothing's wrong with me, what is wrong with you? Don't be smart. Don't be smart, because being smart will not get you in. He did a shtick for Barbara, and Barbara never laughed. And, and that challenged him. She pissed me off so much that I started calling her up. And, blah, 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 and she kept saying, I'm not interested, leave me alone. He asked me out, and we went out a few times, and we started dating. She came downstairs, I never forget, and she, and she stood up there, and I said, well, let's go out of Chevy then. I said, let's go, come on. She said, so what are you standing there for? I'm not used to this. Oh, I had to get out and open the car door. I never took a girl out, ever, that I opened the car door for. I opened the car door, and she got in. And we started going out. Barbara, I love Barbara, too. She's a strong woman. <laughs> I was always going, so, you want another drink? Stop yelling. Stop yelling. Well, he finally met Barbara. Oh, were we thrilled. We were so thrilled, the joy we were quelling. We were engaged on Thanksgiving. He was in Vegas, and I was in Los Angeles. And he called. I think I was visiting his mother. Barbara, I think, could be the Jewish mother Teresa, because I don't care how great Edda was, it still was a mother in law and Barbara had to put up with that and the mother always came first in Don's eyes. She was a strong lady, an interesting lady, but I did get along with her. My mother was very strong and Barbara was very outspoken. Less than that was about it. When she won a rebuttal. I think and then, then she thought otherwise. Ginny Newhart, who was Ginny Quinn at the time, was dating my boss at GAC, Jack Gilardi. So I knew Ginny from that. This is before Ginny and I met, because obviously, once Ginny met me, <laughs> I mean, no one, no one stood a chance. And then they got married, and then we were in Vegas, and Ginny called me, or I called Ginny, I don't recall, but whatever the case may be, and we had, they, I think they came, to, they came to the show, and then we had dinner afterwards. He was at the Sahara, in the main room, and it was Ginny and myself and Barbara, and we're sitting in the booth, and Don's attacking people and attacking, and, and Barbara's just sitting there going, oh, that's new. That's new. John, John, give John a double. I'll have one, too. Not, not too full, you know. Of course, everybody makes fun of Barbara in the way, the way she talks. There was a brisk at Don's house, and Barbara had all the, you know, the Nate and Al stuff, all the pastrami and all the things. And we were waiting, we were all starving. They said, Bobby, not yet, you can't eat till after the oil comes. You know, everybody has to sit and wait. We're starving. You want to get him being serious and being a sweet man? You ask him about his wife, you ask him about his children, you ask him about his grandchildren, and a whole other personality comes out. We're very happy. It's our kids that are dragging us down. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Las Vegas, so to me, Don Rickles, like, be like if you grew up in Anaheim, Don Rickles wasn't Mickey Mouse, I think Frank Sinatra was probably Mickey Mouse, but he was Donald Duck. It seemed like he was always here, almost as if he was the mayor of the town. I saw him, I was probably 18 years old, I was too young to be there, I probably shouldn't have been there, but every once in a while I'd, I'd get into something. The first concert I ever saw was Sammy Davis Jr., so... I had an unusual upbringing. And uh, Don Rickles, I mean, there, nobody makes me laugh harder than he does. Stan Irwin, who was a prom entertainment director of the Sahara Hotel, and Al Orwell, the agent, saw me, and they worked it out that I get a chance to work in the lounge at the Sahara Hotel, where the great Louis Prima was the headliner. Louis and I were working the Sahara Hotel in the lounge, and we worked from midnight till six in the morning. We did five shows a night. So naturally, there were other acts that worked opposite us in between, and Don Rickles was one of those. A guy called Key Howard, who was my piano player, and he sit at the piano, and I'd say, now, Don Rickles. Sinatra would come in our lounge a lot, and he'd bring people like Spencer Tracy and Gary Cooper. Louis would say, what, what, why are you here? I said, well, Louis, I'm going to do, well, don't be on too long. Louis was always worried somebody would do great, you know. But he was a magnificent performer. You could go two blocks off of the strip, and there was nothing there. It was like tumbleweed. 
wasn't bumper to bumper traffic. There weren't freeways. The, you know, when the Dunes Hotel ended at the Dunes Hotel, if you looked out the back window of the Dunes Hotel, it was just desert or any of the hotels. I mean, there was nothing beyond the rear of the hotel where they had their pools, and that was it. It was just desert. There were only three acts. There was the Norman K Trio. There was Louis Prima and, and Keeley and Don. And at that time, they had the lounges and the main rooms. And I was an opening act in the main room, but the two big acts were Shecky Green and Don Rickles that you ran to see in the lounges. And I went to see him, and I just was blown away. No one was doing what he was doing at that time. No one. Nothing spontaneous ever seemed to happen in a big room. You'd always hear through friends of your dad or somebody who's in Vegas and they saw Rickles and oh my god he went off on this guy or something happened but the lounges seemed like the coolest sexiest most fun places to be. The maitre d' in the lounge was a guy named uh, Johnny Joseph and people would be lined up to go in to see Don's show and Johnny Joseph would walk down and, and he would pick out people he'd pick out obese people he'd pick out people with <laughs> <laughs> with bad hair pieces. I got a real heavy lady, boom, 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 and I got a skinny guy. And he said, would you like to sit in front? And they would, oh, oh, wow, hey, I'm arch. We're going to be able to sit in front. Now, little did they know that, of course, Don is going to attack their obesity or their age or their hair piece. For the first time in the history of the lounge, for me, they charged a $5 cover charge. I was the biggest thing in the world. For me to have a $5 cover charge in the lounge. And my competition, that competition, always, and he's a funny, funny man, was Shecky Green. Because he worked in the lounge at the Riviera, and he was big in Vegas in those days. He was the biggest thing in the world. And I was his next opponent, so to speak. So, say, Shecky did, tonight he had, you had 200 and you had 150. Or tonight you had 280 and he had only 100. I mean, it was like a, a duel in the sun. When Don was working in the lounge, he was the king of the lounge. We'd... Edie and I would go watch his 2, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning show and have breakfast there. And all of a sudden, here's Don doing one 5 in the morning at the Zahara, which was hilarious. We all rent, of course. And I saw Jack Carter with who was forever going in. Yeah. And all the comics who were in there just to get nailed by, you know, by Don. All the guys were there, you know, Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis and all that. And then we'd hang out with all the boys, you know, afterwards, because Louis Prima was there and Sam Viterra and Keely Smith and they're in the lounge. So we all had to get up on stage. We didn't have to, but you see, we're really big hams. Every hotel in those days had a big name in the showrooms. You could come in and see Frank Sinatra at the Sands, Judy Garland at the Frontier. Uh, Ray Bolger at the Sahara, Patty Page, all the stars worked there. It was the Mecca, it was Mount Olympus. You would drive down the main strip, which was a lot smaller, and every major, Anne Margaret, Frank Sinatra, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Tony Bennett, just on and on. It was, if they had blown up Vegas, it would have blown, I said, they'd blow up show business. You had to be dressed to go into a showroom. You had a gentleman had to have a shirt and tie and a jacket. Women wore gloves. I mean, it was it was a wonderful time. The excitement of walking into a big showroom with the plush velvet walls and the gold on the thing and going down the tiers and getting into the good booths and the game with the maitre d. You would watch the men keep slipping the money to get them further forward. Oh, and the dress, the, it was an occasion. It was really elegant. It was beautiful. When the mob ran Vegas, it was glorious. We were like kings, you know. We were. We walked it everywhere. We had the run of the room. Come, boom, bang. You could walk anywhere, go anywhere, drive anywhere, totally safe because the mob ran it. Tough guys. Tough guys, but seemingly had a good sense of humor and kind of loved the performers who, who appeared there. They were, they were held in some kind of reverence that you really don't see anymore. They ran the town great. I mean, they just, what happened was, when I was there in the 60s, uh, the, the, the Hughes came in and, and the corporate mentality kind of took over the town. He bought the DI, he bought the Sands, he bought the Frontier, the Landmark. Everything had to pay for itself. Now, prior to that, the boys, you know, the, the showroom didn't have to show a profit because they knew they'd make the money in the casino. Like if a guy had a good time and you comped him and he's with a girl and she's impressed because the guy's getting comped, they know he's going to drop a lot of money in the casino. 
But when the corporate mentality came in, every the coffee shop had to make money, the showroom had to make money, and the hotel had to make money, and there were fewer comps, and it was it wasn't the same town. It, it became a, a a different town. I mean, you'd say what you want about the boys, but they they knew how to run a gambling place. Part of the world we 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 admired greatly, myself, my old friends down the Lower East Side, of course, was the Rat Pack and and Vegas and Ocean's Eleven was uh, one of our favorite pictures. I mean, it's not a great picture, but it, it's great in it. It's like a time capsule in, in and of itself. Just the last half of it alone, just the shots of Vegas at that time in widescreen and color. Forty-seven years, forty-seven years in this town. I started out in the lounge in the Sahara Hotel, and then I became a star overnight. Johnny Carson gave me a shot in the Sahara. He got ill one night, and I took his place and headlined ever since. That was great, great. I miss Johnny. He was a great guy. And Stan Owen came to me and said, Johnny took ill, and you're going to take his place. I said, what are you, crazy, Stan? I never worked a big room in my life like that. But place is packed. You're going to be great. Don't worry. Go out and just do your thing. And sure enough, I went out on the stage, and boom, and I was, I was a hit. And they... Forgot the lounge and signed me to the big room. They gave me like a two-year deal to work in a big room. And then I went to the Desert Inn, worked there for a while. Then I went to Tropicana, worked there for a while. And uh, I worked at the uh, Flamingo. In fact, I worked most of the hotels. If I work one more, I'm going to work the airport. <laughs> anyway. And now I'm working the hotel that they heard I was coming, so they're going to blow it up. Vegas that's full of hundreds of people and thousands of dollars and millions of dollars worth of special effects and it's just like a movie except it's on stage and, blah, 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 and there's water and there's fire and there's thing. There's one guy prowling the stage, filling the stage, filling the room. You just realize the power of that one driven, crazy, insane, funny guy is bigger than all the rest of that stuff. <laughs> Don Rickles brings a level of classic and class entertainment. He also brings in a level of people that have a propensity to gamble. These people, when they leave on a high note, are in the casino having a good time, spending their dollars on the blackjack tables or on the slots, and of course our bottom line goes up thanks to Mr. Rickles. Rickles uh, is left footprints, and you don't know when you start this you're going to leave any footprints in the cement or the sands of a career. We did. We didn't no, we're going to do that. He's done his mark. Jack Benny never changed. The material changed. Smothers Brothers never changed. George Burns. John, John Wayne didn't change. It was the same yeah. thing. So when you get comfortable with someone that you like and has a delivery that's consistent, a personality that's uh, profound, uh, you get longevity in this, uh, in this very difficult competitive world of show business. And then God love you Catholics, you do your great sign. And to we Jews, that means the highway's blocked. Take the other road. Look at the Irish guy laughing. You can always, you can always spot the Irish guy. I love you guys when you go to the Monsignor. I want to confess. Where's the Monsignor? <laughs> then the Monsignor comes out. Who, who wants to confess to me? An hour and a half running up and down the sand watching Frankie Avalon go, Hi, Annette, how are you? And a bunch of guys with clown hats on. Well, that was a great treat for me. I was Big Joe, Big Daddy, Big Monkey, Big big Charlie, Big everything. It was it was a long time. And Bill Asher directed it, and we did it in 15 days, running up and down the beach. But I want you to know something. I have nothing against kids. I don't mind. I don't mind kids as a whole. In a group, they annoy me a little bit. <laughs> so we're in for a big treat. Right, Pundels? Right. <laughs> oh, <okay. Yeah. laughs> I want you to know that sitting in our audience, right here, my friend, Frankie Avalon. I love you, Frank. 
even though you're older than me. I'll trade you laughter for love. I'll trade you one for the other. Laughter for love. What can you lose? Some madness for mirth. And for whatever it's worth. Whether you like it or not, I'll give you all that I've got. Laughter for love, I'll trade you one for another. I said, why are you still singing? Be alive, nephew of my uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. Mm. Sheets by Yankee Jewel, sweet, hot. I'm my Yankee Jewel boy. Yankee Jewel went to London just to ride the pony. I said, I've been in the audience when you do your salute to Jimmy Cagney. Do you know what people are doing? When you're doing that? He said, no, what are they doing? I said, they're going like this. <clears throat> there's a 12.30 flight, <clears throat> and there's a 2.30 flight. Now, I can tell I said they're making travel arrangements. Hey, Ham, look, I'm Picasso. Yeah, I don't get it. You uncultured swine. What are you looking at, you hockey puck? Don Rickles invited us over to his Malibu house to have a meeting. I handed him the Mr. Potato Head, and as I handed it to him, the hat falls off. And there Don is holding a Mr. Potato Head with a hat off, and it looked just like him. Mrs. Potato Head, Mrs. Potato Head, Mrs. Potato Head. And Mrs. Potato Head is brilliantly played in Toy Story 2 by Estelle Harris. She just, she kills. It's really funny. And the two of them together are great. Oh, my little sweet potato. Oh, you found it. <laughs> I just love working with him. And I'm so glad he did the part. And, you know, forever, forever when you look at this face, you can only hear one voice coming out of this, this spud. Bob Newhart I met in Las Vegas. We got two different stories. I was at the Desert Inn in the main room, and Don was in the lounge at the Sahara. He says this on trips when we have nothing past the butter. I was headlining at the Sands, and you were in the lounge. This is in Munich when I'm trying to figure out how Hitler got on that balcony. First trip, I think, was, uh, I think we went to the Caribbean, and we went to, uh, we went to Venice a number of times. Um, Uh, Southeast Asia. These are my children. <laughs> During the war, I stopped off here for about 10 minutes. This is Lom and this is Jung. <laughs> um, Mediterranean, Italy. They've you know, done the globe. We've taken it all over the world. Uh, Germany, I loved in particular because I, I'd walk down the street and I'd go like this. <laughs> Why are you doing that? I have cramps in my legs. I say, don't, don't. It's not funny. Don't. I said, why? There's nothing to be ashamed of. If your legs cramp up, you gotta do this. He said, don't, don't do that. I'd like to see him and Bob Newhart in China. Hi. I made four towers and died. This is uh, Bob, the Great Wall Hope. <laughs> We have a Don Rickle impersonator named Jing Sha, who comes out and goes to the Caucasian people and says, what, what your problem? What your problem? And they come at people, uh, they uh, say, what, what, what's wrong with you? Oh, you want, let me get you some mayonnaise. And, you know, he come after them. And we are very excited, but uh, have a Don Rickles come to Shanghai just for a good time party all the time. Uh, we see him a lot as a great hero, because uh, when we are, uh, um, oh, uh, Don Rickles, Mel, uh, Mel, Mel Tomé. She come on now, you could, and then she, we'll be right back, he's not coming. Uh, yeah. We're on our way to what, Barbara? Malaysia. Oh, Kota Kinabalu. Kota Kinabalu. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. I was just very jealous of, that Bob got to spend time with him, and I didn't have anyone in, in my generation that was that kind of a comic. I always had my brother, and my brother never hung out with anyone. That was in the business. <laughs> no, he doesn't even like me. 
how'd you like to do a play called The Odd Couple? So I said, well, I've heard of it, and um, it's, it's, it's a pretty good show and everything else. I said, but who's the other guy? I said, what do you think about Don Rickles? Don Rickles doing a play in a stage? And Neil Simon came to my dressing room, and he said, I want to tell you something, and if you ever say it uh, to anybody else, I'll call you a liar. But he says, you two guys are the greatest guys I've ever seen in this play. I spent time with uh, Dean Martin's widow, and, he, and she said that, uh, you know, towards the end, you know, Dean, they were walking through an airport, and someone said, Dean, you're really cool. And, and he looked, and he said, do people think I'm cool? And that's what I, you know, I always try to get across to Don and any of these guys that I can get to, is that we still love you and respect you, and you're so, you're, you know, you are cool, and you are great, and we have so much to learn from you. So John Stamos is my buddy. He has his head so far up Rickles' ass. He, seriously, he is, he's got Rickles' shit on his neck. Bob Saget, if we're very quiet right now, we can hear him complaining somewhere in the, in the city. The guy's the biggest pain in the ass on the planet. I mean, he'll call, you know, he calls me and says, I'm, so, I'm too busy, I can't talk. Well, don't, don't call me then. He's calling me. And Dean Martin, rest his soul, he was, he was a good friend to me. And I was at his wedding when he married the nine-year-old. <laughs> Dean Martin Rose. Bless America and God bless you. Good night.